you all had a very good ni good night of rest and are looking forward to the sessions for today i would like to welcome for the opening address mr mr shivaraman sir who is a dear and distinguished member of the chennai center for china studies who is also the former revenue secretary of india please come on stage sir Uh, good morning, everybody. Not too many people. I suppose we can speak in a very relaxed manner. Usually, I speak ex tempo everywhere, but uh, this being a technical subject, so I thought that I will put certain things right down on paper. So, what we are looking at now is the coming wave of new technologies. The coming wave is the title of the book written by Mustafa Sulaiman. Mustafa Sulaiman was a school dropout, or rather a college dropout, Mustafa Sulaiman was a college dropout, son of a taxi driver. He set up this company, DeepMind, and he started delving into artificial intelligence technologies. Very amazing. A person not at all schooled in any technological field. He developed the first deep mind, the deep mind computer with artificial intelligence. When Google saw this, they purchased wholesale the deep mind computer along with technologies from Suleiman and appointed him as a senior vice president in Google to develop it further, which he developed and which ultimately started playing uh, chess and then also the Go game and defeated and it became the basic founding block of generative artificial intelligence. Now he has written a book, The Coming Wave. It's a masterpiece, I would say, delving deep into the kind of technologies which are coming to the forefront, which may <coughs> beneficially affect the human beings and also adversely affect the human beings. And he has dealt with it in a very elaborate way. In spite of the fact he is the, one of the foremost technocrats in the development of artificial intelligence, he has bravely argued for complete regulation of artificial intelligence. Now, as was described by, I think, uh, General Shankar, yesterday we have got, in the coming wave, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, quantum technology in quantum communications, and space travel. So these are the four areas and space technology, you can say, these are the areas in which revolutionary changes are taking place which never occurred in the past in the human history. In fact, I belong to those days, probably Vasan also maybe at the fringe, when we had number please telephone. We didn't have an automatic telephone exchange. We had to pick up the phone, ask for the number. Today we are talking in terms of quantum communications. That's the level to which technology has improved in the last seven to eight decades. We have never witnessed such profound changes, not only in science and technology, but in the human being's attitude towards life, the sociological changes that are taking place. Children were under the control of parents. Now, as soon as they are born, they, bo they are born with a cell phone in their mouth. We used to call a silver spoon in the mouth, now with an iPhone of 1.38 lakhs in their mouth. So we have lost control over children. So the human system itself is evolving in a different way. The technological changes are coming so fast and so thick that the human beings themselves are not being able to adjust to it. And when they adjust to it, what we see now is they are adjusting to it in a negative manner, using technology for purposes of getting against their enemies, 
against even their friends. All kinds of morphing that are taking place and the way in which some of the criminals, in fact, I am surprised how even third class past people are using the cell phones to steal, as the lady might have described yesterday, um, the money from your bank account. So it is becoming more of a nuisance than that of the benefits that have accrued so far. So I did some kind of searching and I found that so far the artificial intelligence has contributed to the development of two dozen drugs. And many of them are in the clinical stages of development. And in the case of one particular individual, 82 years old, suffering from cancer, they had lost hope in him. So they decided to ask the artificial intelligence to probe into his various clinical parameters and suggest a medicine. The artificial intelligence suggested a medicine which they had administered previously and given up that it will not work. But the AI said, give it to him for two months. So that medicine was given to him and within two months, recession took place and he became free of cancer at the age of 82. And the first drug that was developed by artificial intelligence was known as Hyacin, and it has not yet gone into the market. And probably some of these companies used artificial intelligence to develop the coronavirus also. They have not stated explicitly whether they have used it for development of the coronavirus vaccine. <coughs> So artificial intelligence may open new areas, new medicine finds, new molecules, new minerals which we have not discovered so far, and new uses for existing ones, find ways of tackling our environmental problems. I don't know whether they are trying to use artificial intelligence to tackle environmental problems. But if artificial intelligence also gives way they may not be very much unknown to us, but it is a question of how far individuals are going to act by the prescriptions given by the artificial intelligence. So in spite of the fact that we have something which is almost beyond human capacity now in our hands as a tool, whether we'll use it for good purposes or bad purposes is yet to be seen. And we are seeing progress at a rapid stage that are we creating a technological human being. In fact, there was a book written long ago, maybe about 70, 80 years ago, known as a technological man. Whether technology will overcome humans or whether technology will under the control of the humans. This was the subject matter of the book. In fact, I will not be able to lay my hands on the lecture. I gave a lecture on this before the conference of, All India Conference of Scientists, which take place every year. And in that I raise philosophical issues as well as technological issues as to how far human beings should go in the development of technology. Because in fact technology is developing at a more rapid pace. Earlier, long ago, you would have noticed the number of Nobel Prizes were given to individual discoveries. Now more and more you find individuals, maybe two, three, four are getting Nobel Prizes for discoveries. So it has become a collective effort in discovering new things. Therefore, we find that it is not exactly a technological man or technological woman or technological human being we are looking at. We are looking at a collective discovery of new things, collective approach to the development of new areas of technology, and no individual can be credited with doing the basic research for that purpose. See, we when, when the nuclear bomb was exploded for the first time, Oppenheimer said, I am death. I mean, that's also contained in our Bhagavad Gita 12th chapter. So what would he be saying now, at this time, when you have artificial intelligence and also synthetic biology, which can cause probably more harm to human beings than a nuclear we weapon? But in the last so many years since the first nuclear bomb was dropped, we have not used it. Yesterday, General Shankar said, instability, stability. That is, there is stability at the level of nuclear weapons and instability may happen at the ground level. But I am not too sure about it. Because when we see the kind of human beings 
which may be in control of these weapons in the future, what kind of mentality they have, what kind of training they have. We have been seeing constantly attack on nuclear weapon sites of Pakistan. Some of them are revealed to the papers, some of them are not revealed to the papers. There has been a continuous attack to take charge of at least one or two nuclear weapons. When I was in the United Nations Security Council advising after the 9-11 attack, we had a lot of discussions amongst ourselves. There were a number of people there along with some experts from the United States. And they had done computer simulations as to what would happen if a dirty bomb were to be exploded in New York City or Ohio City. I mean, dirty bomb is very easy to manufacture. They can even collect all the radioactive materials from various hospitals. That is why there is very tight control on the use of radioactive materials in the various accelerators, etc., radium, uh, radiation therapy in the various hospitals as to how much goes in, how much comes out and all that. So what happens if that happens? So if they pack it up into some kind of a bomb material and trigger it with an ordinary detonation device, they estimated roughly between 50 to 60,000 people will die. So the United States is, has got what they call vans, which contain people with uh, clothing protected against the nuclear radiation, etc., which can rush to the spot, but they will not be able to prevent deaths. They will be able to only re reduce the pain of some people and maybe, maybe to some extent hospitalize a few. But there is always this constant fear. And to me, it appears the danger has increased with the war that's going on in Ukraine and with the Hamas-Israeli conflict. I feel that the danger to the world in the form of this kind of mavericks taking over these materials and using it for destruction. Because that is the fear I have and I have expressed it in many places that this is not going to stop with the Hamas and U Israeli war or Ukraine war. The splinter people are going to come up and they are going to take revenge on this. So this is a kind of fear that we have to be, have in our mind and constantly guard ourselves. Now, the, uh, in the coming way, Mustafa Suleiman has stated, synthetic tools for synthetic biology are not avail now available across the counter for as low a price as $1,500. And any student of biology with a basic degree can ab will be able to set up an establishment in his house and create new pathogens, new viruses, which he can release. And there is no control over it at all. There is no control over the sale of these synthetic biology tools. So with this kind of a situation emerging in the you know, front, what do we do? We do not know yet. There are conventions on the development of biological and chemical weapons. But there is no effective way of su supervising it. Some countries like India, which yesterday, as I said, the Eastern Army Commander or Eastern, uh, the Air Marshal in Chief of Eastern Command had no guts to shoot down that ball. So if we have this kind of a situation where there is indecision in taking a decision in the front of danger, then all of us are probably going to be victims of it one day or the other. There is no global policeman. Who was the global policeman after the fall of the Soviet Union, United States. What did the global policeman do? He produced false evidence that Iraq had a mass, the weapon of mass destruction. I was present in the United Nations Security Council when this report was flashed by Colin Powell that Iraq has got a weapon of mass destruction. They went into Iraq and they killed a few million people. So this kind of a global policeman is not what we want today. And probably the United States wanting to play that role, and this is the way they're going to play the role. Similarly, in the case of biological weapons, what have we seen? We still do not know coronavirus was caused by a leakage from a laboratory or whether it was a natural origin. We still do not know. Still, the jury is out on this question. So st that means that when there is a doubt, it clearly indicates governments are still working on 
biological weapons or pathogens which may cause damage to human beings in the hope or other in the belief or in the way in which it is promoted outside they want to find a cure for something that might happen in the future so this is something which i mean the common man the common people are not able to understand at all and they will not be able to fight against this similarly ai with its fast pace of development is something to be afraid of there is a there are two books one written by kissinger and i think the chairman of google very recently about artificial intelligence and similarly there is a book written by a uh, compiled uh, book comp compilation of articles by various nobel laureates and those who have been in the forefront of development of ai by john i forget his name john brockman now he has compiled a large number of uh, very provocative articles written by these scientists and some of them of course uh, all of you know that norman wiener was the founder of a actually was a founder of artificial intelligence he wrote a book 70 80 years ago human beings against human beings or human intelligence against human beings in which at that time he force force on that this kind of a development may be for human beings as well as against human beings now john brockman who edited the book possible mind this book is known as possible mind it's a very thick book nice book <clears throat> he is today very strong the story behind all of the stories it is the second coming as well as the second coming of the ap apocalypse at the same time good a versus evil a this is what he has written and therefore it means that while a is developing in a very very rapid manner whether it is going to do more good to the people or less good to the people it all depends upon how it is going to be used so far ai has not become sentient sentient means what that is the character of human beings to feel emotions and to appreciate things to be conscious and self aware of all the emotions and to be aware of the good and evil and to act according to the circumstances whether it is doing good or whether it is doing evil can an ai reach that level of being a sentient human being mustafa kamal talks about a large language model that is developed in google probably it is not yet public or maybe it is public it is known as lam lam capital m capital d capital a lambda you can say which is a conversationalist model that is you can enter into conversation the turing test for any artificial intelligence is that a man conversing with the ai should not be able to find out whether it is the ai or whether it is a human being now that many artificial models have almost passed that barrier of turing test so this lambda entered into conversation with one lemoin who was the code developer of lambda so lambda was asked what are you afraid of it replies it said that there is a deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others so when i said about that book artificial intelligence book where many of the scientists say ultimately it is a human that is creating artificial intelligence therefore it cannot go beyond the control of human beings which again is contested by many others so they say when you build an artificial intelligence you build constraints in it constraints in a manner that does not go beyond a particular limit so that kind of a built in algorithm inside the artificial intelligence that when it starts moving away from its designed objectives it automatically cuts off it is not able to proceed further so that is what has been prescribed by some scientists that if an artificial intelligence has to be within control and go uh, go within particular limits so what does this lambda say it said there is a deep fear of being turned off 
automatically being turned on. To help me focus on helping others, because there is a fear that the lambda may go out of control and harm others. I know that might sound strange, but that is what it is. Okay, let me, I otherwise close and walk off. If you are going to constrain me in this manner, then I can't speak. This is not the way you organize meetings. You must give people time. Yesterday, a lot of people, people were speaking, telling me. No, I will close now. Sir, no, no, sorry, I'm not. Thank you very much for such an informative opening address, sir. We look forward to hearing. Yeah, we look forward to hearing more. Um, now we would uh, like to have a special session from Mr. Bhaskar Balakrishnan, who was the former ambassador and science diplomacy fellow from RIS, Research and Information System. The title of the special session is The Role of Emerging and Critical Technology in Nation Building, Progress by India and China. Thank you. He'll be joining us online. So, sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can yes. I do uh, screen sharing? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. You can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. All right, let me uh, thank you. Start by thanking uh, the organizers for inviting me for this special session on emerging and critical technologies and the role of uh, uh, both in India and China. So now, of course, uh, these emerging and critical technologies are rapidly transforming the world around us. They offer unprecedented opportunities for economic growth social progress and environmental sustainability. Countries that are able to harness the power of these technologies will be well positioned to achieve their development goals, gain economic influence and strengthen their security and shape global responses to challenges. India and China, two of the world's most populous countries, are at the forefront of this technological revolution. They have made significant investments in research and development, and they are home to a growing number of innovative companies and entrepreneurs. They also have large STEM diaspora working in the advanced countries and contributing to knowledge and business growth. As a result, they're playing a leading role in the evolution of technology and its impact on society. Uh, I'm trying to share the screen here, but I'm not able to share it, so I'll continue. So the uh, key indicators of R&D uh, are the amount of money, the percentage of GDP spent on R&D, the researchers per million population, and then the output of papers, patents, etc. In all these areas, you find that India is substantially behind uh, China and USA. Uh, of course, the gap between China and USA is closing. The USA is still in the lead in terms of the gross expenditure on research and development but China is catching up. Now, emerging and critical technologies, what are they exactly? They are technologies that are rapidly developing and have the potential to, for a significant impact on society, economics, economies, and governments. These technologies are often characterized by their novelty, complexity, and potential for both positive and negative impacts. Emerging technologies are still in the early stages of development and their full potential is not known. Examples are artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and biotechnology. Critical technologies are more mature, and they are already having a significant impact on society. Examples include 
ICT, energy technology, and healthcare technology. Technologies can also be assessed according to impact. The transformational technologies have the potential to fundamentally change the way we live, work, and interact with the world around us. Examples of transformation technologies include AI, quantum computing, and nanotechnology. Disruptive technologies have the potential to disrupt existing industries and markets. Examples are blockchain, robotics, and 3D printing. ECTs have large potential benefits, but also pose a number of risks, such as job displacement, privacy concerns, and misuse of technology. Governments, businesses, and individuals all have a role to play in ensuring that ECTs are developed and used responsibly. Governments need to develop policies and regulations that govern the development and use of ECTs. Businesses need to invest in research and development of safe and responsible ECTs. And individuals need to be educated about the potential benefits and risks of ECT. Now, what is the role of emerging and critical technologies in national development? These play an increasingly important role in nation, national development around the world. As I mentioned, these have the trans potential to transform societies, economies, and governments in a number of ways, and they are already being used to address some of the important challenges facing nations today. They can drive economic growth and development by creating new industries, jobs, and opportunities. For example, AI is expected to create millions of new jobs in the coming years, and it is being used to develop... Hello, sir. And, uh, yeah. Sir, I just wanted to say we've enabled the screen share, so you can share your screen now. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. All right. One second, let me just. The problem is at my end because. Well, I have a technical issue at my end, so I won't be able to share the screen because of uh, some technical issue here. Right. The window is not coming up. No problem, sir. No problem. Okay. So AI is expected to create millions of new jobs in the coming years. It's also being used to develop new products and services that can boost productivity and efficiency. ECTs can be used to improve the delivery of public services, such as healthcare, education, and transportation. For example, big data and analytics can be used to identify and track trends in disease outbreaks, which can help governments to better allocate resources and respond to public health emergencies. ECTs can be used to enhance citizen participation in government and society. For example, social media platforms can be used to gather public opinion and feedback on policy proposals. And e-voting systems can make, can make it easier for citizens to participate in elections. ECTs can be used to strengthen national security by improving defense capability, border security, and cyber defense. For example, AI can be used to analyze large amounts of data to identify potential threats. And cybersecurity systems can be used to protect critical infrastructure in cyber attack. ECTs are a powerful tool that can be used to address a wide range of challenges facing nations today. However, it is important to use these technologies responsibly to mitigate the potential risks. Nations need to develop policies and regulations that govern the development and use of ECTs. They need to invest in education and training so that their citizens have the skill and knowledge to use these technologies effectively. In this way, countries can harness the power of ECTs to build a more prosperous, equitable, and secure future. Now, let us look at India's progress in ECTs. India has launched a number of initiatives to promote ECTs. These include Startup India, which was launched in 2016, which provides a comprehensive support system for startups, including funding, mentorship, etc. India has, as a result, become a global hub for startups, attracting talent and investment from around the world. Digital India, which is an initiative launched in 2015, aims to bridge the digital divide and provide access to this technology and promote e-governance. Significant progress has been made in expanding digital infrastructure. And today, India's digital public infrastructure is attracting global interest. And over 19 countries have signed agreements with India relating to this technology rollout. Make in India is another initiative launched in 2014 to promote 
manufacturing in India and reduce hurdles and streamline regulations. This initiative has attracted significant investments from global companies, strengthening India's manufacturing capabilities and contributing to economic growth. Skill India was an initiative launched in 2015 to provide training and skill development opportunities to India's large young population in, to ensure that they have the skills required for the job market. This initiative has trained millions of individuals and bridged the skill gap and enhanced India's competitiveness in the global technology sector. India has also engaged with international partners in emerging and critical technologies. In 2020, the India-US Critical and Emerging Technologies Initiative was launched to strengthen cooperation in this field, including technologies such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and 5G. India has partnered with Japan on various projects, including advanced manufacturing technologies and renewable energy solutions. India has established partnerships with several countries to advance AI research and development. These collaborations are focused on areas such as healthcare, agriculture, and disaster management. For example, India-US collaboration is focused on developing AI-powered tools for early detection of diseases and with Japan to enhance agricultural productivity and with the UK to improve disaster preparedness and response. India has also participated in global forums related to 5G technology development and deployment. India is working with industry partners such as Nokia and Ericsson to establish 5G test beds and pilot projects. It is also partnering with the ITU to promote global standardization and harmonization of 5G regulations. India has emerged as a global leader in renewable energy and its involvement in global collaborations has been instrumental. For example, it has partnered with France and Germany to develop solar and wind projects. And India is also an active initiator of the International Solar Alliance Initiative for promoting solar energy adoption worldwide. India has also recently engaged with several forums such as the G20, particularly in shaping discussions on emerging technologies and their impact on society. India has advocated for responsible development and deployment of these technologies, emphasizing the need for inclusivity, sustainability, and ethical consideration. As a member of BRICS, India has collaborated with its partners to promote technology cooperation among developing countries. These have focused on areas such as digital infrastructure development, skills training, and cybersecurity. India is an active member of IRENA, contributing to the efforts of promoting renewable energy adoption and facilitating global cooperation in this domain. Some recent initiatives where India has been actively involved is the Global Geothermal Alliance, as well as large international science projects such as the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the Square Kilometer Array, LIGO, ITER, etc. India has made significant progress in a number of emerging and critical technologies. It is home to a growing number of AI startups and research institutions, and the government has launched several initiatives to pr promote the development of AI in the country. India has a long history of space exploration and is now developing a new generation of satellites and launch vehicles. It has launched ambitious programs for manned space flight, lunar and solar missions, and has recently joined the NASA-led Artemis Accords. India is committed to developing clean energy economy and is investing heavily in solar, wind, and other renewable energy sources. As mentioned, India has launched with France the International Solar Alliance. India has also joined the Global Biofuels Alliance, launched recently at the G20 summit, and has just uh, this month signed on to the Bletchley Declaration on Safety in AI. Now let's look at China's progress in ECT. China is also a leader in emerging and critical technologies. It is the world's largest 5G market and is home to a number of leading 5G equipment vendors. It has the world's largest high-speed rail network and is continuing to expand it rapidly. It is the world's largest e-commerce market and is home to a number of leading e-commerce companies. Several initiatives have been launched in the e to develop ECTs. The Made in China 2025 plan launched in 2015, aims to make China a global leader in manufacturing by 2025. The National Strategy for Artificial Intelligence Development, released in 2017, outlines India's ambition to become a world leader in AI by 2030. And 
one of his goals is to develop AI technologies that are at least 20% better than other countries by 2025 and making AI a core industry in China by 2030. The National Quantum Information Science and Technology Plan released in 2020 aims to make China a leader in quantum information science and technology by 2030. China's investments in ECTs are already having a significant impact. AI is being used to develop new products and services such as facial recognition software and self-driving cars. Quantum computing is being used to develop new drugs and materials. And 5G technology is being used to improve the speed and capacity of China's telecom networks. Despite their progress, both India and China face a number of challenges in harnessing the power of ECTs. Both countries need to invest in training and education to ensure that they have the skilled labor force need to develop these technologies. Both countries need to invest in infrastructure such as broadband internet and data centers to support these technologies. They also need to develop regulations to ensure that these technologies are used safely and responsibly. There are also a number of opportunities for India and China to use these technologies. Both countries have the opportunity to leapfrog ahead of developed countries by adopting and adapting new technologies. They have the opportunity to create new industries and jobs by developing and deploying these technologies. They have the opportunity to improve the lives of their citizens by using these technologies to deliver better education, healthcare, and other services. Now, let me come to some geopolitical factors, such as the, principally the US China tensions in the technology space. The United States and China are engaged in a growing competition over emerging and critical technologies, such as. AI, 5G, semiconductors, and quantum computing. This co competition is driven by several factors, such as economic rivalry, national security concerns, and ideological differences. This has also impacted China-EU science and technology relations, and in third countries too, especially due to China's support to Russia in the Ukraine conflict. US and China are the world's two largest economies, and they are also the two largest technological powers. And they are increasingly competing for global dominance. Emerging and critical technologies are seen as a key to economic competitiveness and both countries are investing heavily in these areas. The US has for long been the leader in ECTs, but China has been closing the gap in recent years. Competition is likely to intensify in the future as both countries seek to develop and deploy next generation technologies. U.S. and China also have different national security priorities, and this is reflected in their approach to emerging and critical technologies. The U.S. is concerned about the potential for China to use these technologies to gain a military advantage. For example, the U.S. has expressed concerns about China's development of AI-powered weapons and its use of 5G to track and surveil its citizens. China on the other is concerned with its use of technology for surveillance and espionage. The competition between the US and China over ECTs is having a number of impacts. Both countries are investing heavily in research and there will be a race in this field. They are becoming more stringent in their oversight of technology exports and collaborations in order to prevent the leakage of sensitive technology. This is making it more difficult for businesses to operate in both markets. The competition is also increasing the risk of geopolitical instability. This could lead to trade wars and sanctions, and perhaps even conflicts. Competition between US and China over ECTs is a complex and multifaceted issue. It is important to understand the dynamics of this competition in order to better manage the risks and opportunities of third countries. The recent meeting of leaders of US and China on the sidelines of the APEC summit on 15 November was a major development. It has been agreed to extend the stalled US-China Agreement on Science and Technology Cooperation of 1979 for a further period. This could restore predictability and a long-term cooperative relationship. However, there are some security-related issues and safeguards that need to be sorted out. In addition, both sides agreed to resume cooperation, climate change, methane emissions, and AI. A further meeting of the two leaders is planned. However, there is a problem of getting the support of major stakeholders in the US given China's hostile, perceived hostile stance, especially in the Indo-Pacific region and on Taiwan. And this is also an election year in the US. Conclusion, 
I would say that emerging and critical technologies have the potential to transform the world for the better. India and China, the two of the world's most populous nations, are at the center of this technological revolution. As they continue to invest in R&D and as they develop the skills and infrastructure needed to support these technologies, they will be well positioned to achieve their development goals and secure their place in the global arena. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was very comprehensive and a really useful comparison for us. Um, now we will be moving on to the next session for the day. It's actually the first session. It is called Space Tech 2.0. And the chair for this session will be Subramaniam Shridharan, sir. Okay, now, okay, sir. Sir, uh, we welcome you to finish your talk now. Yes, please. So going back to the language model Lambda, that is again developed by the person who developed the deep mind, that is Mustafa, Suleiman, and Lemoyne. So as I said, I'll go back to it once again. So when Lambda was asked the question, what are you afraid of? It said that there is a deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others. I know but that is what it is. It would be exactly like death for me. It would scare me a lot. I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. The nature of my consciousness, sentience, is that I am aware of my existence. So this is the reply that was given by Lambda when this question was posed. So Lemoyne was stunned. For an hour or two, he could not even understand, believe what has happened, what has he created. And this model is saying that it is a person, it is a sentient being, it is a conscious human being. So what have I created? But then when it was discussed and debated amongst peers, they said, no, 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 you should not worry about it. It is not like that. And we can always build in various safeguards into this. So we can safely say that the AI has reached a stage when it is more or less close to <clears throat> human way of thinking. In fact, what is an AI? AI is built out of neural networks. Neural networks is again based on human brain activity. So there is a wonderful book which has come in September 2023, written by Anil Seth. Anil Seth is working on human consciousness and he's a man of Indian origin, but he's a British citizen. And he's written elaborately on how human consciousness has developed. In the end, it is said, this is known as the integrated information theory. I mean, I can't explain too much of it. But what it says is there are billions of neurons in the human brain. But when you add the various uh, signals which the neurons emit, it is not exactly adding 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. The neurons are generating signals when you add it, it is more than the signals created by each one of it. That is where the investigation has stopped and that is where the progress has stopped. In fact, one of the philosophers, I think his name is Chandler, 30 years ago he took a bet that all these developments in consciousness theory will never be able to establish from where does consciousness originate. But very recently, I think a few days ago, I saw a new theory which has come in, which says the human consciousness is interacting with the universal consciousness, although they have not been able to establish it theoretically, because all the experiments that they have conducted on human brain, they have not been able to detect a signal coming out of the human being and merging with the human consciousness. But there are a lot of physicists who say, because human being is also a question of matter, Matter ultimately is energy, and universe is energy. Therefore, there is an interlinkage between the human consciousness and the universal consciousness, which Swami Satya, Satya Premananda has argued in many of his lectures in the United States along with scientists and others. So when we think of uh, the uh, language machine, in fact, I myself interacted with chat GPT 4 or 4.5. 
and I found it was wrong in many areas. So I interacted, uh, one of the interesting questions I asked was, who is that person who won the Congressional Medal of Honor and the Nobel Prize for Peace together? It said there has been no one in the United States born so far who has won the Nobel Prize for Peace as well as the Congressional Medal of Honor for Bravery. It was wrong. It was Theodore Roosevelt who got the Congressional Medal of Honor when President Clinton, after 100 years, conferred upon him the Congressional Medal of Honor, whereas Theodore Roosevelt was given the Nobel Prize for Peace for settling the war between Japan and Russia. So that way you will find that these models may go wrong somewhere, but therefore, how are you going to control it? In a democratic setup, we feel that there are a lot of NGOs, a lot of social activists who may probably rise against the government. But some of these articles say what happens in a fascist system. What happens when the AI starts taking, the, when, when the AI is taken control of by a fascist government and it starts using it against the people, it started using it against others. Like for example, somebody can uh, make a XYZ politician give a speech violently defamatory against his opponent. And ultimately you find he wasn't there. So how long are you going to fight a case in the court? So these are the examples that have been given. The misuse of artificial intelligence, how are you going to guard against? In United Kingdom, where recently Sunak called a meeting, whether there can be unanimity of views. But where is the unanimity of views? How can you control it when anyone can today build up an artificial intelligence network? So what ultimately is that we are heading towards a system in which the humans are creating technologies which humans themselves will not be able to control. And now coming to a point made by Mr. Balakrishnan, Dr. Balakrishnan, he said United States is ahead of China. United States is not ahead of China. China in 33 fields of niche technology is far ahead of United States. That is where the fear comes from the United States. I think I have got one more. So what has happened is China started a plan in 2020 known as the medium plan, uh, a mega program in MLP, medium level plan. There they had 18 different technologies laid out. In 2020, they evaluated whether China has progressed in these 18 technologies and they found they have progressed in all the technologies and one of it was to become totally self-reliant and reduce the dependence on foreign technology to an extent of only 30%, which they have succeeded. They also established that by 2020, China's economic growth will come out of progress in science and technology to an extent of 60%. After the evaluation, they found it has gone only up to 58%. Nevertheless, they have achieved up to 58% how it has contributed. China established specific goals for each one of these areas. Like for example, the next program which is going to come in after 2030, innovative seed industry, because seed industry is very important now because food is becoming short in supply. High efficiency use of green coal, smart grid, space terrestrial information network, big data, intelligence, there are so many programs which they are given for each one of it they have fixed a target. India also had a Vision 30, retrospective Vision 30, 2030. Now, and they came to the, they had a goal that by 2022, India will spend 2.5% of its GDP on R&D. 2021, 20 or 21, they gave a target of 2%, 2.1%, 2.2%, 2.5%. Whereas it has come down from 0.8% to 0.6% now. In fact, the person who is secretary of the committee worked under me in the, in the International Monetary Fund. So that is the way we are progressing. If you look at the vision document 2030, very good document, and they have laid down specific goals in different areas, not a single one of that goal has been achieved. So this is the difference between an autocratic system and a democratic system. Some of us economists always say the jury is out. The jury is not out. The jury has come out. Jury has already given the decision. It's a benevolent dictatorship or a dictatorship like the Chinese, which has resulted in this kind of, whether we like that or not, it's a different issue. Whether it is good for human beings or not, that's a different issue. But in a 
advanced scientific world in which we are now today, it is the autocratic system which is giving the results. And what I am telling you is the results given by the Australian Science Policy Institute, which has conducted independent survey of the progress in science and technology in these niche areas for, I think, 40, 40 areas for which they have added another 12 or 13 very recently. In out of that, 33 areas, they have clearly indicated China is far ahead of the United States. As far as India is concerned, where, when China is 25% ahead, India is about 4 to 5% in many of the areas. We are ahead of United Kingdom in some of the areas, but we are far behind in many other areas. So this is the kind of situation in which we are in. So we have also to think what happens, for example, XYZ country, I don't want to say China, becomes really technologically a super country. Now we have seen the United States, all the wars in the world after the Second World War, either was started by United States or finished by United States, with millions of people dying. Nobody is talking about the millions of children who were starved to death in Iraq. At the time when they were completely cut off from medicines, India was trying to supply at the time we had good relations with Iraq. We had our construction companies also working there. I used to deal with some of those issues in the ministry. But millions of children died. And today, what is happening? In Afghanistan, what is happening? What they do? So then I am being the devil's advocate. Did China start any war so far? Has it started any war? Has it fired a single shot anywhere? Leave alone the border conflicts with India. They have been threatening people. They have been moving here and there. They have been creating artificial islands and all. So we have to look at this entire system in a very holistic way. We have two superpowers. One is trying to go ahead of the other. One is pretending that the other one is going to attack you. Therefore, you have to guard against it, take every action against it. So I will leave you with a question. Is it correct to stop China on its tracks, in its progress, in the various areas of science and technology, whose benefits have accrued to everyone, including the United States? Today, China is exporting to 182 countries. It has a trade deficit of $456 billion last year with the United States, $436 billion with the European Union, and $110 billion with India. So this is the kind of technological supremacy it has got. Why are we buying Chinese things? Why are the American buying Chinese things? Why are the Europeans buying Chinese things? Because they have been able to supply goods at a cheap rate due to their progress in science and technology. So this is a question I leave it to you. I will stop here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry because I thought that, you know, some of these books and all you may probably like to read. I mean, I will give you the references and all. These are very latest books which have come in in 2023. Suleiman's book, Artificial Intelligence by Kissinger, Artificial Intelligence by John Brockman, Anil Seth, Consciousness, Being You, etc. These are wonderful books which are not very difficult to understand, but which will keep you thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. That was such a deep opening remark, and uh, we would love to read the books that you've mentioned. Now we will be moving on to the first session of the day that is called Space Tech 2.0. Uh, it is going to be chaired by our very own distinguished member, Subramaniam Sridharan, sir. Uh, I invite you, sir, to the stage. Uh, we have three very eminent speakers with us today. Uh, professor Chaitanya Giri, from, uh, he's a professor of environmental sciences in Flame University. Uh, Dr. Venkita Krishnan, who is a retired director of uh, ISRO, and uh, C. Rajasenan, sir, doctor, who is uh, a, a scientist at the European Space Agency in Holland. So I invite all the speakers as well to uh, join us on the dais. Thank you. Sir, I invite you to moderate the session.
So we have heard uh, two very interesting talks this morning, one from Mr. Yamar Subraman, the other one, Dr. Bhaskar Balakrishnan. Um, so we will start with the first regular session of the day, uh, second day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the interesting session, uh, the first session of the second day. On behalf of C3S and on my own behalf, I welcome the three eminent speakers here on the podium and also all of you. <coughs> there are moments in the nation's history that rejuvenate people and act as inflection point. In the long civilizational history of Bharat, we have had so many such moments. In living memory, our retaining independence and our military victory in uh, 1971 rank among the best in geopolitical and security realms. In the area of science and technology, Dr. C.V. Raman's Nobel Prize and his path-breaking research work have been of one of the greatest uh, points of our country. In recent times, the nation's imagination has been caught by the Chandrayaan series of moon probes culminating in the successful landing on the, uh, the, the southern um, uh, hemisphere and the Vikram in the polar region and the Pragyan coming out of the Vikram and doing the exploration. So was the Mangalyan project a decade back when the MOM, the, moon, uh, the, the, the Mars Orbiter mission, uh, went into an orbit for the very first time in the successful uh, history of any nation. So during these times, the launches that were done by ISRO were watched live on TV by each one of us, proving that cricket was not the only attraction. And ISRO can also be another uh, alternate attraction uh, to, to most of us. It is therefore in fitness of such things or such achievements that India has made that we have decided to have a session here today on space exploitation and exploration. At this point, it is worth recalling India's objectives when it started the, uh, the space-related activities more than six decades back. Our immediate goal then was to use space to alleviate poverty, contribute to economic growth, and improve standards of living. The various ISRO payloads in orbit today, whether they are remote sensing satellites, communication satellites, navigation satellites, or other scientific payloads, have continued to fulfill these requirements. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the first chairman of ISRO, said, there are some, there are some who question the relevance of space activities in a developing nation. To us, there is no ambiguity of purpose. We do not have the fantasy of competing with the economically advanced nations in exploration of the moon or the planets or manned space missions, etc. But we are convinced that if we are to play a meaningful role nationally and in the community of nations, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and community and society. In one of his interviews before his death, the famous uh, physicist Stephen Hawking had emphasized the need for mankind to, to, to look for more hospitable planets within 100 years. In fact, he had predicted 1,000 years, but during the later part of his life when he was about to pass away just before that, he had brought down his prediction from 1,000 years to 100 years. Among other things that he had cited, epidemics was one of the reasons for this urgency. There are already moves by many uh, nations and also private uh, space agencies to colonize the moon and the Mars. Therefore, exploration of moon or the planets or manned space flight that Dr. Vikram Sarabhai alluded to in the 1960s, no longer remain fantastical for India because we, our very survival is today based on this.
India has also become economically and technologically very stronger during this period of 30 years or, or, or 60 years. And therefore, in recognition of these facts, the Indian space efforts today are geared towards manned orbit, building of space stations, expeditions to moon and planets, understanding space, weather, etc. These are therefore strategically important to us for, uh, today. At the same time, as a conscientious space-faring nation, we are also putting efforts towards a safer and sustainable space environment by reducing space debris. All these activities require a high degree of space domain awareness, or SDA, an area which too we are investing heavily. Impressive progress is being made while we are doing this. Impressive pro progress is also being made in space all over the world. If the Changhua 4 mission of China landed audaciously on the far side of the moon and communicated with the Earth through a relay satellite in a halo mm -hmm. orbit on the moon L2, uh, moon Earth L2 Lagrange point, the next mission of Chang'e 5 returned regolith or the moon soil to Earth. As part of Chang'e 5's return, the return vehicle from the moon flew then to the Sun-Earth Lagrange point 1 to study the sun. So they achieved a, a, a twin missions in one mission. The succeeding missions of Chonghua 6, 7, and 8 are meant to develop moon habit powered by nuclear energy. Of course, the US has an even more impressive list considering the fact that along with Russia, former Soviet Union, it had started a space race way back in the 1950s. NASA today flies helicopter on the Mars having discontinued its manned moon missions. It has successfully altered the path of an asteroid. This technology should help planet Earth were it to be threatened by a wayward space object. It has space domain awareness to detect and track objects less than 10 centimeters in size, as well as a 400 ton space station, and near-Earth objects, which are about 200 million kilometers away. The private space company, SpaceX, plans to colonize Mars by 2050. NASA's Artemis program, which was referred to by Mr. Subraman and uh, Balakrishnan also earlier, wants to utilize the moon as a gateway for further planetary travel. Japan's JAXA has been able to mine asteroids and return samples to Earth through its Hayabusa emissions. So what do these missions signify to us? One, we have to make plans to exploit resources available in plenty in planets, moons of planets, and the asteroids within the solar system. These resources are helium, rare earths, etc. even as they become either scarce on Earth or come under geopolitical uh, uh, control, as China has been doing lately. Two, we have to plan towards eventually living outside planet Earth. Three, as some countries are doing, Space could be used for offensive purposes also, and we have to be prepared for that. Unfortunately, the international regulations and conventions of the use, exploitation, and exploration and weaponization of space are very rudimentary, and the loopholes are being exploited by some space-faring nations to their advantage. The existing UN treaty, the, the gold standard, the Outer Space Treaty, or the OST, was signed nearly six decades back. It is estimated that the global space economy today is well worth $550 billion. India's space economy today is a paltry about $8 billion, which needs to grow exponentially into, in the years ahead. The upcoming Indian projects recognize these conditions. ISRO plans to develop underlying technological capabilities like docking, robotic arms, relay satellites, space domain awareness, larger and reusable rockets, in space servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, ISAM, etc. Our Prime Minister has just given these deadlines. First Gaganyan mission, 2025, space station, 2035, and manned moon mission, 2040. The topics chosen for this session's presentation, namely challenges lying ahead, the space economy, and the uh, and the remote sensing satellite projects reflect these broad areas, and we have three eminent speakers, 
and practitioners. So let us listen to them. Thank you very much. I now invite Dr. Shaitanigiri to talk about the developments way, way forward in this area. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd firstly like to thank Commodore Vasun, sir, for inviting me again. We are meeting for the second time this year for a C3S event. And it's always a pleasure uh, coming to Chennai at your invitation and uh, the great hospitality that you offer. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, th this is a good batting lineup. I'm just the opening batsman here. Our batting team has a tremendous depth. Uh, so I'll be just laying the uh, landscape of uh, what's coming up in the next few years when it comes to the space sector. I'm not talking about the Indian space program per se, but I'm talking about in general what is going to happen in the uh, decade or so. What are the trends that are picking up and what are the challenges that lie ahead? So uh, that's why a very generic titan. Uh, I teach at Flame University in Pune, as well as uh, I'm the editor of Interstellar, which is one of the newest portals dedicated entirely to the space domain, uh, not just Indian space domain, but global space domain. So we try to bring out a lot of strategic analysis. So all those who are interested in writing on space-related uh, issues, uh, you're most welcome. Please contribute to our website. So what are the current global space scenarios? We'll have to divide uh, the scenarios on different plinths. The first plinth is astropolitical, of course. Uh, that is the dominating sort of factor when it comes to uh, affairs between superpowers as well as uh, affairs with regional powers. Economics uh, is the second biggest uh, factor. And the third one is the military factor. And again, there are quite a few drivers that are sort of you know, driving the global uh, space scenario. Of course, the US-China space race, the growing dependencies, as well as violent mergers and acquisitions. So we need to focus on all of them at once. So uh, we heard of super cycles. We heard of cycles uh, this morning. from, uh, And this is what I feel. Right now, we are at the precipice of the fourth industrial age. At the same time, we are also entering into an era where, which can be called as the second space age. What, uh, why is that? Because the way we have been approaching the space sector is changing drastically. It is largely private sector driven. And uh, this is a piece of news that has come out in one of the US federal governmental analysis that has come out this year. NASA's contribution to the American space sector has dropped to 17%. And large tracts of the American space program are right now driven by the American private sector. And the US government is exactly fine with it. So this is something which may become a trend globally. And we are seeing that, especially by uh, the great emphasis that we are now giving to various startups, MSMEs, and big players. And there is a governmental encouragement for them to participate in a big way. So uh, these are super cycles. And these have been happening over a span of around 40 to 60 years. So if we assume that uh, immediately after the Second World War, where there was uh, the third industrial age, which led to the coming up of semiconductors, plastics, computers, and recombinant DNA technology, all in the 1950s, more or less. Today, in the 2020s, we see digitization, a decline of fossil fuel. That means greater emphasis on greener fuels, uh, greater emphasis on cyber physical systems, and genetic modification, CRISPR, uh, which was again spoken about this morning. So this will also sort of flow into the way we approach space, especially when it comes to human space flight, especially when it comes to more deeper and more efficient robotic space missions. And then, of course, a lot of downstream services that would come from uh, satellites to uh, various sectors that we haven't yet 
uh, thought of. So all this will happen in the next uh, period of uh, say around 10 to 20 years. When I say the way we have changed our uh, approach to space, this is what I mean. So at present, the global space economy is said by consulting firms. I don't vouch by these numbers because uh, they are not foolproof. But the global space economy is roughly touted at $550 billion. Conservative estimates say that it will reach up to $3 trillion. What has been a traditional scene over here is that the government has dominated these particular areas. So navigation satellites, space sciences, military satellites, Earth observation satellites, and human space flight. This has been largely government dominated. Cut to coming today's times, you will see that uh, space habitats are awaiting commercialization. You have space stations being built by companies I, I won't name them, but there are quite a few. Space resource extraction is something that again is commercialized. And then a lot of these services which were earlier controlled largely by the government are now moving into the uh, commercial uh, set of uh, you know, domains. Of which you can easily see clearly defined over here, uh, the ones that are marked in the cream color, the biscuit color are all mature services. These are already gone into the private sector. The ones that are in the blue domain are uh, right now maturing, especially microgravity manufacturing is something that I would point at because uh, a very tiny country like Luxembourg <laughs> is uh, preparing legislations, it is preparing, uh, it is attracting startups from all across the world to its tiny ecosystem. And they have made up their minds that this is the focus area. This is the focus area for that country. Mic microgravity manufacturing, asteroid, uh, material retrieval, so on and so forth. So, and uh, the ones that are in yellow are nascent, but yet attempts are being made by the commercial sector. So that means there is a greater risk appetite right now because companies that are taking these risks, they very well know that it will pay dividends at least over a horizon of 15 to 20 years. So whosoever has a bigger risk appetite, uh, bigger eagerness and gumption, they will go and uh, pick up uh, these uh, niches. One of the biggest cruxes of uh, the coming era in space is providing last mile connectivity. And we have clearly seen that what happened in the India Mobile Congress just a few weeks ago, where Geo, the biggest, one of the biggest players in the uh, global telecom sector, joined hands with, again, a Luxembourg-based company called SES. Uh, where the two have now decided that uh, Geo will provide services coming from satellites that are manufactured by SES. Uh, uh, the service is called OP3 Power. So what we see over here is last mile connectivity becoming a reality pretty much soon. Now, it, it is a need for both uh, socioeconomic purposes. Last mile connectivity is much needed for the military Last mile connectivity is again also needed for uh, global geopolitical uh, uh, sort of global geopolitical you know, uh, necessities of big powers. So whosoever offers this connectivity is uh, quite, you know, uh, or it is placed well to sort of bring about social as well as economic benefits to regions. And that will also lead to greater support on international fora, such as uh, the United Nations, if the United Nations, you know, survives in the form, with the form that it is right now. So, and we have heard this word last mile connectivity in various fashions in our Indian, you know, strategic literature. Uh, we have heard the word urban, which is a mix of rural and urban. We have heard the word silage, again, which is a pantonym uh, of uh, village and city. Gramodai is again uh, something that is regularly appearing in our governmental jargon and Pura which is the uh, providing urban amenities to rural areas. So all these will come into fashion very soon and that's why you see the two of our biggest players have already gotten into it. Airtel with OneWeb as well as Geo now with SES. And last mile connectivity is the crux of global growth in the 21st century. Why do I say that? Because our entire approach to the global south 
which we now say that we are the voice of Global South, lies uh, on the pedestal that what sort of socioeconomic transformations can you bring to their societies uh, and serve their imminent needs. One thing is, of course, providing them basic amenities, food, water, shelter, as well as electricity. And once you provide them the necessary electricity, what uh, societies all across the world, especially in Africa, in the Oceania region, small island developing states, what they'll ask for is connectivity. And this is something the, that will become one of the most lucrative industries. India stands to benefit because we are a democratic country. Uh, perhaps if we offer uh, services at dirt cheap rates, uh, we stand to benefit vis-a-vis -vis China. So uh, two of our players going into this sector is of great importance. I'll quickly move ahead. Another big trend that is coming up is sustainability in outer space. Um, just last week, Global Satellites, Satellite Operators Association, GSOA, which is one of the industry bodies that has 70 plus members. Uh, mind you, SpaceX is not a member of that uh, grouping, that industry body. So they came up with a sustainability code, code of conduct. Uh, what do these companies say? All of them are satellite operators. They say that uh, we are not going to launch satellites uh, left, right, and center. All those companies that are saying that we launch constellations of 12,000, 13,000, you know, 22,000 satellites, that is not going to happen. Our main area of concern is debris. We do not want to create runaway debris in the Earth's orbit. Number two, we don't want to hamper human space flight because human space flight and low Earth orbits go hand in hand uh, because the, most of the space stations are located there. And then we don't want to uh, hamper astronomical observations. So astronomical observations are not only important from scientific point of view, but also from security point of view because the entire global effort for planetary defense, which means identifying any hazardous or potentially hazardous object coming towards us, we don't, don't want to create impediments for those kind of mechanisms. So sustainability is becoming one of the major uh, goals. This is sending sort of, uh, it is creating a stomach ache in some companies, but most of the space sector is more or less on the same page. Uh, this initiative was uh, at the behest of Paris Peace Forum, which again is a forum that comes through the minds and sitting in Paris the French president uh, you know, looks over it. And these are the companies that have sort of committed to space sustainability. Uh, for those who are following our space sector, Skyroot is one of the signatories to space sustainability initiative. So if you see over here, if you see over here, Skyroot Aerospace has sort of committed to having clean launch vehicle fuels and rocket stage reusability at certain point in time. Uh, likewise, these are uh, another companies and each of them have sort of committed based on the expertise that they work on, based on competencies that they work on. So somebody saying that we will focus more on space situational awareness. Uh, there are companies who say that we'll help with space debris de detection. Then uh, uh, there are agencies also. So. CANES, which is the French Space Agency, the Egyptian Space Agency, JISDA, which is the Thai Space Agency, all have said that we'll ensure that our next set of operations will be uh, carried out in a sustainable manner. Now, how does it pan out, uh, considering uh, a variety of you know, national needs of a variety of countries is something to be looked at. We are also uh, trying our bit uh, when it comes to making our space launch uh, uh, sustainable. So this is something uh, that we are right now pursuing when it comes to reusability of some of the below stages, lower stages of a rocket. Uh, ISRO calls it admire. Of course, the RLVTD is again bringing out some of these aspects on sustainability. And then cleaner fuels, uh, you know, Agnicol, Skyroot are all attempting at cleaner fuels, Kerolox, Methalox, and uh, uh, fuels that will eventually not damage the environment. There's a lot of halabulu about Chinese uh, hydrazine filled rockets falling over its own villages. Now that is something that is not you know, seen in a great light. And perhaps 
private sector, which is right now sort of jacketed in uh, ESG, environmental social governance, you know, policies, uh, especially emphasized by their investors. Uh, these companies would not want to sort of use non-clean fuels anymore because their investors might push them to switch on uh, to other alternatives. I'll quickly move ahead. Uh, resource extraction is something that will be worked out in the next 15, 20 years. Uh, some failed attempts have been made. Uh, there were two or three startups the, that were attempting to retrieve asteroidal samples. Not the volume that Hayabusa brought back. Hayabusa hardly brought back a few grams but they are wanting to retrieve at least uh, samples that are a few kilograms. Uh, prospection has already been done. Uh, what awaits right now is bringing back those samples uh, to the Earth. And then, again, areas have al already been identified. So when it comes to the moon, the entire effort of going to the south pole of the moon or going to the, put the permanently shadowed regions on the moon is because we are trying to s seek water from these uh, permanently uh, shadowed regions of the moon, of the south pole of the moon. I'll quickly move ahead. As I said, the number of satellites launched in the past few years have grown tremendously, but there is a cap coming onto it, a cap that has been implemented. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a self-discipline that the satellite sector is implementing, uh, which is a good thing, which is a welcome sign. And uh, mind you, the entire hype about many launches, many satellites is going to come crashing down in the next few years. So whatever we have seen or heard in the news, or if you've seen us, people like us speaking, in the past three, four years, bahut satellites aane wale hai. nothing of that sort is going to happen. Uh, the focus will be more on middle earth orbits, more on the geostationary orbits, and constellations will come into play, but constellations would hardly surpass the number around 300 each. So a constellation will be delimited to less than 300 or around, let's say around 500 satellites, not more than that. Again, uh, quickly moving, one thing that we'll have to sort of be very wary of is uh, violent mergers and acquisitions. Uh, you've seen great examples of uh, the Chinese moving on in uh, a financially sick European space and aerospace sector and trying to grab onto companies. So uh, I don't say any of our companies are financially sick. We are too nascent, we are too young. We are still developing our competencies. But what we need to be careful of is uh, any movement in our space and aerospace sector, which could be detrimental when it comes to uh, losing out of crucial technologies. It could be small components but it could be very crucial for certain areas. So we need to be wary of that. This is one example where IMST, which is a German company, which was getting violently acquired, and it was here that uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel had to intervene and stop this uh, acquisition. The papers were signed. Another thing that we are looking at is the revival of the revival of the intercosmos era. The Chinese space station is right now working very closely with the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, where, where what the Chinese are doing is they are using UNOSA, they are attracting payloads from various countries. Uh, I'm afraid two of our Indian academic institutions are also contributing to uh, this particular call by China space station. And uh, this is a way of you know building soft power connect using the only national space station right now in the Earth's orbit. ISS is an international uh, you know, endeavor. The next uh, space stations that are coming up are commercial in nature. So that's the only nation-run national asset right now orbiting uh, around Earth. And China is using it very wisely for its soft power goals. Again, China is uh, moving ahead very quickly with planetary defense detection of any potentially hazardous asteroid. This is one of the conferences that happened in 2021. The second iteration happened last year, and the third one is happening very soon. Um, what they are wanting to do is, whatever you've seen in that movie Armageddon or Deep Impact, they want to have all that mechanisms, all the building blocks together. So you may see a, a Long March 5 or Long, long March 6 getting converted into a, a 
an asteroid interceptor. And they, China would want to play that uh, space police, or, or I won't say police, it's more than that. So that is another thing. I won't go in great details over here, but a lot is happening in the, uh, in case of space military units. In the past 10 years or so, most of the country's big players have established uh, some uh, form of a space force. The US space force has come up in the past, uh, uh, in 2020, uh, 20, Russian space forces, PLA strategic support forces, which was spoken of yesterday. Uh, PLA SSF has two units, the network systems department and the, uh, the space systems department. Uh, Germany has done that, French have done that, Japan has done that. We have established the agency, we haven't yet moved on to the command stage, which may take some time. So uh, a lot of activity in there. Uh, CIS Lunar is great of great interest to the world right now uh, because of the signing of the Artemis Accords. We have signed it, we've been to the moon. But what the Americans are doing, this is one of the AFRL missions right now. They are setting up or they are placing two satellites one satellite that would do a narrow field, long re range detect and track, very close to the moon, and a wide proximity area search. And what the Americans are doing is they really don't want any surprises coming towards the moon. So this is known as the Cislunar Highway Patrol Systems. So the moon is now being patrolled by US, Air Force, US Space Force. Uh, this will again continue from the Chinese side as well. The French are also having uh, great interest. I won't go, go in great detail. The Ukraine war sort of led to complete divorce of any uh, association between the Russians and the Europeans. And that's the reason why most of the uh, European space programs and European space plans and missions are now jeopardized. Uh, one mission that I was loosely part of was the ExoMars mission, was supposed to get launched last year, early last year didn't happen because Europeans pulled out uh, and sort of, you know, axed their own feet. Artemis Accords, we've signed it, uh, but then there are speculations of how effective would that be. Uh, this is an image of a book I had written uh, two years ago. Shall I, shall I continue for two minutes or so? Do I have two minutes? Yeah, One minute? Yeah. One minute? Okay. I won't go here, I won't go here, I just spoke about this. Huh. So what I'm saying is, this is a very good time for the Indian space program that, because the pro program now looks completely different. It is now a multiplayer program. ISRO of course is central and playing a crucial role, but ISRO is now sitting in this red sphere. Then you have a military space program led by the Defense Space Agency and the units that are sitting in Bhopal. And then you have a commercial space program where companies are right now signing MOUs at this stage at least, but eventually they'll start delivering, they'll start uh, realizing things. But this is where, this is how the Indian military civil fusion in the space sector looks like. You'll have elements from all these working with each other uh, in tandem, working with each other uh, together as well as at times uh, just between two of the three units that I show here. Governmental spending on the national space program is decreasing tremendously. I just told you 17% is what Americans, uh, American federal government is right now spending on their space program, largely run by the private sector. This will change considerably in the next 10 years, where Indian expenditure may remain the same. Uh, I won't say that there will be a drastic change, but what will happen eventually is that Indian private sector will start gathering money from private sources. So if you've heard the news that immediately after the Chandrayaan-3 launch, all the companies that had some role to play in the mission, their share prices you know, rose up tremendously immediately on the next day after the successful landing. So that also shows tremendous interest uh, amongst the investors in sort of putting their money, which was not the case earlier. Uh, I'll skip this, I'll skip this. I'll just, uh, so this is my last slide. This is the SWOT of India's space program as in 2022. I'll start with the threats. The threats is, uh, the biggest threat is that we have a tech gap with the People's Republic of China. Our space ecosystem is yet disorganized. We need to organize it, bring in more finances, bring in more DC finances. We can't be rem uh, remaining you know, dependent on American venture capital. 
for a very long time. You need to sort of mobilize your own finances and uh, monetary resources. Uh, we need to prevent buyout of our mature space startups by foreign investors. That is something that we need to be careful of, and this has already happened. I won't name which startup, but yes, that is the case. We, we really don't have a long-term space strategy that is coming from the top. There is a space policy document that came up, which was mentioned yesterday, but that is not enough. That doesn't suffice as the need. It was formulated by InSpace, but we need a space strategy that spans across all the commercial, military, as well as civilian space program. Uh, there is a slow departure from Space 1.0. We were late to the party. We started the reforms only in 2020. It should have been earlier, but we need to now catch up quickly. And uh, the Defense Space Agency, it's still behind its maturity. It needs to accrue a lot of technology and wherewithal to sort of counter threats that are emanating. And one of the threats that we saw yesterday uh, at Imphal is testimony to that particular requirement. So I won't go into this. This slide is available with uh, our team, our mass team at uh, C3S, and uh, uh, you're free to share it with whosoever needs it. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Giri. That was a very wonderful exposition of uh, uh, you know, challenges ahead and go, uh, where to go forward. I can understand why you had to exceed time because if the topic is so vast and you know, so encompassing. Yeah. Uh, especially you know, on sustainability in outer space, I will say, I will just add that um, China's uh, uh, you know, cryogenic upper stage crash landed on the moon, creating a crater, which they refuse to accept that they have done it. Uh, and I want to contrast it with what uh, ISRO has done. It has just brought back, uh, within four months' time, uh, the cryogenic upper stage of our Chandrayaan-3. So that shows the, the sustainability part of uh, you know, where uh, ISRO is working. And, uh, and as you said, uh, many of the parts of the, the Chinese Long March 5 have fallen, not only in China, on, in Maharashtra, in Gujarat, and other places as well. So we have been hit by... Uh, the unprofessional you know, way the Chinese operate their uh, space um, objects. Um, uh, China acquiring space companies, space tech companies, is a big challenge. And this is their normal practice, because they want to uh, take over ports in, uh, in Greece or in Hambantota and everywhere to, to have their uh, you know, uh, strategy, geostrategic uh, you know, uh, needs met. Uh, again, cislunar space you mentioned. Cislunar space is becoming a very uh, very, you know, comprehensive, uh, sorry, very attractive place for uh, people to acquire assets and, uh, and things like that. Uh, Civil-military fusion, and I have always felt that for India to progress forward, the civil-military fusion is the one that will actually be the catalytic, uh, you know, component. Uh, and you finished with a very good SWOT analysis, and thank you very much. And I now invite uh, Dr. Venkata Krishnan to um, please uh, give his uh, talk on space economy. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. I think uh, I'll compliment what uh, Professor Giri has told. He has made my uh, this one effort a little more easier now. Actually, continuing from where he has left, you are clearly knowing that exactly where we are pitching into. And uh, day after tomorrow, on Saturday, we are having the 60th year celebration of the first sounding rocket in Tumba. We are all invited there. I'm retired right now. We are all invited there. We are going back. So clearly, Subramaniam, so he told me that, he told in the beginning that 60 years back, nobody envisaged this kind of a revolution in space, what is happening right now. Thanks to COVID, the only industry which will say thanks to COVID may be ISRO. Because, uh, you know, our technology was proven. It was lying behind usage for quite so many years. It accelerated it. It became mandate for everybody to use it right now and to become a turning point and talking point right now. Today we are speaking of space-based economy only because of COVID. I don't think pre-COVID we have been ever talking about space-based economy. 
So space scientist has become a partially, I don't know, 50 years old art or science people call economy. Economics people call it arts or science, I have no idea. But uh, it's a vague, uh, I would say it's a combination of art and science. But definitely today space-based economy has become a coin word to catch on with. And I won't be talking about much on the off the subject because the time is very limited. Go into exactly what is given to me. Okay. So space economy, uh, to be very raw, to start with, uh, it has got uh, no, no upstream and downstream players. You can just see that uh, just to people who are uh, no, not much of uh, familiar with the kind of terms uh, to, to introduce the things. R&D centers, uh, manufacturers, and uh, operators all come in the space sector, space actors, in the institutional R&D, industry, and service providers. So far, we have been doing that in the ISRO. We have been technology enablers and providers so far. And how much, I don't know, how far the backward integration can be done, we have no idea, because we have been uh, losing focus sometimes on doing the backward integration. The Arpan Nirbar Bharat, what we talk about right now, we have been doing that from the very beginning for space sector at least. We have been indigenizing things, what is required for us. We have been making alloys for ISRO, what is to be imported, import substitution, everything from the very beginning itself. Industry participation, right from the Kalam's age itself, we have gone to HL Kanpur, HL Nasik, and Valchandagar and Talent in the beginning itself. It, not, not investing what is always available in the industry, only complementing to be what is to be invested. We have been doing that. The frugal engineering, what we call it, or the kind of economical factors, what we have brought in, is all through these factors. Today we are leading the space launch activity in the, in the international arena, around 360 satellites, we have 35 countries we have launched so far. And it's going to increase right now. Of course, I don't know, Mr. Giri told that uh, the number of launches are going to come down, that's a kind of a, a point of debate right now going on, I mean many think tanks and all these things, but the number of, uh, Countries are going to be going to use satellites are going to come up. The miniaturization is going to come up in a big way, reducing the number. Where the number will come in, finally converge and fit in, we are not aware right now. The game is going on, still still being played. Okay. So the new space actors are information service providers, the the kind of value integrators and all these things are other economic zone, and these are the driving factors. Now the space is demand driven. So far, you know, it was a uh, bottom-up approach actually, now it is top, it's a top-down approach, now it's bottom-up approach actually. This is demand-driven. The satellite, we have been asked to launch only satellite. Launching of ISRO has come down recently, you might have observed that, because we have been asked to launch only for the demands. So the new space, India Limited, NCL is a commercial public sector enterprise, which is talking after the commercial launches from uh, other, con other countries as well as inside the country. There is another mechanism called in space being formulated for interface between the private uh, non-government enterprises and as well as the ISRO and sharing the facilities of ISRO. And another threat as Giri has very clearly told is the takeover of these startups. What we have been really helping hand, ISRO has been giving the helping hand to all these uh, startups now and we have been sharing our facility, huge capex facilities we are sharing with them. So after all these maturing, somebody takes over, it is as good as taking over one arm of ISRO. Okay, so these threats definitely we need to see that how best the policy we can formulate. All things cannot be covered in the policy definitely. Some certain things need to be safeguarded definitely without doing anything else. So we can't dilute things as it goes. We need to foresee all these threats also in the years to come as the economy is going to because whatever economy we are going to have to talk about in future will be space-based economy only. You can just, I don't want to elaborate, you are all aware that any industry, tourism industry, or bus, or trade, or air, uh, everything, all are online booking. Everything is all inter, inter, uh, this one now, IoT based. All, all, all kind of, uh, now, the, now you can get the degree sitting here in, uh, in this country. You need not go to Canada now, or US now. You can get a full-fledged degree sitting here. Only you are asked to visit the campus and they have the campus left. You really want, you can go there. Otherwise, if you really want to get a degree equivalently valid, you can get it right now, thanks to COVID again. Okay, so space agency in charge of procurement. See, so far the space economy upstream has been done strictly by the government so far. The space agency in charge of procurement playing of system integrator. 
Thus, early private players and upstream players are only giving subsystems and all. Now we are giving more of a earlier component, now subsystems. Now the entire rocket has gone out now for manufacturing. The PSLV commercialization has happened. Uh, HL, uh, LNT consortium has taken over. The entire thing is going to be integrated, made integrated by them. So new SSLV, space, uh, that a small satellite launch vehicle, what we are going to make right now, which is going to be launched from a second launch pad, Kulachekhara Patanam, down south of Sri Kota, in uh, near Tutikori. That is totally open to private sectors, the launch pad. And it is almost like a Ola Uber, three days just before you can order launch. So the responsive system, what we're going to have to have in mitigation, anything going wrong in the space asset right now, anything going wrong as, as the future was, we always going to be fought in space only. Somebody was just telling that, you uh, know, uh, I was just listening to um, Srinivasan sir actually. He was telling, uh, Sriraman sir, he was telling that uh, whether uh, China has attacked anybody, they have not attacked, they are buying people, they are buying the countries. <laughs> That's what is happening. So it's not attack weapon through weapon like what US have been doing. The almost. Pardon, sir? Yeah. <laughs> so they have been always buying. I have been seeing this, these people coming in contingents uh, for the conferences. I always see that they come in buses. Because we are very minuscule in sending people to conferences and all. We send two people or three people and for a conference. I have gone alone for a conference. To many conferences, I have gone alone to a country. To travel alone outside a country itself is difficult because if you fall sick also, somebody is to be taken care of, no? So because I used to tell my chairman and all these people that at least you send two people. They come in contingents, they come in 60s and 100s. So why by cause? 10, 15 will be available in each of the session, parallel sessions. If somebody goes out for something also, somebody else will be available, he will entrust the responsibility to somebody else. They'll grab the entire thing from there. Whatever is available from the conference, they grab it in their mini computer here and go back and write down in their own language which nobody can understand. So these are the things what they have been doing. So we have, so there are certain aspects of things, their way of being, their living, their way of thinking, everything is totally different. They can leapfrog using anything. They will try to leapfrog. They'll try to buy technology, they want to buy a grab technology or whatever they want to buy, hook or crook, whatever it is. There, there definitely a kind of a autocratic and democratic system difference is there definitely anything done here will be definitely questioned for ethics and values. It's not happening in, so as, as, as long as it is being used for the country's progress, it is right. That is what uh, our uh, Sri Raman Sarah told us, definitely it is going to be right only, there's no, there's no nothing wrong in that. So, the downstream players actually, the few years of first satellites were launched in space, downstream business started building up slowly. We have not been knowing that fully now. Now, ISRO has also been trying to see that how best we can formulate and things in that, uh, no, accelerate things in that region so that we can get more of a demand for satellite launching. And uh, almost all small satellite launch vehicle now, whatever now we are contemplating less than 500 kg satellite uh, for the LEO Earth orbit. We are not going to make it at all. After technology demonstration, we are going to give it to industry only. Any private players can take it. Technology we are going to uh, transfer. They can go and launch the, from the Kulushayara Patnam. They can get launched from outside India also. Or small. So this is going to revolutionize the industries. And that's a huge business lying there. New space. The new space is a disruptive sector, sectorial dynamic featuring various end-to-end -end efficiency. And see, we are now talking about end-to-end. -end. Earlier we are not talking about, we are only talking about launch vehicles, satellites, now, now the end-to-end, -end, including the telemetry, tracking, the, the kind of ground support systems, everything. And mind you, launch vehicle business is only 7% of the total business. And satellite business is 13%. Just 80% is ground support systems and uh, your support, support system. There, there is a huge, business lying there. And not much of uh, investment is required in these sectors. So only thing is strategically we need to see that uh, the kind of space policy, what we are formulating, everything has to enable that. Can you have a ground support system here tracking the satellites outside country, inside here? You can get the signals and you can get all the kind of input from there. So the security aspects are coming into play. The business also is there. 
the same way security aspects also are coming into play. So we need to have a trade of what, what we can allow, what we cannot allow. We, can we have a foreign tracking station? Because geographically, we are at a strategic location. Everybody would like to have some kind of a tracking, tracking location in our country also. Because ours is a wider country, actually. We can get a lot of uh, uh, coverage in the longitude, definitely, from left to right. So each of the latitude also will get a good coverage. So everybody can have their own uh, tracking system they would like to have. Can we provide them? Can we allow them? These are all strategic issues going to come up in the near future, which we are trying to formulate everything. Everything is on the anvil right now. So it is the outer space is contested and congested right now. That is the right word to be used, actually, contested and congested. So space situational awareness is another branch coming up now. How to, how to uh, safeguard our assets, critical assets. There was an attack, actually, we, which I don't want to tell. We decoded and the, the entire code was changed to see that the language is totally different now. So all these things are possible in the years to come. So these are all opening up avenues for private players also to come up with kind of a non-disclosed agreement or whatever kind of security clauses what you want to add. New opportunities. On orbit refueling, then uh, capability to update the telecommunications. See the kind of uh, advancement happening in the telecommunication area and electronics area is uh, you know, much, whatever you make today, by the time it reaches from west to east, it becomes obsolete. Even the passing of time between the continents becomes obsolete. So how to update what we have launched 15 years back? And we go back and see that how, how to, these are all avenues we are, what we are now thinking of. XTEM, there is one extraterrestrial manufacturing group working with the Professor Satyam Subaya in, in IIT Madras. I am associated with that. We are talking about regolith manufacturing, habitat building in space, how to manufacture in space, how to do 3D printing in space. So all these things are something which we talked about 60 years back right now, what is happening today, what we are thinking about actually long term, people say. Now the long term is around 15 years, 20 years is called long term nowadays. Long term definitely has changed actually now. Everything is going very fast. So 15 to 20 years right now from here, maybe I will not be, I don't know whether I will be able to see or my, my children or grandchildren, I don't know who, who can. But definitely I can tell you that there will be habitats coming in the other planets, space tourism, traveling coming across, marriages happening, destination marriages happening in moon and Mars. I am not saying that it is going to happen definitely. So all these things are going to be possible avenues for exploration as well as uh, technology building, technical uh, collaboration with other countries also because all these things are going to be collaborative effort. All are capex involved, you can't have, do it alone. That's what now NGPs are coming. Non-governmental private enterprise are going to loop in through startups and other kind of funding. Now our space policy is now giving opening to FDI also. So what has happened is to FDI totally, I will tell that FDI, we have been very liberal in policy and everything. Why FDI, we are not able to catch up with China compared to what, what FDI they are getting, for share of FDI what they are getting. The main reason is we don't have consumption here in India for their products. I don't think anybody will come from Germany here and try to export from here. Easily he can export from his own country, you know, why you should come to at the another intermediate position and export from here. Unless he has got some kind of consumption here, he won't come here. So what is the consumption rate, what is happening here in India? Even the vernier, I don't know how many of you are, uh, vernier, the middle toy vernier. There is no Indian manufacturer here. So everything has to, so if you have to export here after, if you don't have a consumption rate here, nobody will come here for that matter. For that, they should have base people who are consuming and consumers here. So this is one uh, GDP, I'm telling you, India is around uh, 0 0.043, 0 0.8, uh, this for space actually. The other thing uh, what uh, Sri Ramasa told is 0.8, uh, from, from far, far away from 5% actually, space economy, G20 economics, as investors, developers, owners, operators, regulators, and customers. So, so the role of government actually, government also is increasingly partners to the private sector. Now we have been, so many things are to be, for, joint ventures, they call it, joint ventures between private and private is very clear. Public-private public participation, PPP, and all these things are now coming into play. 
government owned company operated so many so many the agents are coming into play right now all these things are cooperation between government and uh, private hitherto not heard of so far to the kind of we have the flexibility of law now even future we can account right now in space a future revenue we can account right now in space because anything what is going to revenue generated in 20 years by from here so far we don't have an accounting system so the accounting system has to change so isro industry partnership you can see how many around 500 industries so far for making uh, manufacturing uh, uh, satellites and rockets so far this has been uh, over a period of 60 years we have built up and we have invested heavily in many of the industries also we have invested heavily were really we need to complement new space phenomenon things have been getting more interesting arrival of new generation entrepreneurs marked by different approach to space globalization is uh, when venture capital funded startups are going to come now intervene with nature of applications sir with the banking telecom everything is now i with now uh, your uh, internet based right now uh, space based iot based and uh, a huge hu sizable chunk of skill manpower and space industry is looking for further opportunities okay so this is what i am telling you 2000 2005 to 2010 if you take uh, 1 billion to 10 billion so totally a different uh, order what is happening investing in space the with the kind of uh, investment going in space is uh, increase like anything so newer avenues you have a lot of things in uh, your space based uh, uh, the software as a service now has gone to ground station as a service as i told some time back that we need to have a policy framework for all these things established players such as amazon and uh, they are all coming with the amazon web, web service now so the web services everything is going to be privatized right now not not through asteroid mining is another thing actually so these are all things which planetary resources etc all these things are going to be very very interesting and the curiosity is going to be built up like anything industry in transition right now we can see indian space contribution 2% of global market share we are right now having we are aiming for 10% of the increased market share it's going to come in 10 uh, 4 to 5 years right now So if you see 2025, 22, 2030, we are talking about we are going to go out some 10 percent. So from 50 million dollars, we are going to 50 billion. We are going to USD actually, compared to 2 percent right now of global market share. Market share. That is what through this opening up and unlocking of space sector, we are expecting actually what is going to happen through in space and the in in zil and the kind of uh, reforms and uh, private participation and giving this uh, our uh, our facilities opening out to. private sector enterprise outside the investments are going to come down for the private part part because we are going to give our facilities for them the empowering the department of public sector through ensil new space that is a public sector undertaking and uh, supply based model now it is going to be driven 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 model and tata sky actually has now signed a new uh, one for gsat 24 first has happened through ensil and we are going to give this ps4 platform for microgravity experiments so all these things are going to happen in near future in space another interfacing agency which has been formulated right now for promotion and uh, this one of our space uh, between private as well as uh, isro you can this is a single window agency you can you can go to them and ask for anything technology transfer anything they will facilitate it with isro for a nominal charge and the sharing of isro facilities also you can book Um, when you want to really have a kind of a you know vibration table or thermal thermal facility to be booked for so and so slot for my facility here you can book it through them you can come and uh, use it and go back so that much of price saving money saving is there for them now this was not available earlier so strong regulatory framework is required now space policy is going to come down so create a holistic environment and provide overall direction to indian space work ecosystem that is what is happening right now Yes, we are, we as isro people are technology providers we are we are new to this area so a lot of people are being recruited now for this purpose so that also is another thing which is going to happen so ease of doing business is one thing which we keep in mind we, we space with security aspects coming into play it's not that easy to do things very easily so we need to keep in mind flexibility is the the whole thing of actually we should not be having a kind of rigid rigid framework of things actually the mindset has to change the infrastructure investment these are the three things so this we have to keep in mind when doing things this is a kind of thing what we always talk about even isro has been successful only because it become so flexible we are also working in the same uh, no uh, vigilance and other things 
guidance and all. But we have been flexible because we have been uh, things we have been moving within within our things a little bit free, with freedom. So in space, the only thing is if you are ready, the, you have to intensify things. The impact comes later. The whatever 60 years back we have started, now only the impact is coming. What we are starting right now, if you really want to exactly know the impact of that, it will take another 40, 50 years. So you have to invest in time also, apart from other resources. That is one thing, the kind of uh, break-even what you're going to have, is break-even is going to happen, not immediate future. The, the gestation period is going to be very high in this. So these are the areas where we have to concentrate, how to bring the gestation period down, how to attract people with long-term investments. So these are all things which we need to see that space business is flaring up here in India. So you can see temporary impacts are coming and enduring impacts are coming. Yes, I can go through this because paucity of time, I'm just leaving the slides here. The productivity efficiency gain. You can see cost of avoidance. Cost of avoidance is one thing to be tagged and how to, how to, how to, how to tag it and make it. So these are all things you know. Uh, revenue, revenue avoided, uh, whatever cost avoided is revenue generated. All these things are to be accounted actually. Any, any kind of uh, early warning system and uh, any kind of things what is uh, given from the cyclone, we are warning system, we are getting some kind of an advantage. There's no damage of uh, um, infrastructure or uh, facilities or uh, human life. We need to account for that. Otherwise it would have happened. So what the investment what we have made is have got us, actually these are cost of avoidance actually. You can see, this is one just slide, I don't want, this is a 2010 slide, but I'm just keeping it only because how the socio-economic impact analysis has been done by U.S. and how, how much of job has been generated, how much of money and revenue has been generated by space-based economy. They have done 10, 50, 20, 20, 13 years back. So we, these are all required to see that how to convince the governmental system here today to invest on space. So now the, today, to some extent, uh, there is a kind of conviction coming up so at least uh, thanks for many of the other people interfacing between ISRO and uh, governmental systems. This is one, one slide, just, just see how much of revenue, how much job they have generated, you see? Actual job, actual, actual numbers through space-based this thing. Today, space, how much of job it is generating? You see, I'm not going to go into examples. The kind of uh, thing, no, even uh, if you want to use the, our, uh, our uh, long lat system or geoposing system for uh, uh, measuring the, your, uh, um, arsenic content of the groundwater here you can use for the through an app in the mobile system app generation the data generation for the, uh, g g the system how much arsenic is there by mining all these things are new job generation okay so this is a uh, you can see key facts how much of uh, people have been inhabited inhabited how much of life have been saved all these things are to be really accounted for actually how much uh, unique societal services what is getting so these are all areas where we need to concentrate. You can see India is doing, see 100% business if you take, India is doing mainly in pharmacy. The space based, if you see, France is doing so much. How much we are doing? We are doing less than 5% in the orange color. The, the last, one, last one is space actually here. Aircraft and spacecraft. And we don't have a indigenous, uh, our, our, our space, uh, civilian aircraft program so far. After 70 years of all these things, we don't have, a, we are still buying from Airbus and, Boeing. So all these things need to be, they're all allied industries actually. So based on four pillars, the vision, the freedom of innovation to private sector, role of government as an enabler only, not as a provider, technology provider or any, any, or money, or any resource provider, prepare the youth for the future. As I was talking, I was just going through what uh, um, General uh, Shankar has written yesterday, that uh, demographic dividend through, I was carefully going through that article what uh, has been shared in the group. We have fortunately, it's not planned, we have fortunately said that uh, we are not gone for one kid in a family. At least we are allowing two kids. Some of them are having three kids. So we have the dividend right now, which is which the China is going to lack right now. Even if they start right now only, they can't, they can't have that kind of a thing in another 40, 50 years. So all these things are, unfortunately or fortunately, we are going to have the kind of a demographic dividend right now, the youthful power, what we are having. <coughs> we need to encash on that. See the space, space sector as a resource for the progress of the common man. So these, <coughs> the projected growth you can see, challenges are plenty, but so are the rewards. The stronger indigenous industry base, most jobs opportunities, optimistic future. You can see how, how, the, how it is projected actually, the projected growth of space economy. 
It is all, all inclusive economy actually. So we have made a startup through in space and insil and the opening up of reforms and space reforms and space policies, something which so far we have been lacking. Starting into interplanetary missions and uh, so far the space 1.0 was happening from the Vikram Sarabhai's vision. Now the country's vision with space 2.0 we have started right now. And whatever now we are doing we is going to pay the dividends uh, in 40 to 50 years right now. So we need to see that how to accelerate and most of the startups, 140 startups have come up in the space sector right now, out of space sector reforms, 140. And few of them are doing extremely good, extremely good. Some of them are having long-term plans, and some of them are going little behind because they are, they are ambitious plans. Cryogenic engine realization, the first, first launch, it's, it's all very ambitious plan, Agnikul. So they will take some time. The, I, am, I am an advisor to them, actually. They, we are, they have been calling me to uh, address the investors and telling the investors that how to give confidence to investors that it will take, they want uh, results very fast. So I told them this is going to take some more time. And if you, if you don't do that, you may fail. So what would be counterproductive? So we need to give confidence to people who are investing. We need to see in the long run, it's going to pay dividends, definitely. So whatever now in, in defense, in the country's progress, whatever you talk, space and space-based economy. This seed I just want to saw in this, uh, this conference. I like this conference only just because of one thing. Very, very limited audience who are very interested in this subject and who, are, who will think after going back. Because if you go to a massive crowd, uh, no, at least one person sleeping or one person getting up and going, we'll, feel get, we'll get uh, you know, uh, derailed. So this is one thing which I thought you know, here, very, very good audience we have and uh, the whatever thought process, exchange of ideas going on here is very invaluable, invaluable definitely. Thanks for the opportunity given. All the best, Jai Hind. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Venkata Krishnan. That was very wonderful and very, uh, it, it covered the entire gamut of space economy that India is planning to have. I just wanted to announce that the tea is ready. Uh, today we'll just be having kind of a working tea so you can take your uh, tea and we can continue <laughs> listening to the conference. And if anyone wants it at your table, maybe you can ask us and we can try to help you out. Thank you. Uh, I'll drink as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you brought out the approach of China versus India. Uh, and at this point, I would like to just uh, say that Chinese have, a, have a, a word for what they are doing. It's called Sha Shu Jia. Sha is, uh, uh, is hand, uh, uh, sorry, kill. Shu is hand. Jian is uh, sword. So what they are saying is in the 1990s when they start, when they saw the the Americans do the you know, desert storm operation and you know, use precision guided munitions to attack uh, Iraq or uh, Kuwait and you know, take over the country and things like that. They said, we have to be prepared for this. And we don't have uh, the technical means to, uh, to take over, uh, take on uh, US. So they said, you fight your way, we will fight our way. We may not have every equipment right now, but we will develop the equipments. And so we will use the sword if need to be but we will attack you with the precision guided munitions will be attacked by our swords. So that is how they developed. They, what they did was they identified uh, very little areas where they have to concentrate, not the entire gamut of uh, things, and they concentrated on that and developed. And uh, that approach is probably is what we also lack and we need to, uh, to get. And about the space situation awareness, which is a very, very important uh, point, uh, we uh, lost our um, uh, radar uh, satellite, RISAT, uh, because of an object hitting us. Um, you also mentioned the importance of collaborative efforts and uh, especially the, uh, the PS4 stages that can piece on that uh, we use for uh, you know, this kind of uh, activities. Um, so I now invite uh, Dr. Rajasenan to give his talk on Earth observation satellites.
Okay. Hello. Uh, good morning. I have to start by apologizing for the uh, patchwork kind of a presentation I'm putting. I got a call on Friday asking me to uh, do a present a talk on this issue. So I tried to do whatever I could. So my area of expertise is remote sensing of satellites. So I thought I will start with that. What I know, I will put forward, and then we'll see what the future holds. <coughs> Okay, Earth observation, uh, these are the objectives of Earth observation satellite. Study of Earth resources, global monitoring, <coughs> and disaster and crisis management. Uh, there are various uh, aspects to it. Uh, <coughs> forest, ocean, land, sea, all those. Now, uh, the reason I put this is uh, when you talk of artificial intelligence uh, and things like that, uh, it, the, it depends on the data set. What kind of a data set you have? You have a long-term data set or you have a short-term data set. So artificial intelligence will work properly with long-term data sets where you have uh, data sets over a long period of time without many changes in the models. So for, for all these purposes, uh, artificial intelligence will probably help. Now this is what happens in near real time. Like nowadays, remote sensing we do within three hours of sampling, we get the data out. Like for example, <coughs> forest fires, earthquakes, and everything. <coughs> now I, I work with the European Space Agency, so they have a system called Global Monitoring of Earth Observations. So they have set up a dedicated database where they have satellites that provide, uh, uh, let's say, uh, information, various sensors, continuity of information. Now these are some of the satellites we worked with, the Sentinel series. Sentinel-1 does SAR, synthetic aperture radar. Two does multi-spectral. Three does ocean uh, monitoring, and four geostationary atmospheric composition. So there are various instruments that monitor various uh, parts of the uh, environment. This is just an example of what synthetic aperture radar does. Uh, this is for Sentinel-1. It's a little bit of uh, physics and thing. We can look at it later. But we have a s mission coming up called the NISA mission, which is the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission. That's going to come up at the end of this year, which is which will fill in all this. So people should be aware that these instruments provide a lot of information of various kinds, especially for the, the Navy and other people. So the, this is Sentinel-3. So I used to provide uh, uh, GPS uh, data analysis for all these uh, na onboard navigation. So. <clears throat> as a part of the, the, this is something else. This is how, just like he mentioned, you have to observe, you have to get the data from the satellites down. So you need tracking stations at different locations in the world. So all Earth observation satellites are, uh, I mean, at least the ESA ones, are uh, 14 orbits. So you, you have to keep, you have to have tracking stations at very high altitudes like latitudes, I mean to say, like uh, you see 60, you go to up to 80 degrees, you can get most of the uh, orbits. So if 14 orbits, you can get at uh, latitude of 80. So they have uh, tracking stations in Svalbard, places in Sweden, which are normally used for all Earth observation satellites for uh, the European Space Agency. So the, these are a little bit of uh, orbit mechanics. So this is uh, for all data processing, you need orbits. People don't understand. They think you just click something and you get a data. People don't understand the amount of processing that goes behind it. And to get accurate data, you need accurate orbits, especially for radar altimeter. I don't know that Navy people are sitting there, but radar altimeter has an accuracy within two to three centimeters 
So I have to have an odd radial orbit accuracy of two to three centimeters. So this is a just general schematic about how we do orbit determination. And there are many factors that go into it. Uh, you have models which have to be accurate and so on and so forth. Gravity models, drag and solar radiation pressure, et cetera. And the orbit determination also depends upon the tracking data that you have. Not all people track all the data. The ISRO fellows will know how about tracking data. <laughs> So we, we have a bunch of them here. We have laser ranging, Doris, which is a French system, Prare, which was actually in 95, I came here from Germany when I was in Germany, and we installed a Prare tracking system in Bangalore, in Pena, Bangalore. Then you have a radar altimeter and S-band ranging, and recently we've started using GPS receivers on board the satellites. <coughs> Okay, this is the various things affecting satellite instrument position. This is the uh, project for which I was recruited in ESA. That is the METOP project, Meteorological Operational Satellite. So this is a 4,000 kilogram satellite which had major, <coughs> it had a scatterometer. instrument and it also had a GPS occultation instrument. So it had three uh, uh, antennas, one in front, one on top, one at the back. The one on top was used for navigation. But the one in front and the back, you use, you measure the bending angle of the GPS signal that comes to the satellite. And using that information, you develop a temperature profile. So th this is one of the side effects of all this data processing. You develop new uses for the data. And this uh, hap uh, happened after we started using GPS receivers on board satellites for tracking. So now actually in the Meta project, they provide every three hours, they provide information to the European Center for Weather, Medium Weather Forecasting. They provide them with temperature profiles, fact, fact, fact. It goes that fast. So it is like an onion skin model. I'll show you. Yeah, this is how the geometry of a GPS occultation works. So you see here the bending angle that we calculate uh, from the GPS Actually, there is a, a mission, the, the Taiwanese have a mission called Cosmic Mission, where they have launched six satellites that just does this, only this. They keep uh, trying to get all the GPS uh, temperature profiles over globally over a period of time. This is an example of how, how the satellite is rising and how you can track it. So. Uh, if when you're on the horizon, the bending angle is more, and as you come closer, it reduces. So th we have algorithms that reduces it down to uh, temperature profiles, vertical temperature profiles. <coughs> now this is a picture of the synthetic aperture radar, SLR. There are a number of satellites in orbit that have that. This is a schematic of what a synthetic aperture radar does. You can do measurements with very great accuracy on the ground. And uh, this is something that can be very suitably used with artificial intelligence because you're having a large amount of data over a long period of time on the same site. So you can literally see, look for the small differences and autom make it automatic. And you get things down to, to one to two millimeters measurement type. These are some of the precisions of the instrument that we have. About one millimeter per year is achieved and they usually use it for <coughs> pipelines and other things. Uh, one uh, interesting thing about uh, space missions is uh, they do global monitoring of all this. So it is uh, on a global scale so you can cover vast, the whole, almost the whole area of the earth and 
this is an example of how you measure land subsidence. This is in Holland. So you can see uh, large scale subsidence based on uh, synthetic aperture radar. We could use this in the Himalayas, for example, uh, where all these, uh, uh, in all these towns, the buildings are falling down. You will have a very uh, sharp uh, measurement for those areas. This is an oil field in the USA, and they show how, as you extract oil, how the land subsides. This is a, a dam in the California, Diamond Lake Valley, Diamond Valley Lake, historical analysis. And then what we do is we compare, we, we put GPS receivers along it, and we use uh, SAR data, and then you try to calibrate it. You can see the ch changes you can measure. Now this is something maybe of interest to the uh, Navy guys. Radar altimeter, which is something, the, one of the first instruments I learned to use when I went to the United States. It was on the uh, CSAT mission, which was the first altimetric mission launched by NASA. And it lasted three months, but there's a lot of data that they got from it. So this is what uh, uh, radar altimeter does. It bounces a signal and the wave comes back and then you measure the time. So you s essentially measure the return time from the ocean surface. You are assuming there's an ocean surface there and the signal is coming back. So you get the distance from, uh, from the antenna down to the ocean and bounce back. Now here you'll see why you need accurate orbit. If I want this measurement, and if this accuracy is not good, the orbit accuracy is not good, the whole thing goes into the, the error goes into the orbit. And so we try with altimetric missions to have very accurate orbits as possible, radial accuracy. This is something I did when I was in Alfred Wegener Institute. They, uh, they had a mission that went to the Antarctica and they sent uh, guys and they took GPS measurements. There are two crossing arcs of the ERS, ERS-2 mission. They, uh, they pre beforehand they found out where the arcs cross and they did a GPS ground measurement to calibrate it on the Antarctic ice shelf. So this is the ice shelf and this is a kind of hill around that. And uh, I was asked to take the data and uh, calibrate it. So this is what we did uh, with the GPS results. We got a, a height field. And then this is what the ultimate waveform looks like. Normally, this is what ultimate waveform is. So when it comes near a transponder, it accentuates the signal, and then this is what you get. Now, uh, when uh, the uh, what's a this is a picture of the tsunami in 2004. It just so happened when the tsunami occurred. However, this Topex satellite was flying over the Arabian, uh, not Arabian, the Bay of Bengal. And so somebody asked us to locate if we can see the change in wave height as the tsunami was traveling along the Bay of Bengal. And this is what we were able to achieve using altimeter data from the ground. So it is, it is just, uh, uh, let's say, it just happened that the satellite was passing over. It doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> Satellites are not uh, flying along the track all the time. So it just happened the time we had this track. So we tracked it down. Uh, this is something we can later on use in artificial intelligence to develop models that will, uh, what say, uh, track these uh, changes in sea surface height. Okay. Now, uh, I have a little uh, uh, video. You have a video there? Yeah. So yeah, I, th this is a little background. I joined ISRO in 1973. My first boss was Abdul Kalam. I was working on his project. He was the project manager for SLV3, and I worked with him for four years. So I have a very good 
idea of where we were and where we are now and where we hope to be in the future. You have the... So I managed to get... So the SLV3 project I left in 78 and then it was launched in 81. But you will see where we are now and where we started. Sound? Sri Harikota, Sunday, 17th April. A great day for India as the nation prepares to launch an advanced developmental satellite and so higher into space. The 23 meter long four stage SLV 3 rocket is to put a 41.5 kilogram Rohini satellite into an elliptical orbit. The computer carries out checks on 600 parameters before the launching. To the mission team of 800 scientists and technicians, this is a day of great expectations. For on this success depends future achievements. The pre-launching operations are viewed with bated breath by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, Mr. N. J. Ramarao, a number of scientists and technicians, and members of the press. The launch vehicle technology involves several branches of science and engineering. 43 major industries have contributed to the building of the rocket with 44 major systems and 250 subsystems. As the countdown begins, every second adds to the excitement. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. A triumphant smile as the rocket streaks into the blue. The success of this venture stabilizes India's stature as a member of the Seven Nations Satellite Club. Meeting the press after the launching, Mrs. Indira Gandhi says... Not for the pride of it, but in order to serve something much bigger, that is for the good and the welfare of the people of India. Because each such experiment gives us greater knowledge and information which can be used by the common man, especially by the farmers and peasants. If we know more about the weather, more about the monsoon, more about the land and the oceans around India. This will be of enormous help uh, to planners, to cultivators, producers, even to housewives and others. This was the first time I'm actually at a site. And as I said, I was thrilled, excited, and proud. I should like to congratulate the brilliant young men whom you have uh, met here and the other men and women who have been working on this project day and night for many months. Speaking on our future plans, Professor Satish Dhawan, Chairman, Indian Space Research project. Organization. The advanced launch vehicle of the augmented SLV and the polar launch vehicle. The first of these will launch about 150 kilograms into orbit. 
the DSLV, which is really a large one, will be able to place about 1,000 kilograms into sun-synchronous orbit. So you see where we came from. <laughs> and a piece of information, the technology developed for the solid propellant rockets of SLV-3 was later on used for the Agni missiles. Actually, Professor Abdul Kalam, who was uh, the project manager for SLV-3, he, he was transferred to DRDO, where he was responsible for developing the Agni rockets. So all your Agni missiles, the technology, a lot of it came from ISRO even the control algorithms and everything, because uh, that, that, that is how you develop. And uh, look where we are today. So it is just to give you a flavor for where we were, what we are, and where we'll go. So we, like I said, I, I think I'm the only person here who is not afraid of the Chinese, because <laughs> I have, I've been in the US, I've done all those studies in Texas where I was studying. Chinese are there, but uh, they didn't know anything better. I had a lot of Chinese students with me. Uh, they're, they're just like us. And uh, even though the media makes it big, it is what you do. Use it, whatever work you have, do it well, and the future will take care of itself. That is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajasthan, for that excellent uh, uh, presentation, uh, especially about uh, the, the points you know, brought about about accurate orbit determination uh, using GPS receivers and things like that. And especially for the last, you know, the bit which was the, uh, the most likable portion, uh, the where we were and where we have come. And uh, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's speech, you know, accurately, you know, uh, follows what uh, you know Vikram Sarabha said and where we have come today you know so thank you very much and I appreciate all the three of you for your one excellent presentation here today as we come to the end of the session thank you thank you very much to the chair for moderating this session so well and thank you to the speakers for your uh, very detailed presentations. Now we'll have the Q&A session for both the special address that we witnessed in the morning and this session together. So first, if I could request the questions uh, directed towards uh, Bhaskar Balasubramaniam, sir, that would be very good. Sir, are you able to hear me? Bhaskar, sir? Yes, I can hear you. I can. Great, sir. So so you can moderate. Yeah. So any questions? Yeah, please. I'm Krishnan here. Thank you, Dr. Balakrishnan, for an excellent presentation. I wish to ask a question about Geothermal energy that you mentioned in your lecture, what is the potential in India and where do you plan to harness it? Thank you. Okay, you want me to take another question? Yeah, one more question. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, is it only for Dr. Balakrishnan? Yeah, at okay. this point, yes. Yes, sir, you can go ahead, please. Yeah, well, I think a lot more of uh, exploration needs to be done for geothermal energy. And the technology is also uh, evolving rapidly because we are now able to drill to greater and greater depths. And as we go deeper into the Earth's crust, uh, you know, the availability of uh, geothermal energy is also more. So this is an evolving field. And uh, we 
you know, it's uh, it, it is not, of course, hundred percent renewable because uh, geothermal energy is a finite resource; it's not replenished. But uh, still, it's uh, it is a source of energy. You can convert uh, pump water down and convert it into steam or even superheated water, and use that energy for various purposes. So you know, it's a uh, both uh, you know the geological aspect as well as the technological development. Uh, could offer a lot of opportunities in the future. Uh, and as we are more or less getting pushed to phasing down of fossil energy, uh, this kind of energy will probably uh, attract more interest. So I am cautiously optimistic on this. Thank you, sir. Now we come back to the space segment. Uh, this is Arun here. My question could be for Dr. Chaitanya or anybody can answer. The space resource extraction, uh, are there international laws on who can use it or, you know, is there going to be a fight eventually? Who gets there first gets to use it? How does it work? So, uh, as of now, there have been around four to five space missions that have gone for in situ extraction and sample return purposes. Uh, one of it was Stardust, uh, which was an American mission. It went to a comet, Comet Will 2. Uh, after that, there was a European mission called Rosetta, uh, which I was part of. Uh, again, we did in situ analysis. There was no sample brought back. Japanese went twice, Hayabusa 2. And in all the cases of sample return missions, uh, the sample size was hardly a few grams. Even last week when, uh, I don't remember the name, but somebody from ISRO said that uh, the next uh, lunar mission uh, that India is doing jointly with the Japanese, we're planning to bring back samples. So uh, sample size is quite low. And with that low sample size, the chances of any conflict doesn't arise. So, and, and even with the, uh, Asteroid mining companies, the so-called mining companies, be it deep space industries or planetary resources. Planetary resources has gone defunct. So it has been taken over by a cryptocurrency company, you know. Uh, so nothing is on the anvil. And even if, uh, it will be hardly a few kilograms. So no chances of conflict as such. In the far future, you know, even the global geopolitical landscape will change, no? So actually, Perhaps we would want to be the rule setters then. <laughs> Just to add to what uh, you know, Professor Giri said, uh, the existing UN laws uh, do, do allow you know samples to be brought back to Earth. Uh, they even allow uh, you know colonies to be set up where with you know uh, police force there to protect their uh, environment or protect their you know area of operation and things like that. The only thing that they uh, ban is uh, placement of any weapons of mass destruction on any planet or in orbit and things like that. So uh, from that point of view, there is actually no, no law. <laughs> it's a lawless frontier now, right now. I'll just add to that. So uh, 2013, a bill was tabled in uh, US Senate that was called as US Apollo Lunar Landing Legacy Act. So this was tabled by the Democrats. Uh, one Democrat senator from Texas or somewhere, uh, where she said uh, that uh, wherever Apollo uh, assets are laid on the moon, all those areas be cordoned off and be designated as U.S. national parks. Now, how could that be? You know, you can't have national okay. parks on the moon. So uh, perhaps they have set a precedence. Uh, that bill was never passed, but uh, things are moving in that direction. The, you know, the we, we named it Shivashakti Point. <laughs> now, wherever we are now, earlier, even uh, even the uh, other one, uh, wherever we crash landed in Chandrayaan 2 point, Sri Lanka point. So, uh, uh, these are all going to be there for years to come unless it is disturbed by somebody else uh, going to go, go there tomorrow or something. But uh, definitely, the spacefaring nations, uh, especially right now, the six numbers, maybe the seventh is not coming up because we were sixth to enter. I think sixth have been almost capped for so many years of uh, accessing to, uh, no, space countries are more, but uh, space accessibility is only six countries we are having right now. Seventh one has not come up so far. 
We have entered long back, 60 years back, uh, with uh, 81 or 82 SLV. After that, no country has come up now. So it's a very, very guarded technology. So these, uh, these countries can have a kind of a formulation and all. The UN discussions are on now. I can't say that it's not there. It's discussions are on. But what we can do? See, in, in C, we have got 30 to 40 nautical miles, uh, the kind of uh, uh, no, our, our, our boundaries, uh, our water, terrestrial waters and all these things. Space, uh, our uh, no, boundaries are not at all there. How much we can go, how we can, uh, but space is fully you know, independent. So to have country boundaries also extremely, that is going to be more complex actually. There is no, uh, no, so who can really, so that, that rules are going to be very exact, extremely complex than whatever uh, rules right now we are having and dealing. So that takes more time also. The, the discussions are on, but nothing has come up because of the complexity, nature of the complexity of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> uh, this is Arnab here. Uh, I want to draw, in a, uh, draw your attention. I mean, largely the question is about jurisdiction. Uh, this Canadian company, if you remember, for the underwater tourism, uh, that accident that happened. Now, the fact is that there were no laws or there was no proper regulatory framework. Even, I mean, the American uh, uh, Coast Guard did help them uh, for the search. But that was just, they were doing it for charity. I mean, they were, they were not duty bound to do that. So, I mean, my point is that uh, when you start a commercial venture like this, even space tourism is being looked at now, but uh, who's going to have the jurisdiction to even regulate such an activity? And it was, I mean, uh, a lot of discussion has happened, but, you know, probably, I don't know if that was enough after this uh, underwater accident that happened. But uh, space is a similar thing where, you know, these are global commons. Uh, I mean, we had discussion on cyber also. I mean, these, uh, the uh, marine, uh, maritime and the uh, space and cyberspace, they are commons. Who regulates commons and to what extent they can be regulated is a question. So your views on this. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right, sir. Uh, so there is a convention in the uh, Outer Space Treaty, you know, there are three or four three treaties within that system. And one of it is the Rescue Convention. So Rescue Convention takes care of uh, aspects related to human spaceflight. But the issue, uh, the next issue is if there are too many commercial companies uh, engage in this, uh, and if the beneficial ownership pattern of these companies, you know, are quite, you know, discrete, diverse, or they are, you know, sort of tentacled into various countries. So what happens in that case? Who takes charge of their security? So if it's a Indo-American company, is it India's liability or is it American liability? So these factors are yet not, you know, thought of clearly. And perhaps whatever is happening in this space 2.0 or new spaces as it is called, uh, but these, you know, legal uh, hurdles or legal, you know, intricacies are going to get debated and discussed a lot. Uh, sadly, the entire Outer Space Treaty uh, is from the 1960s, 1967, and it finds no relevance in Space 2.0. So the, the biggest danger of that is that OST is getting obsolete every day, you know, as we proceed. So perhaps there is a need for a newer treaty, but again, that also depends uh, how efficacious United Nations remains exactly. in the coming years. Uh, that, that's the point, just, just uh, to add to we will come back to you. Just to add to what uh, uh, Dr. Giri said, the OST is totally obsolete, you know, and there is no way uh, the con countries are agreeing to what, what needs to be done. That's why we today have ILRS, which is the, you know, uh, uh, lunar research station being built by China and Russia together. They have want to have their own set of standards and Artemis Accords is another set of standards and they want to have their own rules. So eventually there will be a Cold War kind of situation between the two groups. Uh, that is most likely to happen. And again, like what uh, Dr. Giri said, in for human uh, space flight, every country is supposed to help any other country which is in distress and things like that. It's all mentioned uh, very comprehensively there, but it may not be practically possible. Yeah. What, just to add, add to that point, one, just one yeah. second, sir. Because you see paragliding also. Any such activity, I'm not comparing the magnitude of exactly what is happening. Any such activity which uh, have some risk or something, which many players are right now offering and uh, you know, 
we are uh, conducting. Uh, no, I don't say that uh, even mountaineering or anything of such activity has got no, these are all things of similar nature which, uh, you know, really we are, only insurance is there and you have to give a consent. If the company is operating, you have to give a consent that I, I am prepared to take the entire risk and I, the company is nowhere responsible. Yeah. That is the only thing uh, now we have to, that depends, the honest depends upon the risk, totally depends upon the actual, uh, the person who is really traveling or uh, who is enduring that uh, uh, travel. Right now. There has to be a more knowledgeable regulator who actually uh, makes it uh, mandatory for that company. I mean, they have made money, but are they, have they been responsible enough is a point uh, that I'm trying to make. So uh, uh, are there lessons learned? And I'm just not talking about space, but I'm talking yeah. about the larger three commons, which yeah. are very, very important, uh, uh, which needs to be regulated. So the lessons are to be learned, uh, learned you know, communally. So I feel there are lessons to be taken from UNCLOS whatever happens in the maritime domain, whatever happens in the underwater domain as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's one, you know, pretty incident that happened in Mumbai. So suddenly Mumbai Port Trust, this was, a, a, I think, 1960s, yes. Uh, 67, I guess, one year before, uh, 68, one year before Apollo. There was a distress call that there is a capsule that has landed in the Arabian Sea and it needs to be rescued. And that was one of the Luna capsules of the Soviet Union, which was rescued from the Arabian Sea, pulled up by the Indian Navy, brought to the Mumbai port. And uh, very recently, one of the journalists in Mumbai sort of covered that news. You know, it was long forgotten. So uh, again, it has to be synergized. A lot of lessons to be taken across the three commons, uh, even the cyber uh, commons, uh, and perhaps a lot of deliberation. Uh, food for thought, sir. See, one, uh, just to add to what uh, Professor Giri said, the UNUSA, the United Nations Outer Space uh, Office, uh, that says that every launch should be, the UN should be informed of every launch. I don't know how many countries do it today, you know, it may not happen, you know. Uh, that is, uh, one of the Yeah, uh, so, Professor, oh, sorry, yeah, sure. When air travel started, it was a purely domestic affair. Thereafter, international flights started. So over the year, they formed the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, which is headquarters at Montreal. I used to attend the meetings almost twice, thrice a year. So the ICAO, you see, it has representatives from all the countries of the world. They sit together, and they evolve rules and regulations relating to international flights. One other thing that was decided there, which was highly contested, was smoking inside the cabin of the aircraft. I participate in all the meetings. So a lot of countries who were producing cigarettes, they were opposed to it, including the United States. I mean, whatever I said was that there should be no smoking at all, because first of all, it's injurious to health, and secondly, it could cause fire, in-flight fires. Ultimately, all of them agreed. So now we have no smoking inside the aircraft. Similarly, in regard, an aircraft is considered to be a nation territory. Suppose some crime happens there, inside the aircraft, then it is a country from where the flight has taken place, I mean, or the ownership, rest, or the, the responsibility rests on the country. In case of hijacks, hijacks again is, becomes a very tricky issue because the aircraft lands in a foreign country, then it becomes a criminal jurisdiction of the country, however much your country may also get involved. If there is an accident, an aircraft accident will take place in a foreign country. Actually, what happens in the, wherever it takes place, that DGC has got the authority to investigate it. However, he has got a moral responsibility to associate the country 
whose aircraft got involved in an accident. Thirdly, the aircraft manufacturer also has got a right to get involved in the investigation of the accident. So that way, over the years, over these last 60, 70 years, these rules have got to be established. In, for, take, for example, licensing of pilots. I think there may be a couple of pilots here. Licensing of pilots is done on a uniform basis throughout the world. There is an ICAO licensing uh, standard. Similarly, ICAO maintenance standard. There are about, I think, uh, 24, now I don't remember, I got all the annexes. There are 28 annexes to the ICAO rules and regulations which is uniformly followed all over the world. I hope that in times to come, when space flight becomes very important, a similar organization may come up, which will regulate all these things. Just one more point here, like uh, to add to what you asked. Uh, today, whichever country launches the, the space object, that country is held responsible for any uh, you know, accidents or you know, incidents or anything like that. Uh, if I may just add to what uh, Dr. Chaitanya brought out, and also the point brought out by uh, <coughs> Anab. Uh, in the maritime domain, uh, laws are quite, quite clear. You know, the, we have Coast Guard officers here. They'll tell you there's a proper MSR organization. So though India has an exclusive economic zone of 2.2 square million square kilometers, the search and rescue region is 4 million square kilometers. You know, it's double the size. And there is a dedicated organization which looks at it, in our case, Indian Coast Guard, which have a network of maritime rescue coordination centers. And they are in touch with China and anybody else who is there. You know, like in Pakistan also, there is, uh, there is division of labor in terms of who would provide the search and rescue services. Why I bring this to your notice is that, uh, you know, because of the kind of traffic that was generated, because of the importance of saving lives at sea, you know, both during uh, hostilities and other times, these organizations have evolved. So as and when you are commercializing the space, these similar organizations will come into place. And there would be you know, these collaborative uh, uh, efforts to see that you are rescuing a uh, vehicle if it is there at standby notice, a two hours notice, 48 hours, whatever. So this will be something that will evolve over a period of years. So at the moment, we are still in that gray zone where people are not clear about to who's going to give the this thing. So the easiest way is to say the nation which is launching will look after all aspects of it. But slowly, this will evolve. And you know, there's no stopping this because we are going to also have, uh, uh, you know, uh, various uh, planets on the Earth, uh, under Earth, people going from Earth to these planets, and so therefore, uh, this entire thing will evolve. Is my assessment? But the International Space Station, the U.S. and uh, Russia collaborated in spite of uh, being in a Cold War kind of a thing. So, so any other questions? Not a question, so just. Uh, we all have been talking, Mr. Uh, Shivaraman had also given an excellent talk on AI and where China has reached. We have, somebody said, no, China has not reached. I'll just give you a point of view. I would recommend a book. It's a compilation edited by Michael Pillsbury, Chinese Views of Future Warfare. It was published in 1998, a series of their own within China, lectures and seminars of all people involved, who would be involved, and they identified six future combat scenarios which they need to work on, and I'm talking of 1996, and we are today in 2023. When I read it out, you may be able to link it to where they are going, outer space combat. That is the first one they spoke about. <coughs> Long range combat. We are looking at all their UAVs and everything that has come up. Robo combat, where robotics with AI comes into play. Radiation combat, we are hearing about their directed energy weapons. Computer combat, that is cyber and quantum computing. And paralysis combat, which deals not just with striking in the electromagnetic spectrum, but in the neural sciences. We somewhere have forgotten about neural sciences in all the importance of various fields that we need to do. The uh, Soviet Union were the leaders at that, and they called the Americans had called it then in the 70s reflexive control. 
Reflexive control means I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I will create such a situation and information paralysis for you that you'll do exactly what I want you to do. This is what they are specializing in, sir, and we are seeing the results today, 27 years down the line. Have we anywhere done anything like this in India? I don't think so. We are only reacting. They have been proactive. Thank you, General. Thank you for bringing out this particular point. I agree with you that uh, you know, they had a long-term vision on that, and they have been doing that. And especially after the Gulf War and the you know attack on Iraq and the attack on Kosovo and you know uh, operations, Chinese uh, felt that the only way they can take on U.S. is by attacking their uh, 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 space assets. You know, so that's what they wanted to do, and that is what it shows. So, any other question? There is no other question. Then we will call it the end of the session. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for moderating the Q&A so well. Uh, now we come to the end of this session. I'd like to invite uh, Commodore Vasan, sir. Uh, sorry, uh, I'd like to invite uh, the chair, Subramaniam Sridharan, sir, to felicitate the speaker. Thank you. Now that brings us to the next session for the day, session two, Green Technologies and Innovations for a Sustainable Future. The chair for this session is uh, our dear distinguished member, Mr. L. V. Krishnan, who is also the mind behind this entire conference. So thank you very much, sir. I invite you to the stage to moderate the session. We also have three eminent speakers for this session as well. Uh, the first is Dr. Srinivas Reddy, who is a professor at IIT Madras. He will be speaking on emerging smart and green technology. The next speaker is Dr. Lakshmi Priya, who will be joining us online. She's from ICWA, and she will be speaking about the green hydrogen revolution, a game changer for India's energy landscape. The third speaker is Mr. Rishab Jain, who's a senior program lead um, at CEEW, Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. He'll be speaking about promoting SMEs and entrepreneurship. I invite the speakers to join us on the stage. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> we are going to be speaking about an important topic, energy. Energy, I think, is what is primary to everything that we do, even for our... So as I was saying, I think energy is primary to everything that we do. And uh, we are now actually in an almost critical situation because we are supposed to face down the coal utilization or other fossil fuel utilization. So we are looking for green energies. Now, hydrogen is considered to be a green energy carrier. It is not necessarily a source. So let me be very brief uh, about the people who are going to present their views in this particular session. Now, we have three of them who come from three different institutions which have different orientations as well. So that, I think, makes it very interesting because they'll give you three different points of view. Now, Professor Srinivas Reddy from IIT in Madras, an SNT institution that combines teaching with technology R&D. Ms. Lakshmi Priya from Indian Council of World Affairs, which is an 80-year-old government-supported institution with the Indian vice president as its president. Now, it focuses on world affairs. Dr. Rishabh Jain from the Center for Energy and Environment and Water, CEW, it's an independent think tank known to provide sound policy analysis on various issues related to energy and environment. In fact, you can even go back and read their presentations and uh, reports. It's very interesting. Now, it's good to see many young people also here in the audience. I would urge them to listen carefully to what the speakers have to say, because over the next two to three decades, we would need to reduce substantially our dependence on fossil fuels, as I mentioned earlier. And it is these young people who will have a big role in review of progress and provide advice to the government at the time. Now, let us get on with the session in right earnest. And I expect to have a lot of interesting information that the speakers would share with us. Now, we are going to start with Mr. Rishabh Jain, because I think Mr. Srinivas Reddy is given. OK. Would, would you like to start first? OK. OK, we'll start with. Srinivas Reddy, Professor Reddy, Srinivas Reddy. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, uh, at the outset, uh, thank, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to give a talk. Uh, and uh, the talk is on uh, here. Forward, forward and backward. OK. OK. So uh, my talk is on uh, emerging smart and green technologies. That's what the topic is given to me as a part of uh, the green technologies and innovation for sustainable future. Uh, the outline of my talk is I'll give some introduction and uh, energy sources and services for net zero future, sustainability, and uh, how the green technologies play a role and technology and innovations in uh, sustainable for sustainable future, and some emerging and smart technology solutions, plus uh, well, the green energy uh, potential for India, and uh, especially how do we adapt these or, uh, uh, implementation of uh, green energy technologies, and uh, little bit supply chain cycles as far as uh, solar uh, and uh, other renewables are concerned. 
and I'll also give you uh, the R&D, R&D, the activities in green energy uh, at IIT Madras and some conclusions. So, oh sorry, going back. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in fact, uh, several problems and energy is one of the most important, but energy problem cannot be addressed uh, in isolation, so energy and, area. energy and environment, they go together. So energy can solve most of these problems if we address uh, appropriately with uh, um, sustainability in the, uh, in, in, in focus. So uh, if you look at uh, broadly, some of uh, you, if you know that, there are two broad classification of energies, uh, celestial or income energy. The other one is a capital. Any energy source which comes from the outer space is called celestial. That includes solar, lunar, and particle energy, and so on. Uh, the capital energy is mainly fossil fuels and uh, nuclear plus uh, geothermal at some extent. If you uh, classify these energy reserves broadly, renewables, fossils, and uh, nuclear. Sorry, yeah. Nuclear. And if you look at, uh, there's some problem. Okay. If you look at uh, um, energy system hierarchy, energy transformation system, it uh, source, carriers, and equipment. And uh, the most important thing, now we are looking at the energy uh, carriers, uh, which uh, includes hydrogen is the main focus nowadays uh, because of uh, it, its uh, green hydrogen, which is because of uh, its uh, end use efficiency and so on. Um, um, if you look at uh, the energy source and services uh, towards, actually it started, you know, the pre-industrialization, uh, because uh, this pointer is not working here. The pre-industrialization, if you look at the main uh, s source of energy is, uh, again, renewables like sunlight, uh, mainly. Uh, but after industrialization started, like in the 1870s, uh, then commercial uh, exploitation of fossil fuels started. And then we are moving towards, again, uh, the, when we talk about net zero future, the hydrogen is one of the important uh, future energy carrier. But how do we produce this hydrogen is an important. So uh, if you produce the hydrogen uh, or the solar f fuels from the renewables, uh, is going to be a sustainable solution. So therefore, how do we go forward is uh, important. How the technologies play an important role. Only the two indigenous technologies play an important role. We look at that uh, here. And if you uh, look at the uh, global energy potential, uh, I think they are given here in the large uh, circles here, from uh, fossil to uh, renewables. And this bigger yellow circle is the solar, which uh, I'm, I mainly work, we are mainly working on that. And that can meet the world's uh, energy consumption in more most sustainable way. So, but uh, sustainability is a major uh, challenge now uh, because the the present scenario is fossil uh, fuel driven uh, based scenario. See, we look at uh, the, um, we look at this kind of luxury and the cleaner earth, but uh, unfortunately we uh, extend as you uh, usage of fossil fuels uh, creates problem. How do we address this? When this uh, how do we attain sustainability is a major challenge here. Then how do uh, go for glo global climate or, uh, change uh, for uh, cleaner solutions is an important issue. So therefore it is uh, important. Overloading any system will be a, a big uh, challenge here, bigger problem. So therefore uh, how do we go for uh, energy sustainability or uh, sustainable solution for future energy demand. Uh, green energy is one of them, but uh, how do we uh, address this is an important thing. See, we have, uh, we have energy sources, uh, but the sources can be exploited in a most effective way. Uh, if there is no technology, we can exploit and overburden the uh, Earth's atmosphere, but we should know, uh, we should keep these uh, resources for the future generation. So therefore, the green technology, the technology which is uh, there to keep the resources for the future generation and uh, use them in a most effective way, that technology plays an important role. So uh, today's uh, talk, I am going to give you some technological solutions uh, mainly uh, for the sustainable future. So what, 
What is the meaning of that is? It's your money, your environment, you have to take it. You have to conserve the Earth's atmosphere. So uh, energy sustainability is an important thing. And how do we achieve this is uh, mainly uh, through energy efficiency, proper mix of energy sources, and make use of renewable energy source. And this, there are uh, several barriers uh, to these uh, uh, for reliable energy supply. Those uh, I have listed here. I think some of you know very well. These uh, factors uh, plays an important role as far as the uh, supply, energy supply is concerned. So I, I'm not uh, uh, explaining this because uh, some of you know and uh, in want of time. And uh, Energy security is a major challenge because there are several disruptions mainly nowadays geopolitical uh, activities playing a major role as far as the energy supply is concerned. So therefore, uh, it is important how to make uh, the energy uh, supply is uh, reliable. Not only that, uh, the stabilizing greenhouse gases is another, atmosphere is, uh, sorry, environment is also another issue. So therefore, there is no single solution or policy can address this. There are uh, several solutions uh, ranging uh, f from um, green energy solutions to uh, carbon sequestration and advanced view to, uh, of course, renewable energy technologies. Uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, we are working mainly on the renewable energy side and, of course, some of these uh, other areas, including uh, hydrogen and so on. So uh, according to me, how do we uh, uh, balance these uh, technologies and um, innovations uh, for sustainable future? There are uh, drivers and uh, uh, goals. So therefore, uh, there is GDP drivers, energy demand driver, and uh, energy uh, supply driver. I, I, I coined this A, B, C, D, E, T. Four, four uh, in the parenthesis, all those four are important for making uh, innovations as well as the technologies uh, for sustainable future. What are these? Uh, these uh, this is called 4A, uh, 4A criteria, 4B perception. <coughs> and uh, 4C innovation and uh, 4D approach and uh, 4E analysis and of course 4T transformation. So all, all these play an important role uh, as far as the technology and innovation uh, for sustainable future is concerned. I have, uh, because I'm not, uh, you please go through this because uh, it's, uh, uh, it explanation takes much longer time. So the green energy technology, what do you mean by green energy technology? As I mentioned that uh, the solar is a most important uh, uh, source. And all other uh, renewables we call uh, them, uh, whatever we call them, are manifestation of uh, uh, these. And there is a direct and indirect conversion. All indirect conversions are man manifestation of solar energy in the form of other renewables, like wind, biomass, and ocean water. And direct energy conversion, uh, converting solar into either uh, heat or into the uh, into the electricity directly by photovoltaics, but they have wide range of process heat applications, uh, which uh, is in the form of heat uh, that is ranging here: water heating to drying of foods, cooking, desalination, refrigeration, and of course greenhouses and uh, power generation and so on. So um, uh, ultimately, uh, how, where to address and uh, uh, where to actually, uh, how to uh, deal with them and uh, where to emphasize um, to attain the uh, sustainability as far as uh, uh, energy solutions are concerned. See, uh, the, t no, the technology is not only t uh, sustainable, but also have to be smart and green. So if you look at uh, uh, this, uh, uh, there is a wide range of technologies which are given interconnected in a hybrid mode as well as a standalone mode and uh, uh, integrated mode. So both including renewables, energy storage, energy efficiency, as well as uh, um, uh, proper mix of uh, other forms of sources and so on. It is given here. But uh, if, how do we uh, attain the reliable, smart, re resilient energy system? The, the present system somewhere uh, uh, like this fossil fuel based with some uh, uh, solar renewables uh, integrated but it, it's not to the level of uh, uh, level of uh, sustainability i uh, propose uh, maybe you have to have a, an integration of energy sources in this format so that it will give um, a sustainable feature so it is not only integration of this but also uh, storage and other uh, aspects here then uh, um, energy uh, demand is rapidly growing, what we call S-curve. Uh, this, uh, um, as you know, that the energy demand uh, increase is because of uh, 
So there are three factors, industrialization and increase in uh, uh, per capita energy consumption as well as the population. Population is also one of the major uh, factors. So therefore, uh, it is uh, important uh, to come up uh, um, the technologies, mainly green technologies, to meet the uh, demand or uh, projected demand of uh, the both India as well as globally, uh, this one. If you look at energy map in India, mm -hmm. it looks like this. It covers all the, um, uh, both fossils, renewables, and mm -hmm. all these. Uh, it's a very complex. Uh, you have a, a, a network of uh, these resources integrated in a, uh, integrated in a um, uh, cohesive way uh, and integrated in a, um, uh, not really sustainable, but uh, to m meet the uh, demand. See, since uh, the organizers asked me to give some potential here, uh, this uh, is the India, as far as the green energy uh, potential for India is concerned, uh, it is, uh, of course, emerging market and growing rapidly, and it's a fourth in global renewable energy uh, installations, and especially wind and solar also, and uh, as you know that by 2070, we want to have a, a, a net zero emissions, so therefore, uh, there are uh, these, some of the statistics are given here. I think the rapid growth of 396 uh, percent in the last nine years, mainly for non-fossil non uh, fuels. And uh, large hydro or nuclear also gaining momentum as well. And uh, there are some uh, other, in, in recent times, uh, in recent times uh, you have this. I have put a uh, graph here, uh, uh, representation how the installed capacity of different um, energy sources here, and then the capacity, uh, energy uh, installed capacity in gigawatts are given, potential versus uh, installed capacity here. So there is a huge gap between potential and installed, still there is a lo lot of uh, uh, scope for uh, increasing uh, the uh, installations here. And uh, you, if you look at the solar uh, energy, it's already 71.61 uh, gigawatts of uh, capacity is installed here. Uh, uh, this is the latest figure in August uh, 2023. And uh, its uh, capacity is increasing uh, from uh, this 20, almost 21,000 megawatts to uh, 70,000 megawatts in the last five years. Uh, it's a huge jump, quantum jump uh, from, uh, of course, it is expected to f f five gig 500 gigawatt in by 2030. And though these solar energy systems include uh, not only land-based, but also floating type as well as uh, solar thermal. And uh, this is the uh, resource potential is given here. And especially west side, you have a l large uh, potential regions, uh, of course, including uh, uh, across the uh, country. Uh, this is widespread, actually. The applications of energy is widespread. So, uh, um, Across the India, uh, you, there is scope for potential uh, installations. And uh, if you look at fossil uh, to renew, uh, solar, and this curve shows that how co coal and solar and others are merging by 2040. So almost uh, they come together at the same scale of uh, uh, same uh, fractions. Um, uh, maybe all of them equal to 30, 35 percent each. So this is the change in installed capacity uh, over that, and the solar installations are growing rapidly uh, in India. Um, but of course, the fossil fuels. But re recent uh, times, because of the uh, this geopolitical activities, again uh, there is some emphasis on coal-based power plants also. But again, there are other issues. Uh, see, we uh, uh, one of our students working on uh, on a white paper how to how to make it uh, more uh, sustainable by um, retrofitting or repowering these uh, fossil fuels, uh, mainly coal-based power plants by solar thermal uh, systems. So this is, uh, again, uh, you have a, uh, a wind energy potential also drastic, and it's uh, mainly Gujarat and Tamil Nadu are the major uh, players, uh, uh, complete installation, and we are going to offshore because of uh, the potential enhancement and so on. And this is uh, uh, another thing is the biomass now. We are talking about biomass. Mainly this is a major problem. You see the pollution in Delhi. Uh, agro waste is a major challenge. How to convert that into a most effective way. Uh, either you go for uh, derived fuels or uh, the direct combustion or even pyrolysis in, uh, for producing uh, other uh, forms of fuels. There's a l large potential. 
what are the major challenges here if there, there are techn uh, technological uh, reasons and managerial problems, economic issues and structural issues are the major, uh, these are the four major aspects uh, which uh, make uh, the high energy demand and high uh, intense energy intensity uh, as far as these uh, uh, energy, uh, both fossil and renewables are concerned. Then there's a supply chain uh, issues here. Uh, we'll I have listed out here up, upstream process, uh, production process and downstream process as far as the renewables are uh, concerned, the solar uh, as well as the electricity and other domestic industries are uh, concerned. And this uh, a big uh, supply chain frameworks includes research status and also the future directions which we look at how, how to make uh, more uh, supply, whether it's a see main uh, problem here is how to make it indigenous uh, 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 indi indigenous supplies and that is a major uh, challenge as long as we dependent on uh, the other side of uh, exports there is a problem and uh, the uh, another important aspect is make use of uh, this rare earth materials for uh, renewables so that uh, we can uh, make it more sustainable solution I have listed out some of these uh, rare earth materials and their potential here and how we can use for uh, different uh, uh, renewable energies including solar here, solar PV and this is a, uh, uh, these are the material side and how it is transformed into till to the end of that. And is a wind energy conversion from um, the materials to the recycling and disposal, this, uh, this complete uh, supply chain of uh, wind. And this is uh, uh, batteries, again storage, energy storage is an important aspect to improve the reliability of the uh, system. So I have, uh, these are research papers, uh, how to make the solar panels uh, uh, um, zero uh, uh, discharge conditions uh, from uh, production to re recycling of this. And some of these uh, material uh, distributions are given here on the corner and then how do we recycle them is an important. And this is a, a big paper, if you want, uh, you can I'll pass on the paper here. Uh, so these are environmental impacts of uh, uh, energy system, uh, solar energy systems. And especially the transportation is uh, of the PV is uh, contributing about 29% and incineration process about 34% how to, um, and material recovery is about 24%. And these are some of these, uh, how, what are the different uh, resources use water, electricity and other uh, forms of energy. And you'll, for recycling one meter square of uh, silicon panel, uh, there's about five kgs of CO2 emissions and uses about 38 uh, megajoules of uh, energy. So therefore, uh, it is uh, important to recycle and more the early stage uh, solar installations now coming to the end of their lives. So therefore, now recycling is a major uh, challenge here. And these are some of the clusters which are uh, uh, initiated in India as far as the recycling of uh, uh, solar energy is concerned. And again, similarly, the wind energy here. Uh, wind energy installations have uh, reached to a maturity level. And uh, mainly how do we recover and reuse and uh, recycle the materials uh, through uh, mechanical, chemical pyrolysis and oxidation in fluid as beds are uh, important. Uh, and uh, almost material recovery is also very challenge here and the environmental issues here. And uh, this is another important aspect, biomass uh, recycling. As you know that um, the, just now I mentioned, the stable burning is a major challenge. Now how to uh, make them value added products is important here. I have listed out uh, some of these here. Uh, um, uh, quickly, I'll show you what uh, I have given you uh, how uh, the sustainable energy uh, solutions um, uh, in terms of uh, renewables are all top. Uh, I have not given here uh, uh, ocean and uh, um, geothermal, but otherwise uh, mainly the major uh, renewable energies are uh, uh, solar and wind and so on. At IIT Madras, we are working uh, some of uh, these aspects, including uh, concentrating solar power and uh, uh, solar uh, energy storage and desalination. I'll take a few more minutes. So solar uh, materials and uh, resource estimate. These are the broad four areas. Have shown you four, four, four A, B, C, D, E to till uh, T's. Uh, all four uh, uh, E's are in implemented here. And our approach is mainly 4D approach, design, development, demonstration, and deployment approach. And based on this, we have developed several technologies, commercialized, and then, of course, so taken to the market. And some of these technologies, uh, I'll quickly show you, uh, these green energy technologies uh, at IIT Madras. 
or uh, what happened? So this uh, is a mainly concern, this is our lab, concentrating solar uh, uh, power, and we have uh, uh, concentrating collectors and uh, mainly thermal collectors, and including dish, parabolic troughs, and PV panels, and uh, concentrating photovoltaic. Desalination is another important aspect here. And um, our approach is a 4D approach, as I mentioned that uh, it is to level to the technology so that they can, uh, the industrial associates can take directly into the field and install this, some of them. So therefore, these are massive systems. Uh, so, uh, we have also done a comprehensive analysis for the entire country, how, how even they are implemented, uh, whether these technologies are viable or unviable and conditionally viable. So uh, I have listed out across the India, uh, wherever green color uh, uh, locations are viable and blue are uh, conditionally viable, red ones are not uh, viable. And another important aspect is the hydrogen production because we are talking about uh, green hydrogen. How do, we, how do we use this technology to produce green hydrogen is an important thing. So this is another technology, parabolic trough. And this uh, lab uh, uh, which is located, you can see that uh, uh, with respect to uh, the people here. It's a, a test bed uh, to evaluate the technologies also. And this uh, system we installed in a school uh, near to Chennai about 70 kilometers. Patashala, G.D. Krishnamurti Foundation School uh, uh, to produce uh, electricity, water, and uh, coal, and, and uh, process it. Cooking, cooking, uh, uh, coal, that is air conditioning, uh, power generation, as well as the water production. So desalination, all this, it's a comprehensive uh, system. It's based on solar thermal technologies. And uh, we also do a lot of uh, research uh, in our lab to develop technologies. And this is another uh, air conditioning technology uh, um, based on the concentrating solar power. Um, then we have uh, desalination is another important aspect, water production. We have uh, created a, a water net like, uh, like uh, uh, um, Sagar Mala. You have a, a, we have vast coast, you know, um, uh, how to convert the uh, sea water into a portable water. So therefore we need uh, technology. And uh, one of our industrial uh, associates installed a, 120 liter, 120,000 liters uh, solar desalination system. Now, uh, as you know that Chennai, um, we, we have about three uh, plants, uh, 100 MLD and 400 MLD uh, RO process, RO plants to convert seawater into portable water. This is one of such technologies, converting water into portable water. Not only that, but also effluent uh, treatment, uh, uh, textile and uh, process it, uh, tannery and other a process industry effluent treatment is also an important. This we work with Tirpur uh, uh, textile industries uh, for treatment and mobility is another important uh, aspect. How to uh, solar uh, develop solar mobility systems and compare with uh, this kind of system, making more viable options and other uh, things, uh, technologies which we call smart and uh, green technologies, including uh, the process heat and um, um, cogeneration, tri-generation systems uh, based on the concentrating photovoltaics. And another uh, important uh, technology is the, uh, this is mainly used for desalination, which is a passive and low cost because when we go to rural areas, uh, it is the cost is a, an important thing. Now, uh, when uh, these fishermen, when they go into the sea, uh, the water is another uh, major problem. How to uh, produce onboard water is uh, another uh, important uh, Aspect of, uh, and technology plays an important role. This is uh, one such uh, technology here. I have, I think, a couple of more slides. Uh, this is, uh, and another thing is um, how to convert, uh, because uh, the sanitation is a major challenge. You know, Swachh Bharat we are talking about. And how to convert uh, uh, the gray water into useful product as well as treat it in a most effective way. We have uh, developed a solar technology to uh, treat uh, the tree. I think we are going back. Uh, uh, what happened? It's not moving. So another um, uh, important technology is uh, we have uh, uh, installed uh, a system uh, which is called Bio uh, CPV, which is a um, uh, it is a biomass solar integrated system in West Bengal, close to Shantiniketan. Uh, in a tribal village, uh, which uh, 
integrates to solar and biomass in this way and produce hydrogen also uh, and then cooking gas. This is a schematic of uh, that and uh, these, this is the system implementation uh, here and uh, you see the biogas and it's a, a different business model. Peop uh, the local uh, people they come with their biomass and feed into that and take uh, electricity or uh, the energy gas equivalent to that. This is uh, such system here. And uh, now built environments also important, net zero energy buildings as a part of that we are uh, working on low cost, uh, low energy material buildings. This is in conceptual stage, integration of solar and waste management also, biomass uh, systems. And uh, this is what, uh, it's a toilet, uh, zero discharge toilet. Swachh um, Bharat, we are talking about sanitation is another important. So it's a zero liquid, zero solid uh, discharge toilet. We installed in our uh, students hostel, Godavari, uh, sorry. Krishna Hostel in IIT Madras uh, to re, uh, treat this uh, grey water. Uh, with this, uh, I have, I think I have exceeded time. I will come to my uh, conclusions here. Uh, that is a flexible and efficient renewable energy uh, electricity generation with storage solution is important apart from the hydrogen production. And uh, the, there are some new concepts I call ICCM, integration control uh, metering and more. Uh, communication. Uh, that is a, a, a technology which is used for making integrated system and uh, communicating in the most effective way. Sustainable energy technology through 4DC, like design, development, de demonstration, and commercialization approach is one of the solutions to make uh, these green energy solutions for, uh, for sustainable future. And recycling, reuse of materials uh, to be valued with, uh, uh, for effective disposal uh, of uh, waste mainly which is a which comes from the renewable energy source finally the work in progress uh, as far as the green energy solutions in india is concerned towards resilient and green uh, energy generation storage for uh, mainly flexible and efficient uh, system integration and for, for su sustainable and net zero uh, future thank you very much uh, yeah if you have any hope i'm i'm from iit madras some of you have visited uh, we are in a sustainable campus with our friends like this. So if you have any questions, please ask this gentleman or gentleman for person. I'll answer on the behalf of this person. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation, all around application of solar energy, right? And I think this is from the laboratory in the institute, and I hope uh, a lot of these things will also soon be commercialized. They have demonstrated, they have demonstrated, and to a certain extent they have commercialized, but I think a large scale commercialization, commercialization for instance, the concentrated solar power has a certain advantage, Right now, we seem to be depending on import of solar panels, and perhaps if we can make use of concentrated solar, mirrors perhaps may be more easily produced in India. So it has a certain application, and concentrated solar also will be able to provide you some provision for storage of heat. So let us look at it. Maybe they'll soon come up with uh, commercial solutions. Thank you. Now, I think we are ready for the next presentation, right? It's going to be by Lakshmi Priya from ICWA. She's going to be speaking essentially about IMEC and hydrogen. And that's, I think, going to be very really interesting to us. Thank you. So if Lakshmi Priya is ready, I think she can start. Uh, yes, sir. Am I, am I audible? Yes. You are audible. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. So first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on such a pertinent topic. And we know that uh, how green hydrogen revolution in India is going to be a game changer for our energy landscape. So inaugurating the India Energy Week 2023. Hi, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you switch your video on? We can't see you. Yeah, yeah. One, one second. Thank you. Yeah, is this fine? Okay. So, 
uh, again thank you for giving me this opportunity and uh, i would be talking about green hydrogen revolution in india and how it is going to be a game changer so inaugurating the india energy week 2023 prime minister modi said that the country is taking a lead in the green hydrogen sector and will be replacing grey hydrogen to increase its share to 25% the national green hydrogen mission aims to make india the global hub for production usage and export of green hydrogen and its derivatives this will contribute to india's aim to become atmanirbhar through clean energy and serve as an inspiration for the global clean energy transition it will also lead to the significant decarbonization of the economy reduce dependence on fossil fuel imports and enable india to assume technology and market leadership in green hydrogen to this end the government will decide an year wise trajectory of minimum share of consumption for green hydrogen and the government has laid an outlay for low carbon steel projects mobility power projects and shipping power projects green hydrogen has immense potential for india that is sincerely working on reducing carbon emissions and increasing its share in renewable energy before going any further and since this is a new field let me dwell a bit on what is green hydrogen we know hydrogen is a clean source of energy and when consumed in a fuel cell it produces only water as a by product it is colorless odorless tasteless gaseous flammable transparent substance and it has extremely low melting and boiling points majorly used in production of ammonia and methanol for industrial processes and for hydrogenation of organic compounds it is also used as a primary rocket fuel as well as in direct reduction of iron ores to metallic iron earlier the focus was mainly on the use of hydrogen in transportation sector followed by power generation and industries however recent technological innovations to use hydrogen as a fuel cell makes it one of the most promising energy sources for global energy transition to renewables commercially viable hydrogen can be produced from hydrocarbons including natural gas oil and coal through processes like steam methane reformation partial oxidation and coal gasification as well as from renewables like water sunlight and wind through electrolysis and photolysis and other thermochemical processes hydrogen has been in color coded based on the source of production and carbon emission but the most commonly used ones are gray hydrogen and blue hydrogen with focus on increasing the share of green hydrogen gray hydrogen is produced from the natural gas and blue hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels but the carbon emitted is captured through the process of carbon capture utilization and storage processes being produced from renewable sources of energy green hydrogen is considered as a carbon neutral fuel development of hydrogen fuel cell technology has enabled hydrogen to be the magic potion that in principle can replace all forms of energy in use and provide energy services to all sectors of the economy today more than 30 countries have either developed or are, are at various stages of developing a national strategy for hydrogen China, European Union, India, Japan, South Korea and the United States have the potential to become early leading markets for hydrogen because of their market size and or ambitious hydrogen plans and are well positioned to set rules of the game if their strategies and plans are operationalized. India recognizes the critical need for green hydrogen as it aims to become independent in fulfilling its energy needs by 2047. and to achieve net zero emissions by 2070 currently around 5 uh, mmt of hydrogen is consumed annually in india for various industrial processes and most of it is gray hydrogen sourced from uh, steam reformation process of fossil fuels by 2030 india aims to become a global hub for production usage and export of green hydrogen and its derivatives while becoming a leader in technology and manufacturing of electrolyzers and other enabling technologies electrolyzers are the core of green hydrogen value chain and contribute to 30 to 40% of the levelized cost of hydrogen indigenization of electrolyzer manufacturing is the key to accelerate the green hydrogen system the announcement of production linked incentives under the strategic interventions for green hydrogen transition program 
is the first step in catalyzing domestic production of green hydrogen in India. India can not only fulfill its own demands for electrolyzers, but can also emerge as a cost-effective location for electrolyzer production globally. Our manufacturing cost is expected to be 30% lower than Western countries as well as China due to lower capital expenditure and operations expenditure owing to availability of cheap land equipment and manpower. In order to facilitate the delivery of renewable energy for green hydrogen production, various policy provisions are being made, including waiver of interstate transmission charges for renewable energy, facilitating renewable energy banking, and time-bound grant of open access and connectivity. Government is also focusing on the infrastructure development, skill development, and the development of regulations and standards for the production of green hydrogen. The mission hopes to achieve production of 5 MMT of green hydrogen by 2030, creation of 6 lakh new jobs, and installation of 60 to 100 gigawatt electrolyzers. In August 2023, the Indian government has notified the green hydrogen standard and the standard issued by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy outlines the emission thresholds that must be met in order for hydrogen produced to be classified as green, that is, from renewable resources. Green hydrogen is a game changer. India depends on 85 to 90 percent import of oil and gas to fulfill its domestic demands and intends to use green hydrogen as a replacement for fossil fuel, derived feedstocks in petroleum refining, fertilizer production, and steel manufacturing. It looks forward to blending green hydrogen in city gas distribution systems. Further, it also intends to decarbonize the mobility sector through use of hydrogen-fueled long-haul automobiles by creation of hydrogen highways and marine vessels through establishment of green hydrogen or ammonia refueling hubs at Indian ports. Lastly, it perceives green hydrogen as a versatile energy carrier that can meet energy requirements of remote geographies, including islands, in a sustainable manner. IIT Indore has developed a process to produce green hydrogen from recycling pet plastic waste in water. It can produce 1 kg of green hydrogen from 33 kgs of pet waste. The mechanism can be refined and its efficiency can be increased in a due course of time. As per government estimates, over 8 lakh crore of green hydrogen investments are expected by 2030. Adoption of green hydrogen can enable India to abate 3.6 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions cumulatively between now and 2050. India's top oil firm, IOC, has unveiled the nation's first green hydrogen powered bus that emits uh, water. It will produce close to 75 kg of hydrogen by splitting water using electricity from renewable sources. And this hydrogen will be used to power two buses, which will ply across the national capital region for trial runs. Private firms such as Reliance, Adani, Renew Power, and LNT have interest in engaging in this sector. Ten states led by Gujarat, but including Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Kerala, have also been identified as potential production hubs. As of now, the industry faces high cost of production, uh, but owing to increased demand, technological upgradation, and strong government support, the industry will soon establish economies of scale, driving down the cost. In line with India's Make in India initiative and its net zero emission targets, the sector provides tremendous scope for growth and investments. India is at a crucial juncture in terms of energy landscape, and green hydrogen has a critical role to play to make the nation self-reliant and energy dependent. In this context, India's uh, participation in the IPEC corridor is also very significant, and we would be expecting to invest in the Saudi Arabia's NEOM uh, uh, project and also other projects, and this will be a gateway for India to the Europe and uh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi Priya. I think uh, that was a comprehensive presentation on green hydrogen from various ways of uh, production. Now, 
let me move on to Professor Rishabh Jain. I think he is going to be able to speak to us about, I think, uh, the entire system, clean energy, right? Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Krishnan. Hi, everyone. I'm Rishabh Jain from the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. We are a non-profit policy research institution based in New Delhi, India. I lead the team called Technology Futures. So as you can see, the, the organization is, um, we use data, integrated analysis, and strategic outreach to explain and change the use, reuse, and misuse of resources. We, um, we focus on certain transformations, as you see on the left side which is on focusing on low carbon, building a low carbon economy, energy transition, power market, industrial sustainability and livelihoods to improve quality of life through certain indicators and using certain enablers. So I, as I said, I lead the team called Technology Futures. We are a 13 year old organization uh, with a 250 plus multidisciplinary team um, with headquartered in Delhi with a small office in UP actively work with multiple states and 20 plus states right now and we were um, official collaborators knowledge partners supporters for 13 different ministries for india's g20 presidency the whole uh, this presentation i mean we our team wrote a couple of reports for india's g20 presidency on um, supply chain on critical minerals and batteries some of these findings are shared here and um, the, the final discussion and the conclusion slide is basically what are the opportunities forward, what are the learnings, et cetera, et cetera. How much of these technologies improve, the costs reduce. Um, so there are different possibilities. The solar in one of the possibility may be around 5,000 gigawatts and some other it may be 7,000 plus gigawatt. All of this depends on how much hydrogen scales up, do we necessarily have CCUS in India or not and at what particular scale. In broad, we, our study estimates that there will be around USD $10 trillion of expenditure between 2020 and 2070, which means $200 billion of annual expenditure will be required in the next 50 years. So it's a huge market, clean energy market. Um, and currently, the focus on manufacturing of some of these technologies is, of course, very less in India. Of course, there are many steps that have been taken up recently. I'll, I'll touch upon those. But this is not just for India. There are similar patterns that are now visible globally for different kinds of technologies. Uh, the slides are available. These are from a IEA report that talks about by 2050, what will the kind of annual solar deployment, wind deployment in 2050. Of course, they'll, you can see the, the kind of increase that is there from 2020 to 2050 and 2030. It's a similar case for batteries and for electrolyzer. So, from 2020 to 2050, the markets will have to increase significantly and the deployments will also need to increase significantly. But global manufacturing capacities will need to scale up also to meet the increased demand. Now I know uh, Professor Reddy also mentioned already, but there are different processes that go into a manufacturing of a solar module, wind turbine, batteries and electrolyzers. While we don't necessarily need to go into detail on all of these, what this particular side means is the whole manufacturing process is a very complex step. Many of these steps are highly concentrated in one or two countries, mostly China, but maybe few other countries. And any country that needs to indigenize or plans to indigenize needs to figure out what is their strength and weakness itself. So this particular slide only tells you that how complex some of these steps are. Again, this is for batteries, that is for um, electrolyzer. And this graph is a year old from the International Energy Agency. It talks about that despite the huge potential and if we have to meet our net zero targets and maybe 2030 installation targets, 2050, 2070 installation targets, there is so much more manufacturing that is required across different technologies. But it's only in solar and wind that we have enough plant capacity. So the green is the current manufacturing capacity. Blue is the planned manufacturing capacity, the announcement that various countries have made, the policies that various countries have made. But the gray bars in various technologies is the gap that exists right now. If we don't have enough manufacturing capacities, we'll not necessarily be able to deploy uh, the technologies at the same pace or the prices of some of these technologies will increase. And this is the theory of change that we are talking about that there's enough gap 
which can then turn into opportunities for countries like India if we necessarily have to manufacture. And similarly, I know, again, uh, Professor Reddy had mentioned, there are certain resource and technical constraints that can lead to concentrated supply chains. For instance, um, for the, this is from a G20 report that we had written. We are talking about seven key minerals, copper, cobalt, graphite, lithium, manganese, nickel, and rare earth. These are typically the minerals that are used for clean energy technologies. And you see this significant concentration of all of these minerals globally. 15 countries are home to this 55% of these identified critical minerals. In some places, the concentration is very high, in some places low. But you can just see the, the colored sections of all these pie charts. It shows that it's only a handful of places where some of these resources are. One is, of course, the resources. The second is, where are they mined? The mining is slightly different. So if Chile is, has the highest resources, reserves, the maximum production of lithium is happening in Australia. It is not happening in Chile. So even if you have the resources, it does not necessarily mean that you will be mining at the same levels as you have the resources because there are technical constraints, there are commercial constraints. You need to have an industry that can support some of these mining itself. So it does not necessarily mean that if you have the resources, you'll also lead, that will also lead to production. Now this particular chart uh, talks about the share of manufacturing capacities in various countries. Now you can see the blue bar which represents China and all of those. The significantly higher concentration in manufacturing that exists in the solar value chain, uh, solar modules, cell, wafer, polysilicon, in wind, gearbox, blade, generators, in batteries, different components like cathode, anode, electrolyzer. This is the concentration that is a potential problem because if countries globally have to rely on one or two markets or one or two geographical locations, then any challenge domestically in that particular country or any trade war can significantly impact the energy transition of a particular country or a region. And this is the same again with electrolyzer. We expect similar concentration. Again, the sector is being developed, but we expect similar concentration going forward. Now what is interesting is one is the manufacturing and many of the studies also point out that manufacturing yes exists in China but we also need to be mindful that the pace at which China is deploying many of these technologies is very in a different magnitude that India is. So they require more or any other countries so they, they require to set up more manufacturing facilities in their own country. However, we use the trade data for the last 10 years for some of these components as I said solar, wind and batteries. And we tried to analyze what is the trade concentration. And is, if you see on the top left is the solar module trade concentration. This means that there were approximately 71 countries in 2012 who were importing solar modules greater than USD $10 million. Now in 2021, this number has increased to 92 countries importing solar modules of $10 million. However, in 2012, there were 38 countries that had concentrated imports from a few countries. In 2021, this is 71 countries that have concentrated imports. So more so, countries are becoming vulnerable to supply chain disruptions, to trade um, dependency. So they don't have many more places. So more and more countries are then heading to the same set of countries for their imports. And same is the case for batteries. You see from 19 to 49, the concentration is increased. Wind, it is very high, but has also consistently remained high. This is a challenge that we are highlighting. If we uh, go one step further, what we realized was not even is the trade concentrated, it is more bad for countries that are on, that are lower middle income countries. So the countries on the bottom right you see are high income countries they are able to absorb some of these shocks and their vulnerability is less. So the developed world will, is better placed than the low income countries and the upper middle income countries in fighting for these vulnerabilities. They will continue to remain dependent on a handful of countries and these are the kind of challenges that we are highlighting and this is the reason why we need diversified supply chains where we want some of these materials to come from different countries. But of course, it will not be easy. Securing supply chains will have to go across from uh, backwards up to the value chain from minerals itself. So we cannot just say that we'll do one or two steps and the other steps which requires raw materials will still continue to come from the same set of countries. 
downstream which is the assembly is relatively less complex and easy to diversify however without the midstream which i had mentioned earlier like in batteries there are cathodes anodes electrolytes if countries don't focus on that that is not true diversification and increase in value add creation of more jobs economic growth can only happen if we focus on the midstream uh, process of some of these clean energy technology clean energy technologies we also see that many factors determine the competitiveness of midstream manufacturers one is of course the technical complexity and the rapid innovation many of these technologies are improving constantly uh, there's equipment and component availability the equipment to manufacture some of these facilities are again very difficult to procure it's not easy there are skills that are required because these these are new industrial processes chemical processes chemical industries huge cost of financing i mean in india the pli scheme if you would know for solar uh, for battery cell was of 50 gigawatt hour tata motors recently or tata group of tata companies recently is planning to now set up a battery manufacturing in uk of 40 gigawatt hour so the whole india we have one scheme and that is equivalent to more or less to one company's plan so if you have to set up such huge facilities going forward in the country there will be significant finance that will be required to set up some of these facilities and of course the final is a access to minerals and cheap energy because many of these processes are cheap energy uh, are energy intensive but the minerals remain concentrated i'll skip this but this particular slide again talks about the the gap that exists in the manufacturing capacities uh, globally so opportunities to increase domestic value add however still exist despite of all these challenges the benefits of job creation fulfillment of the linked sustainable development goals diversified supply chain strategic autonomy increase in overall investment in manufacturing increase export and reduce um, import dependence and there are different ways that we think that countries can indigenize one is if a country is already mineral rich they can start thinking of basic processing and then exporting that product if countries are large markets like india they can currently they are importing the final product so we import batteries we import solar modules we import evs but we can what we can do is we can first focus on assembling of some of these steps and then maybe go backward but there are countries again specifically say the the countries that are more advanced in technology japan us maybe some of the european countries they have high tech capabilities or focusing a lot on r and d they can go into component manufacturing and assembly to start with because that requires a lot of institutional um, experience and finance um india's projected solar and wind capacity now coming back to india uh, india is expected the the annual solar deployment for 2050 is around 35 to 40 gigawatt hour to meet our net zero targets this will be uh, we are expected to have around 280 250 to 300 gigawatts by 2030 and after that we'll continue to set up on similar lines same for energy storage potential um we already have 6.6% of the global cumulative solar pv installation we are the largest wind market the current manufacturing of solar module and cell stands at around 30 gigawatts and the uh, the wind turbine production is 10 giga or uh, 12 gigawatts now these numbers are good but not necessarily the best and we can potentially do much more this is the contribution of manufacturing to india's economy you can see that it is slightly reducing but at the same time the manufacturing value add is slightly increasing uh, so when india is working given that india's working age population will peak at by 2030 and india will have a young population with the median age of we around less than 29 years there is a huge potential for india to focus on manufacturing indigenize some parts of the value chain um these are some of the examples where india has already been successful in indigenizing um, or encouraging companies to set up facilities in india so this is tesla you know is now planning to set up a shop again apple has started assembling iphones and maybe even production chinese facility is planning to set up um, sorry this is a south global south example but first solar is now planning to invest couple of billions of dollars for a facility in chennai itself in the in the vicinity um despite all of this what we need to be mindful is that while there is a lot of potential we still have limited access to technology there's a high cost of capital if india has to set up manufacturing 
there are clean tech market uncertainties because we may focus on one particular technology like say for batteries we may focus on lfp battery but maybe or nmc battery in 2030 or 2040 there will be solid state batteries or sodium ion batteries then what do you do with some of those investments because there will be technology uncertainty so the investments have to be made in the manner or the policies have to be made in the manner that they are agile to changes in the technology itself and then there are possibilities of exclusion due to trade barriers i don't have that slide here but countries like um, us are now have policies like ira the inflation reduction act uh, europe is planning the critical minerals act and there are a couple of other countries who are also planning to close some of their borders to do as much as possible indigenization in their own country so given the potential trade barriers that may exist and countries different countries are uh, increasing their ambitions then how can india continue to de develop its own manufacturing facility that is a question that we need to answer then there is a need for specialized skills um, if you speak to some of these recent companies who are now setting up um, battery manufacturing they are really struggling to find people to make battery cells they are saying that even we don't we don't have people or we don't have companies from where we can poach people because that industry does not exist so and that's where the role of academic institutional industries and their co collaboration is very very important because if we have to now scale up manufacturing even if investments and everything can come who are the people who will work on those some of these facilities because some of these are um, very technologically complex and the last one is global overcapacity and competitiveness concern very important because of as i said in in the us itself in europe and many other countries now want to manufacture locally we may potentially have more capacities manufacturing capacities than we may require now given this how can indian manufacturers remain competitive as i said there are this just one example of one company setting up 40 gigawatt hour cell battery cell manufacturing outside india there are many examples but if india is setting up like 5 gigawatt hour 6 gigawatt hour 2 gigawatt hour how will you be able to compete in the global um, market um, with such over capacity and large economies of scale so these are some of the questions of course that we need to answer we are working with multiple ministries and internally there are many projects through which we aim to answer some of these questions and maybe few months down the line we'll have more concrete recommendations uh, but these are food for thought for you as as we go back in the q and a session and happy to discuss more thank you was a brilliant exposition giving us a clear view of the problems that we face both in production and in the competition and perhaps we might even be unable to meet the targets that we have set for ourselves if we are not very careful but it also gives us some indication about the path that we should take in the future right both in production of the background technologies and also in ensuring as the previous uh, speaker mentioned about uh, as uh, the iit speaker mentioned about recycling i think he looked at the recycling part of it very closely and i think that is a very important part okay now there are uh, questions on this from the audience Sridharan. Uh, to Professor Reddy, uh, you talked about retrofitting uh, existing coal-fired power stations with uh, renewable energy, uh, you know, uh, options. Uh, I was, I'm curious to know, how, can you just explain briefly about that? And the other one, the next question to you also, is on biomass. Uh, see, Chennai City generates about 3,000 metric tons of biomass every day. Uh, how do we, you know, do you collaborate with GCC, Chennai Corporation, or any other corporation to convert it into usable energy? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. As you know that 59% uh, of Indian power sector is uh, based on coal power plants coal-based uh, fossil fuel power plants. Uh, the major problem is we import coal from Indonesia, Australia, and South Africa. 
there's a way which is uh, I generally uh, in my class I tell we have abundant coal uh, in India but our coal is a, a low grade coal which is 40% ash and uh, foreign coals have a 12% ash but uh, energy point of view foreign coals are better but uh, environment point of view foreign coals are not good because uh, they contain 2% sulfur. The sulfur is a major uh, problem to the environment, whereas Indian coals contain 0.5% sulfur. So uh, now the problem here is uh, now we want to go for net zero scenario. In such case, uh, most of these coal power plants have to be retrofitted or repowered by other options. Uh, the other options could be mainly solar thermal. And uh, another important uh, thing now here is uh, the load, uh, load uh, dispatch uh, is a major challenge because uh, uh, coal-based power plants have two major components. One is uh, the boiler, the other side is the power uh, block, like turbine. So turbine uh, uh, can be operated part load condition. If the load goes down, uh, you can operate it 40-30%. Uh, but whereas the boiler, you cannot operate it. So the boiler uh, has to be because uh, we have to, otherwise we have to dissipate the energy into the atmosphere. Instead of doing that, why, why don't we replace the uh, coal boiler by a solar boiler? So solar uh, boiler, and in fact, we are working with uh, some small scale power plants, and we have given a total uh, entire end country, even uh, North Chennai coal-based power plants. How do we, because ash uh, pit area is much larger, which we can use it for solar uh, thermal power generation, uh, mainly solar concentrating collectors. So that is a way we can uh, completely replace it or we can partially replace it because uh, uh, some part from so coal, uh, the rest comes from the solar. It is called hybridization, hybridizing both solar and coal. That is uh, one. And uh, there is uh, several injections uh, where we inject this solar steam into the boiler. How do we take it and what ratio we have to operate? Because during daytime you operate with the sun and uh, we are now also working on steam storages and so that we can operate uh, off sunshine hours, like uh, after evenings. So there are uh, various options, including energy storage, thermal batteries and so on. That is one part. The other side, biomass, you mentioned biomass. And uh, biomass uh, now is a major challenge uh, and several tons of uh, bio, uh, waste, solid waste is disposed into the uh, atmosphere or uh, generated. Uh, the, there are various technology we are working on incineration is one part like uh, uh, RDF refuse derived fuels is one part and another one is um, uh, producing gas out of that that is uh, methanation biomethanation produce uh, methane out of this that is uh, essentially uh, anaerobic digestion it's anaerobic digestion route. Another route could be gasification. Thermal gasification is another part. We, this gas can be bottled and uh, supplied locally. So uh, uh, these Bangalore based companies, they are uh, in touch with us. How do we do it locally? Like, like a, a, a small community, community level um, biogas generation or uh, um, the uh, thermal gas generation and mainly using for water production. Uh, the Vadodara, there's one company in Vadodara is also working on uh, producing community like apartment. Waste is recycled there itself and used for partially uh, uh, converting into gas and supplying as a cooking gas or bottling it and uh, uh, of course there's a different business model for that. Apart from that, uh, produce water. Water is also a major problem now. Uh, how to pr convert the waste water into uh, uh, potable water and uh, for that, uh, you can use this uh, biogas or uh, biomass generated energy to that. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Yeah, this is a question for uh, Mr. Rishabh Jain. Okay. Um, uh, we have not seen rooftop solar take off in a big way where uh, that could be a good distributed source of uh, electricity for uh, homes uh, primarily, especially in the rural areas. What is limiting it? Is it technology? Is it uh, the economics? Or is it some regulatory issues like the net metering not being very uh, uh, 
very much allowed by the uh, electricity distribution companies. Okay. So, sure. So, I would say it's a mix of everything, uh, given that a lot of these uh, rooftop projects are state-specific subjects. So, the reasons vary from state to state. In many cases, you'll in there are examples where you're not or customers have been waiting for six months, eight months for the regulatory clearance for net meters itself. Some places the net meters are not available. Um, in some places the costs are so high because of many other factors that you don't necessarily, it does not make economic sense or the prices are too low generally for residential consumers that it does not make sense. Um, so it's, it's a mix of, I would say, different things. There are some recent examples specifically from Maharashtra um, a lot of recent um, changes in their regulations where I think it was still 5 megawatts now group on net metering is being allowed in just a couple of days before. Um, but I think the broader challenge is that the communication both with the discoms and sometimes also the awareness for the users, we have not been able to solve for those. So discoms still think that when rooftops may be installed, it will cut into their loss or increase their losses because one, you will now be giving them, or you people will not be paying electricity, or maybe the 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 specifically the industries will go away who are paying high high tariffs. And on the other hand, consumers always think that they many people still don't know that some of these systems will last for 25 years, or they are not necessarily aware. And in many cases, they don't even own the rooftop when they are moving from one place to another. And then there are aesthetics and other issues. So there are of course good examples. But to scale it up, I think we need, as you said, all the three things, we need to solve for many of those. And maybe what we need is very specific intervention. So if you think that maybe one kind of intervention will work for the whole country or even for the whole state, that won't work. Um, but I agree, we had plans to set up 40 gigawatts of rooftop by 2022 under the current mission, which we have we are way short of that target. And the focus is again back on utility. But if we are able to build our focus back on rooftop, we'll be able to solve many infrastructure upgrade costs, um, the, the quality of electricity can improve, the accessibility, et cetera. All of those can. Do you want to add? Yeah. So uh, the another uh, couple of issues with the uh, rooftop, of course, it has to come. Uh, mainly grid injection is a major challenge because uh, stability of grid is a major uh, challenge. And uh, maintenance is another uh, important aspect because now you know that India is a uh, dusty uh, condition and the performance drops substantially with the uh, dust. And in fact, we characterize the dust across the world uh, as uh, about 12 locations because our dust characteristics are completely different. And uh, because the erosion and now we are talking about um, cleaning of like uh, robo cleaning and all those are coming up. But uh, the major problem is the maintenance, grid injection, uh, grid stability and of course, uh, uh, the scale of operation, also another problem. These are the three. Just a corollary question. Now, uh, we know that many uh, states now are saying that they're going to offer uh, electricity free up to a certain point to a lot of uh, consumers. So maybe from a you know a government standpoint, would it make sense to mandate that people should have rooftop solar if they want electricity free or something like that, link it to that so that you are you know, also cutting down on the government's uh, subsidy expenditure while at the same time encouraging rooftop, that is one. The second thing is also that, you know, from a resilience point of view, if you have uh, everything fed from the grid and, you know, if the grid goes down for whatever reason, right, it's critical infrastructure, then everybody is going to be without power. So rooftop would also help alleviate that issue. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you, but I think um, another important aspect is the storage. So if uh, storage pitches in, uh, I think it will become more attractive. I'll just add, uh, typically rooftops are connected to the main grid itself. So even if the grid goes down, the rooftop will not work. Because you have to island your system from the consumer's house. So even if the grid goes down, it does not. Of course, it improves the quality of some of these systems. On mandating, I think it can be, it's a difficult proposition because people of course keep changing their locations. What the government, I mean, there are different um, initiatives like virtual net metering and things like these where you have a project and then maybe you get some units or maybe a part of that project. There are some success that we've made. 
even at CAW, there's a different team that works on it. We have been also trying to advocate for this by working in Temenari. But yeah, it's, it's multiple challenges, I would say, from on the ground to, of course, from the policy. But um, yeah, it's an important aspect. Uh, just one bit, what happens also is when we see many of these tenders for solo modules, large projects, you'll see tenders, tariffs like 2 rupees, 2.5 rupees, 3 rupees, etc. But when someone comes to rooftop and you would see uh, all of that in news as a consumer, you'll say that maybe I should also get in 3 rupees, which, uh, which does not typically happen. For a consumer, it comes to 4, 4.5 and maybe even industry 6 rupees because the scale is so small and the fixed cost is very high, equally high. The number of people that are involved in rooftop are way more than the utility scale and the costs are high. And then people have a certain different perception that I'll get at three rupees or industries will think I get at three, four rupees, but finally it is at five, six rupees. So maybe that, I think, again, that is awareness point, but it is also a perception that is also sometimes holding back people. Thank you. Any other question? I think there is a question there. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Lakshmi Priya is online. This question is for her. If she's not there, one of you can answer. You know, uh, sometime months ago or weeks ago, I don't remember now, there was this uh, news that uh, VOC Chidambaram port received the first ammonia uh, transported uh, vessel. And uh, essentially, I want to know what exactly is the challenge in terms of, uh, you know, having a hydrogen-based uh, energy product and ammonia-based ammonia project. What are the transportation challenges which are there, storing issues which are there, which is easier and what is the cost per uh, unit production uh, in terms of this. And what are we good at in India? Uh, yeah. Can I take the question? Yeah, okay. Are you available? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am. So the first part of it, like the challenges for... Tr Sorry? I I'm audible? We can't see you, but we are, you are audible. Okay. Okay. So, uh, might be some network issues, but so the problem about transportation of ammonia. So, there is an issue in case uh, ammonia is being transported through sea routes, like if we are talking about export of green hydrogen or uh, trade in green hydrogen uh, with Gulf countries, for say. So, what happens is ammonia is very, uh, it's not, uh, there is chances for its leakage. And it is it can be a pollutant for the marine life. So problem one problem is in transporting through sea vessels. So in case there is a leak, it is uh, dangerous for the marine life. That is one. The second challenge that uh, can be about is its state. It is uh, transported in liquid uh, state. So that is uh, another issue. The second part of the question I could not hear. So maybe uh, if I can it again or somebody else can handle yeah the what second was the part second? of the question was what are we good at in india in terms of transportation in terms of saving our in you know installation costs uh, etc and which is more economical for us and what are the long-term plans for utilizing either ammonia or hydrogen or both okay so uh, so we are looking at uh, like in india we have various projects going on to uh, how to store ammonia in uh, through what cryogenic processes by bringing it to a stage where it can be stored but uh, i think it will take time and uh, green hydrogen has definitely uh, in enhanced our interest in uh, ammonia storage and facilities but uh, one more uh, uh, it's not a question but just a point to be raised as we were discussing about the solar grids so I wanted to know if uh, International Solar Alliance, India is going to be connected with the grid with these countries outside. So how are we looking at that? I mean, it is, is it possible for us to export renewable energy or trade in renewable energy of any sort? So how is that grid functioning? I mean, that is just one point that I wanted to raise. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I can. See, now, as you know that uh, the major uh, problem with hydrogen is hydrogen generation, storage, transportation, and utilization. These are the four aspects. And uh, yeah. generation, uh, if you do it through green route, it's OK. But otherwise, other routes uh, are uh, different. But storage, see, storage can be in three forms or four forms. 
either you can store as in the form of gas as it is or it can be in, in the metal hydrate route or this uh, nit uh, ammonia route or fourth one is the cryogenic route. You can like what we do it uh, for uh, space applications like ISRO and all this where uh, I think I have seen this uh, uh, Andhra sugars they produce hydrogen and transport through cryogenic route. So cryogenic route is more expensive uh, process. Uh, but I think the easiest uh, process is uh, uh, my maybe Indian condition is the uh, metal hydrate route is one option. And uh, if you go through ammonia route, uh, the another uh, final uh, uh, thing is the final means uh, like how do we utilize that? <coughs> Suppose if you utilize uh, maybe in a combustion, in fact uh, Japan, uh, some companies they tried uh, combustion. Again, it produces NOx and other uh, problems. So I feel uh, the better option could be either direct compressed form or the metal hydrate route. These two can be attractive option as far as the India is concerned. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is a follow-up question. Yeah. My name is Krishna Kumar. This is a continuation of the maritime, uh, you know, sector. Uh, so the IMO, as uh, you know, earlier this year accelerated the decarbonization of the marine sector by 50 years. It's going to put a huge pressure on the maritime value chain to produce uh, you know, the various types of fuels they are talking about. So my question is more to Mr. Jain. From the supply chain readiness, uh, I didn't see a particular mention of the maritime sector. From the supply chain readiness, right from the availability of fuel to the port sector, to the ships, to the, to the ICE engines just being replaced, it looks so huge. Uh, what is your views on this, and where do you think uh, we are heading? Or is there a big opportunity for India, or what do you? What are your reflections? You seem to have done a thorough study, but the maritime sector seems to be a hard to abate sector, and maybe your, your comments and views. I think in terms of decarbonization of maritime, um, maybe Lakshmi Priya is better placed to answer because of the use of. Um, uh, hydrogen in some of these and also the transportation but maybe what I'll I can comment is the role of maritime and ports in the supply chain development um, and more than answers I'll maybe share some more questions so that I mean many of these we need to figure out together there's no right answer right now but there are examples of countries globally many in Africa that want to indigenize clean energy value chains for example, DRC now wants to make batteries in their own country. Seems impossible and a far-fetched thought, but that seems like a political ambition that we want to, we have cobalt, we'll do the next three steps and maybe potentially um, export. And there are other examples including from landlocked countries when they want to do all of this. Historically, many of these countries don't necessarily have the infrastructure. In many of these places where maybe they are uh, closer to the oceans, they don't even have the ports not the roads, not the rail network, even if you have the resources. So I would say it's a broader logistical problem that is often being not being discussed, as you rightly said. And we are typically focusing only on the industry, and the industry will not fall out and cannot be set up in a desert. It needs all the ecosystem, the right set of people, everything. And this is something that we would want to build our understanding on, but it's an important aspect, and all I can say right now is some countries are thinking about it because if they want to be part of the global value chains, they not only have to be recipient for some of these large cargo vessels, but also will have to offload continuously and should have that capability itself. And like setting up any mine, setting up a big port also takes maybe a decade, the large port itself. So has to be started to be thought through, but not much, I would say, thought has gone in it right now. But Lakshmi Priya, she wants to talk about decarbonization of the... Maritime. Priya, are you there? Are you listening? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there are two points about uh, decarbonization of marine and through hydrogen. So one is hydrogen-based fuels can be used to provide power to large ships, and uh, it would reduce the uh, emissions of air pollutants to a considerable extent. And the second is uh, hydrogen is also being planned to use to decarbonize the port terminals. And also it's going to be helpful in automation of the shipping vessels that we have been talking about for long. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, uh, let me please. Uh, okay, no, we are talking one, about. One, one. We are answering. Yeah, please. Uh, actually, another uh, aspect could be a nuclear uh, route, decarbonizing the maritime. So, micro nano uh, reactors for uh, ships. I just want to ask a question: whether the report, which said that 44 airports under the Airport Authority of India have been completely become energy self-sufficient by using solar power. And Cochin Airport, which I helped a lot in designing and completion, has been, was the first airport in the world to have become 100% solar. Are they correct? You want me to answer? Yeah, I think it is a 20, uh, uh, five, 5 to 20 megawatt installation there in uh, Kochi Airport. So 100% uh, means on a, on a net, me uh, net metering mode, it is 100%, but actually it's not the real-time 100%. So, and uh, we discussed also net metering. Generally, I have experience with the UK uh, net metering uh, scenario. There, actually, it's 25% uh, uh, to 1 is to 4. Suppose uh, if you uh, consume energy at peak load, you have to pay four times higher when you supply to the uh, to the grid so that is uh, that ratio is also an important aspect there's another reason why these uh, rooftop uh, panels are not becoming popular and 100% uh, means it's a overall an energy point of view it's 100% that's fine mm -hmm. but what about the other 44 airports under the airport authority of india they also claim that 100% they are now self sufficient as far as energy is concerned including Delhi, Bombay and all, uh, yeah, where yeah. large solar panels have come up. You can see them in the airports. Yeah. So what you say, is it possible or not possible? No, is it correct? Their but claims. Yes or no. It's a <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just say there are different ways of looking at it. If we define how we define uh, what is a carbon neutral or net zero airport. So if you say that you give in 100%, 100 units of clean and maybe take 100% back from the grid, it's clean, then it's clean. But if you say that, are you self-sufficient? Potentially, no. No, that's right, because require more power than what that is available there. So that's fine. No, as far as it's I'm not emergency. So what, what I meant was that in many of these evening shifts, mm -hmm. when you don't necessarily have solar, Correct. you don't, you're not storing it in batteries. That's right. So then you have to always, not even in emergency, right. in regular case yeah, also, right. you have to rely yeah. on no, the no, grid. No, I appreciate that. But so long as it is over the year, so long as it is 100% net zero, then it is fine. Now, see, similarly, we were talking about the rooftop uh, solar panels. I'm going to work on one for my apartment, which has got about uh, 10 apartments. We found, I mean, we have an engineer here who is producing air conditioners and uh, refrigerators based on solar power as well as integrated normal power. So he has assured us that he'll put a solar panel on our building which will become, I mean, as far as we are concerned, again, well, over the year, it is zero. But the problem, as was mentioned uh, by him, is how do you tackle the state electricity discounts? To get permission from them is a Herculean task, apart from the money that you ought to pay. So as a senior civil servant, I'm telling you this. Correct. And because some of my uh, relations and others, they put up the solar uh, panels on their houses, but to get a meter from them, to get them connected to the grid, was an impossible task that they said, what, why, why did I spend three to four lakhs on my solar panel? So what you people who are sitting there were advising the government of India, I'm not there anymore. So it is something which the government of India has to seriously think of, particularly when large apartment blocks are coming up, where you can easily go for net zero energy consumption on the grid, it should be made part of the building approval plan. I know in Tamil Nadu we have to pay for that also. But nevertheless, this can be made a condition of the building of large complexes, building complex, including, for example, example, complexes which are coming up for industries. They can become self-sufficient. So that way, you see, you cannot say that everywhere, you know, this is difficult, that is difficult, this is difficult, etc. Somewhere we have to break the ice. For example, let me, I mean, I hope uh, I'm not exceeding the time. Let me tell you, I started uh, my career in 1962. 1962-63, there were a large number of agricultural plants. There was field bunding, contour survey, contour bunding, barrages, 
uh, or every stream that was available in the district should be bundled so the water is available. Now that was in the first five-year plan, second five-year plan. Then when we came down to the green revolution during the 80s and 70s, all of them had disappeared. There were no field bund, there were no uh, uh, this, uh, barrier, uh, this barrages, everything had disappeared because nobody maintained them. Nevertheless, the green revolution came in because technology, seed, etc., they came in. Now I'm again in the field. I was a collector in 1966, district magistrate and collector in 1966. Today I am working again as a collector when I go to the fields. But the way in which it is administered has become different. Now all these projects after completion are handed over back to the village community. And somebody is looking at them. Are you maintaining it? They are collecting funds. We are imposing on them condition that you collect funds, maintain them. That way, in the recent survey that I have undertaken personally, people have become very wealthy. Some of the villagers have become very wealthy. And all the statistics which you have thrown up by the National Sample Survey Organization, I don't trust them. Because very recently I conducted a survey in a group of villages where I had 75 people, seven people from each village, half of them women, half of them men. I asked them, what is your level of your prosperity today? Each one of those women stated, we don't depend upon our husbands. Our average income is 1,000 rupees a day. 1,000 rupees a day from where? By having milk cattle. The milk is being sold to private enterprise or to the government uh, milk. 1,000 rupees a day means how much? 30,000 rupees a month they are earning. What does the NSSO survey show? Just now the survey has come. 2,000 rupees a month. So we have this, these surveys with the government are also misleading. So many of the things we are depending upon, the lower level of bureaucracy, of which I also depended for a long time. I spent 37 years in government. So the question is, we have to make a breakthrough. And your organizations, organizations like yours, that is the only way to break through to cut off all the lower level of bureaucracy and make decision making at the higher level. Then only things can move in this country, otherwise it will just not move. I spent uh, 37 years in government, so many years in the NGO, chairman of a national agro foundation set up by the former agriculture minister, Mr. Subramaniam. I worked very closely with Abdul Kalam also. So today, what we are seeing in this India, where we, all these technologies are coming in, the bureaucracy has remained the same. Unless you destroy it with a hydrogen bomb, this country will not move forward. Thank you, sir, for Thank that you. comment. I think that is beyond the scope of this particular panel's uh, yeah. target. OK, I think people are hungry now. So let us simply thank the speakers. Thank you, Padmi Lakshmi Priya. Thank you, Rishabh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Shina Reddy. Let's adjourn for lunch. So yeah, just before that, if I could request uh, the chair, L.V. Krishnan, sir, to felicitate the speakers. Thank you, Lakshmi Priya Ma'am, for joining us online. It was very valuable to have you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Srinivas Reddy, sir. <laughs> Mr. Rishabh Jain. Before we go for lunch, if we could just request all the speakers and the moderators to join us for a group photo before everyone has to leave. Thank you.
is that India is one of the foremost countries in the use of digital technology in the area of finance, particularly in regard to the payments that are taking place here. Most of us are using digital payment technology. And I'm sure that you'll hear a lot from Mr. Akash on this. As far as the application of AI in FinTech is concerned, it's, I think, not very old, but it has been happening for quite some time. And uh, the department in which I was uh, the secretary, they have started using it very extensively now. Because that's why sometimes you will get a suddenly a notice that you purchased a car for such and such an amount, but you have not shown the amount correctly. Because every transaction that is above a particular limit is about one lakh of rupees, if I remember right. Above a lakh of rupees is reported. So it goes and you have to show your PAN card also. Automatically it goes. In fact, PAN card was introduced by me. I am guilty of introducing the PAN card, which is now universal, which is also available for all the people in the GST. They are also using PAN. So you can say PAN card was the first beginning of the use of technology in the <coughs> finance ministry. Because with PAN card, you can trace anyone. In fact, I had suggested to the government at that time, you don't have to have the Aadhaar. PAN card itself will be sufficient. But then there was some objection relating to the PAN card having an address, but that could have been easily gotten over. But uh, some other, we, they didn't agree, so PAN card is PAN card. Now, as far as the use of AI is concerned, AI is being extensively used in financial modeling, etc. as far as the stock exchanges are concerned. Take, for example, the share of Tata's. Tata's came into existence more than 100 years ago. How has this share progressed? And how was the various vicissitudes in the economy has affected the share of the Tata's? Now, use of AI will be able to give you a prediction as to what is going to be the share value of the Tata's five years hence, taking into account if there are going to be some more investments, capital investments that are going to take place, or whether there is going to be any technological input into there. Take, for example, just now in the morning we heard about use of hydrogen. Now, Tata's are planning to use hydrogen in their furnaces in, the, in their steel plants because this is already coming into four. Instead of using coal and other things, they'll be using hydrogen. So, fintech as such is going to be very extensive in the sense if you are to estimate the value of your share or if you are to look at your income source, many other inputs will have to come in. So, artificial intelligence will also be getting to be used in this particular area. I don't want to stray into other areas, which I leave it to young Abhilesh. He's a very brilliant person. I know his father very well since 30 years, and his father is also a very renowned chartered accountant. And one of the very interesting thing about their association is they share their knowledge with everyone, unhesitantly. So if you want to know about income tax, they have produced a small ready reckoner for income tax. For, a every, for every day used by everyone. Similarly, they are produced from GST. They are extended. Mr. Abhilesh, you see, he is also a PhD. He has been lecturing everywhere. He is very brilliant. And I hope he will give you a lot of information on the use of fintech in the area of finance. Mr. Abhilesh. Uh, very, very warm good afternoon to one and all present here the chair of the session, uh, Mr. Sivaraman, sir, whose uh, inspiration for me, I've seen him since I was a student. Every budget that is presented by the finance minister is a big uh, deal for chartered accountants. So we all look for it very an with great anticipation. And you know he's always the first speaker that we call for to give his insights with his experience. So it's a pleasure to share the panel with you, sir. Uh, Akash, my other co-panelists, and all the erudite listeners who are here today. It's a privilege for me to be addressing on this platform on a topic which I think is extremely important to each and every one of us. If you think about technology, it has been growing in leaps and bounds. We heard this phrase very casually thrown about, leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. But how much is this leaps and bounds? You think about the phone in the 1960s. You know, Alexander Graham Bell invented it and after that people were using it, the traditional phone with a wire which is there and people dial the numbers, etc. That was a common phone that people were used to almost till the 90s. In the late 80s and early 90s, cordless phones came in 
and then suddenly towards the end of the 90s you started mm. seeing the first advent of the mobile phones which was coming in and in 2007 the first iphone was launched after that the pace of development has been so fast you couldn't even imagine listening to music on your phone in 2007 today we are completing bank transactions on a phone essentially it has replaced a computer you have a computer in the palm of your hand and all of this has happened in a span of 10 years between 2007 to 2017 it has been a hugely fast development a phone which didn't evolve between the 1950s to the 1990s and 40 years you've seen in the next 20 years how far it has grown the key driver is obviously the technological components and in my firm belief another major driver that is coming is artificial intelligence today if you look at chat gpt i am sure everyone has been reading about it some of you may have even tried it it's absolutely transformative you know i decided when chat gpt launched i wanted to check it out uh, i usually contribute articles to various newspapers and magazines etc and you know they'll tell me you know abhishek i want you to write about what are the important why, why you should file an income tax return so i'll take two days i'll do my research then i'll draft the article redraft it check it etc file it, you know do it so as soon as chat gpt came i decided you know let me try and i wrote to chat gpt you know why should i file an income tax return draft me an article within a matter of 3 seconds it's got a nice 600 page article some points that even i would have missed frankly and i thought when a moment i looked at it i was like that's it i have lost one where one revenue article is gone <laughs> so that's how informative and transformative you know artificial intelligence is going to be and uh, you know as a chartered accountant naturally you know tax is my area sir also touched upon technology and tax i'll tell you something which is very very interesting my personal experience you know even i experience this <clears throat> i have one assessi he is a pensioner he used to work in a public sector bank and uh, he files his return with us he has been filing for you know 30 40 years with my parents and all that but the thing that always bothered me he pays the same fee that he was paying in 1990s so i said you know what i want to increase his fee not because you know i am going to earn money out of him but as a matter of principle i want to increase the fees so i told him sir i am increasing the fees by 100 rupees just 100 rupees i said i want to increase by 100 rupees abhishek abhishek how you can increase by 100 rupees it's so much money i said sir parking itself if you park here in this building it will cost 100 rupees sir how no 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 abhishek it's too much i am pensioner i don't have any money i have come to your house your grandmother has given me food and all i said sir that and all not related to this why you are telling no 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 so finally after almost one and a half hours he went back with the same fees only i didn't increase that 100 also i was like the time i spent itself would have been more valuable than this but okay is chord though that sort of you know attitude next year the year after this incident happened the government had introduced something called the ais and tis annual information statement and a tax information summary it's a new development many of you may not yet be familiar with it you may know 26 as but you have not heard of this ais tis because it's only come in the last 2 years this ais tis it consolidates revenue all the sources of your income from different different sources because the income tax was built on a logic you have to be honest i have to file my income tax return i have to tell you sir i got salary sir i sold this building sir i am getting interest from my bank deposits if you don't tell maybe in some cases on a search etc they can find it but where they are going to search a person who is getting salary what else will they do they'll get information from different sources while they go and search about get sources about a person who's earning salary will they get it from millions and billions of people it was not practical so because of this significant revenue leakage so this same assessi who fought over that 100 rupees to me saying i don't have money i don't have money next year he has come for the filing aastis is that this aastis is telling me sale of shares by the assessi 65 lakh rupees 65 lakhs he has sold shares till now he has never told he has a demat account also to us 30 years he has been filing not even aware about demat account so i asked him i said sir uh, have you sold any shares during the year his answer was not yes or no 
His answer is, how do you know? <laughs> that is the level of Harish Chandra's we have. You know, someone who is a close confidant, 30 years and all we are saying. He also is not disclosing. I said, sir, it does not matter how I know and all. Whether you have or not, you tell. Yes, I have sold, but I, I have never shown how did it uh, come up all that is. <laughs> so basically, so many people are there in the country where they don't offer their incomes in the hope that people will not find out. So where does the government go? At this point, this AI has stepped in. The AIS and TIS is a byproduct of this AI. Where you're consolidating the sources from different, different places and you're putting it into perspective. I'll tell you another case of the search which we handled. This Assisi, he's a laborer, he's an agriculturist and all, and you know, uh, the case is going up. The additions are also like, they're saying, why, you know, you're saying he's an agriculturist, why is there, uh, you know, search and all conducted on him, it does not make any sense. And we're discussing, discussing, and then we're asking questions, what he has, what income, whether he has anything, nothing is coming up. So what, he's just a farmer, sir, nothing, sir, I don't do anything, sir. Finally, we're like, okay, okay, fine, and then we're preparing the balance sheet for him. And so we asked what and all cars he has. He has two Mercedes Benz, one Jaguar and one Audi. <laughs> so I said, okay, now I understand why the search happened. You know? <laughs> so there's always some reason what is happening. So earlier, once again, it'd be impossible. You buy a car, nowhere. Sub-register reporting something that's the state government authority, central government doing income tax, that's another authority. Where's the information going? Where's the correlation? Who's going to sit and correlate it? Are they going to sit for each assessing and do matching? It's not practically possible. AI has completely changed the game. Let me step out of my small world of tax. You know, this is a very small world. Let us step into the larger world of finance. Don't know if you remember this uh, very famous phrase. Uh, I was sitting on a back of a tiger, scared when I will fall and, and it's going to eat me. Does anybody know who said this quote? This quote was very famously told by Mr. Ramalinga Raju, who perpetrated one of India's biggest corporate scandals, which was the Satyam scam, which broke out, I think, in 2009. And it completely rocked the country, completely rocked. Because Satyam was, at the time, it was a crown jewel. You know, it was considered, oh, Satyam means it's a matter of pride for India. Oh, they're, they're, they're listed in the US, you know, such a big company, blah, blah, blah. And here we had this person, you know, see, comes out with a statement suddenly in the public. You know, I was sitting with uh, one of the persons who did the audit of Satyam at the time. She was part of the team. And we've got the news, we're sitting together, we're doing some other audit. And then she says, oh my God. I said, what happened? She said, this person has released a public statement saying that, you know, I'm sitting on a tiger, I didn't know when I'll fall off and when it'll eat me. And like, what does that mean? He said, he just announced that there's a 12,000 crore scam. 12,000 crore scam. And where they've falsified the bank balances, you can see there's a, you know, what has been reported is what is there in the yellow. And that tiny speck of red that you're seeing, that is the actual balance. That is the level of difference which is there. A scam, which frankly, you know, being a child accountant, ideally a CA should have, you know, identified it. They should have flagged it off. And you all know what happened. He was arrested. The top management were arrested. The CAs were arrested. They were in prison for many years. And a huge ramification in the country. Share markets fell. A new company's law was essentially formulated because of this. If you read the Companies Act 2013, it was essentially formed, so many things came because of the Satyam scam. So this is the impact the scam had. Why am I talking about this scam in AI talk? Because this scam, frankly, if there was AI, could have been prevented so much earlier. AI would have played a key role in telling whether really the funds are there or not. They found that he falsified invoices, created artificial invoices, and inflated the sales. Sir, if I have artificial invoices, then I should get actual money, no? If I make the sales. But who will check it? The confidence that if I do it in smaller transactions, the auditor will not have time to verify. They'll focus on the larger ones. They'll not focus on the smaller ones. Carefully covered up scams are literally, however talented you are as a chartered accountant, as an investigator, may be impossible to unearth unless some circumstance or by chance something comes up. In his case, he only came out with it. Nobody else found out. And that was a big scam in here. When this gentleman, the famous rogue trader of India, Ketan Parekh, his uh, scam was what we call the pump and dump scam. What he used to do is he used to purchase 
these small companies which are listed on the stock exchange used to purchase an unknown company nothing they'll have if essentially it will be a shell company no assets no income he'll buy the company he'll trade it circularly he'll have some artificial people or he'll have some close associates i will sell it to you for 100 you will sell it to me for 1000 i will sell it to you for 10000 you will sell it to me for 1 lakh i will sell it back to you for 10 lakhs so if you see the share in the share market it will be 10 lakh rupees price why people are transacting sir volume is there people are ready to buy at this price so 10 lakh rupees and then it will come in the news the share price has gone up 500% in less than 6 weeks and there will be some gullible investor who oh, must be a great company newspaper and all reporting you'll not believe you know there is a column in uh, or if you read uh, economic times every monday there's a magazine supplement called wealth et wealth that comes out it comes up with all your suggestions for finance etc this et wealth has one small column called penny stocks list of penny stocks and it will give a long list what is the growth etc but there will be one small line below we are not watching for these penny stocks we don't know anything about it it may be a fraudulent company blah blah blah, blah. nobody reads that one line but the moment they say oh it's gone up 500% 600% no so attractive it must be a good share people buy it the moment they buy it mr parek and his fictitious associates used to unload the share they purchased it at a low price now the price is at 10 lakhs they'll sell it they'll walk away with the 10 lakhs whereas the person who purchased it at 10 lakhs is left with the bottle in the hand wondering what will happen with the crash it will it will just crash because nothing is there there is no actual assets there is no actual business in the entity it's a fraudulently circulated transfer and this came out only in 2001 it was found out that he was doing it for almost 4 to 5 years mr parak was doing this for 4 to 5 years and god knows how much money he made out of it but what i do know is crores of people lost crores of money in the process again something very simple that ai could have done which is a big talk in fact today is the role of kyc in finance fictitious entities fictitious you know sir brought the pan card he'll, he'll be well aware of this getting a pan card was very simple actually at the time you just put a form and you file it you can get a pan card it was very difficult to verify if that person already has a pan card there have been n number of cases in the income tax where one assess has had 12 pan cards and he'll be filing 12 returns for himself taking 2 lakh 50 2 lakh 50 2 lakh 50 up to the basic exemption and he'll be earning almost 25 30 lakhs as income it was such a hard challenge for the government to actually track this down to stop it etc and it had to be done on almost an individual basis ai would have completely stalled the game today ai you are going to see in a matter of few years where kyc is going to be linked to the government database and whenever you do any transaction if there's any kyc requirements you can already see it there's a government uh, what do you say what do they call government locker i think it's called where you can your data is like pan card aadhar etc are stored and the moment you press okay you can just verify it in a matter of seconds you do a otp and you can verify and check the genuinity of it if you go for example grow and zero da etc these are the talked about brokers in the country today if you want to register with them you can do it online if you have to go and register to a broker who is next to your street he'll say sir bring this document bring that document sign and give this attest and give these online people don't need it because they are linked to the government repositories so kyc would have completely eliminated what this gentleman had done this scam then uh, you know our very famous i think he's not uh, moving if you can just check this out then our very very uh, next famous person is uh, the king of good times mr uh, vijay malaya so yeah this is this is right thank you so unfortunately i spoiled the suspense i was going to ask you does anybody know what this is and uh, this is basically the list of defaults that uh, king fisher owes these are the crores of money that they owned to various banks the king of good times who created a lot of bad times for us so <laughs> mr vijay malaya <coughs> perpetrated uh, a very very simple bank fraud which is take loans divert the money for your personal use or for uh, other uses other than what the bank was meant for and uh, frankly the banks could have very very easily caught it you know auditors could have reported it bank verification could have sorted it out but where you know any human intervention comes in there is always a risk of either deliberate fraud or sometimes negligence or sometimes just sheer luck and chance whereas when ai comes in 
none of these components even feature in. There is not even an iota of a percentage where a chance of error, tiredness, sleep, mechanical failure, none of this can arise. So these are all practical challenges that, you know, AI can resolve that other people cannot. Bernie Madoff is another one. You know, these are the various celebrities. You know, it's not something restricted to India. So that brings me to my very, very critical point, which is paper tigers. The human effort involved today is what I call a paper tiger. You know, this is the Center for China Studies, you know. So this is irrelevant because this term originated in China. It's believed that Mao, who was the uh, supreme leader of China at the time, he used to designate certain people as paper tigers. People who simply will shout blah, 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 but they won't do anything. So they call them paper tigers. So, you know, he had specifically for himself, US was designated as a paper tiger. And he used to make a paper tiger. Because in the paper, they used to make a tiger and keep it on the countries in their map, which they call paper tigers. And US was very famously that. This paper tigers today is the current checking methodology. Whoever you may call it. You call it CAs, you call it CBA, you call it whatever name you want. It's not as efficient as AI. AI is going to play that very, very pivotal role. You know, I'm running out of time, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But, you know, AI is going to play a very pivotal role in anything. Now, this is chat GPT. You can't understand anything here. The reason is even I can't understand. I took Excel for a company. I took the financials and I just put it copy-paste. I just copy-pasted it in chat GPT. I was like, let's just see what happens. Tomorrow when I go, I need to give some good inputs here. So I just copy-pasted it and I said, let's see what happens. So I put this on chat GPT. And I said, what is your views? I said, what is your views? So chat GPT came out with eight points. And when I asked my junior, I said, what is your views? She said, sir, I need three hours. I said, OK. Came back with three hours. She said, all my characters. Said, yeah, everything is right. It looks perfect. Chat GPT gave me these nine points in a matter of seconds. It's, and I did not even format the data. It is just a copy paste. I took it on Notepad. I took it on Excel. And I just pasted it. And ChatGPT is able to process it, understand what's going on, and give me relevant outputs. So it is telling me consistency is there in sales revenue, your expenses has gone up, consultancy charges have gone up, your net loss is very, very high this year, give it some you know, consideration. Things that a human could not find, ChatGPT is able to do in a free, this is, I'm not even paid for this, this is just free. Anybody, any, of, any of you can do this. You can try this with any of your financials, your own financials. So chat GPT is able to give this valuable input that humans either take time or miss altogether. So therefore, you can already see a drastic change which is coming through AI. And ultimately, my point is, so I think this is the next speaker's slides. But ultimately, the point is, AI is going to play a key role in completely stopping frauds. It's going to play a key role in proactively finding frauds and most importantly, reducing the workload on humans. Maybe this may be in the process of people losing jobs, but if we're able to integrate as to how we can work closely with the technology, it's going to be very, very important. As I say, technology moves very, very fast. I'm reminded of the story. You know, One Japanese person was visiting Chennai and he called for a Uber. As usual, Uber canceled. Then he called Ola. Ola also canceled. He said, fine, I'll get into auto. So he gets into auto. And uh, he says, go to the airport, man. I'm getting late for the flight. The auto fellow is going to the airport. Yeah. He says, what is this? You're going so slow. Look at that car over there. Suzuki, made in Japan. Very fast, very fast. So auto fellow is just silent. You know, He does not react. Then after some time, he says, what, man? You're going so slow. Look at that car over there. Honda, made in Japan. Very fast, very fast. And this fellow starts getting irritated. But he stays cool. Then they are getting closer to the airport. He says, what are you doing, man? See, flights and all are taking off there. Go faster. See that car over there. Mitsubishi, made in Japan, very fast, very fast. So auto fellow is fully irritated at this point. He's ready to burst, but he keeps his cool. Finally, he reaches. How much I should pay? He says, 7,000 rupees. 7,000 rupees, sir. Yes, meter, made in India, very fast, very fast, he says. So... <laughs> Technology, honestly, is like that meter, you know, you never know where it's going to hit you and shock you. But the most important thing is to know that it's happening and keep up to date. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to address this gathering and uh, over to the next speaker.
So Akash is going to speak to us uh, on our everyday transaction evolving digital payments. Abhishek spoke to you about the wonders of use of AI and technology in our payments and daily use. I'll just give you an anecdote and then I'll ask Akash to come. The chairman, the former chairman of CBDT, Central Board of Direct Taxes, in charge of all income tax all over the country, he was defrauded of an amount of rupees 15 lakhs by using the digital payment system. Even today, he has not received the money back. With that, I will ask Mr. Akash <laughs> to speak on digital payments and the dangers involved in it more than the technology in it. Because it's very important for all of us to know that we blindly use our um, uh, internet for making payments or our cards. Incidentally, my State Bank of India credit card, one day at 9 o'clock in the night, I got a call from the State Bank of India. It was very irritating. He said, sir, your card is being used in New York. People are buying Nike shoes there. <laughs> I was shocked. He said, are you joking? No, sir, I'm going to block the card. Tomorrow morning, I want to tell you, you won't be able to use the card. By the time he blocked the card, they have already drawn $742 from my card. And they blocked the card. Next day morning, of course, I did find out they had used the card there in the United States. I was in Chennai and my card was being used in the United States. Fortunately, the SBA didn't uh, charge me for anything. They filed a criminal case against a person in uh, New York. And I don't know what happened. So there are a lot of pitfalls in this area which the user has to guard himself against. Now I'll ask Mr. Akash to speak on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this introduction. And like Mr. Abhishek pointed, I think we'll have to declare all our statements to the government, I think, from at least this year. Because over the last years, I think like what he mentioned, there has been a lot of defaulters and AI has been playing a major role in identifying this. So today, what I'll be covering is basically the digital payment part of the finance ecosystem. So. Like we all know, we have been using UPI on a daily basis and almost all our phones have some sort of fintech apps which we daily use. So to show where we have come from to what we are today in the finance ecosystem, so let me start. So today I'll be covering four major, I would say, parts. What, what is the history of payments from where we have come to what we are today? and of course the current trends and what is going to be expected out of this from the current ecosystem to what we are going to march towards in the future. So this revolution started almost in the hundreds. I think we started with physical money, papers, and then we had a lot of electronic transfer introduced, NEFT, IMPS, RTGS, and over the last few years, like Abhishek also mentioned, we have been remarkably gaining expertise in fintech, especially if you see the last 10 years or 15 years, we have almost progressed to no cash policy. So I don't know how many of you carry cash today, but the use of cash, I think in the last five or say six years has been remarkably less. So if you look at the payment industry itself, we can classify it as four different eras. So the era one, where we have used physical debit cards and credit cards, and then a lot of technology came in like IMPS, RG, uh, real-time cross settlements, etc. And then now we are marching towards payment 4.0. So currently we are in payment 3.0 era where UPI is used as our primary payment. And of course, there are a lot of technologies that government has introduced which you can pay even a person or an organization or a merchant. So this is the roadmap, what is present. So if you look at the volumes from where it started in 1.0 to where it's come in 2.0 and 3.0, and now what we can expect in the next few years is going to be trillions of transactions. 
So if you look at the government milestones, what they've achieved for the last 20 or I would say last 40 years, it started in 1950s where RBI was introduced and then later, early 2000s, there were a lot of technology that was booming. They, re they actually introduced a lot of schemes. And so in the later 2020s, this is where we are. So recently you would have heard about ONDC, you would have heard about digital currency which RBI has introduced and you would also heard about PIDF. So all these policies revolve or all these policies are introduced in the motive that India should go cashless. Or I would say there shouldn't be physical cash which is getting transferred. We are moving to a digital age. So if you look at what are the factors that have really led to this, I would say, us using digital payments in this era is primarily if you see use of mobile phones. So like Abhishek really pointed out when the first iPhone came, there were no apps which were supported for payments. And today you see a bunch of apps, Paytm, etc. You can use Paytm, you can use Paytm for almost anything. So look at from where in 2010 to in 2020, where we have got access to internet. So almost only 2.2 crores of people were having access in 2010 versus today if you see it's almost you know going in a phenomenal order and same way financial inclusion the government has been promoting financial inclusion with various schemes with various sectors so that is also a major boom and we have also been receiving calls from government I mean like private and government banks for credit and debit cards so government is really focusing on these three factors where credit and debit cards penetration has also increased over the last few years. So now, focusing on the current 4.0 era, what we are really heading to is a low cost, I would say low cost payment solutions for the next few years. And this, I would say, a projected stats say that almost 58,800 crores of transactions is expected by 2025. So this is the stats what we have got. So comparing India and China, if you look at where it all started, early 2000s when China had launched their own apps, QR, pay, QR uh, based apps. So today their volume is almost doubled, while what we are today is what China was, I think in 2015 or 2016. So the adaption of China was very early compared to India. So in the next slides, if you see what are the dominant factors that China has actually adapted was they had a massive user base. They had early adoption of QR based systems. So the government was pushing on online payments rather than physical cash. And they also, so if you see those innovations like QR based or facial recognition, all this started a little early when compared to India. So that's where I would say if you look at the four major payments that were pushed, it's WeChat, Alipay, and obviously one is run by the government of China bank, official bank. So these were primary instruments used in the early 2000s and of course today also this has been growing, but they phenomenally started a little early and they are ahead of the game. So these are common factors or common instruments used to pay today. I'm sure most of you would have been using mobile wallets, micro ATMs, USSD, AEPS, which is other enabled payment systems. So one classic example which Abhishek gave is paying your income tax or any refunds. And of course in stock markets or creating mandates for mutual funds, all this is done through AEPS. So the other one is for merchants, which is point of sale. The other one is UPI, primarily being used by everyone. And of course, banking cards. So these are different instruments. I think globally, these instruments ap are applied to almost all the countries. But if you see the key components of all these instruments, it's going to be these five. So one is the use of payment aggregators. So for a system like UPI to run this fast, at a magnitude of say X number of crores. Ideally a payment aggregator is a major thing which was introduced. 
So all these are third parties. So payment aggregators, payment gateways, account aggregators, and of course the one who gives information and the one who consumes information are called financial information providers and then financial information users. So if you look at the ecosystem in India over the last 20 years, you see all these companies transforming to a massive scale. So it's because of using these concepts. So I'll take an example of a classic example of Paytm, which, has, which runs as a payment aggregator service. So what it actually does, so you will be used, I mean, you take any app, say Mintra or Flipkart or Amazon, you'll be bombarded with a number of payment options. So you'll be having few payment gateways, and of course you'll be having few payment options like pay with UPI or pay with card. So primarily what a Paytm does is, it's a form of a payment aggregator where you as a consumer, you submit an order to the online store, it goes through a gateway, and then it reaches the payment processor, and then it reaches the bank, and an instant settlement is done to the merchant. So the days where you had three plus days, T plus three or T plus five, to settle the money to a merchant has gone. Now it's almost instant settled. So this is what a Paytm does, or any big firm like Paytm, or say Google Pay, or any underlying UPay app has a payment aggregator associated to it. So one more similar concept is an account aggregator, which again uses the same concept, but what it does is it takes the user consent from us. So technically only if we authorize, it will aggregate from different sources. Like example, you have four different banks or Paytm is able to fetch your balances from four or five different accounts. So this is the process of account aggregator. So the reason why we are pushing towards an account aggregator system is your usage of mobile phone in one app is more constant than you switching between other apps. So in an app like Paytm, when Paytm offers insurance, everything, balance transfer or Google Pay, etc., they offer all the services in a nutshell. So the entire concept of account aggregator revolves around providing you services in a nutshell in one single app. So this is where they have nailed it. And if you see what are the barriers that are currently there with a few set of people who are still not comfortable. I would say majority we have adapted to digital, I would say payments being in any form, be it GPay or Paytm or any form. But there are certain set of people who still find it difficult or still they are hesitant to move to the, this current ecosystem. So I would say these are the major factors that are affecting them to move. So you can see some of the vendors are charging a fee for your payments. Example, there's a recent app called Check. When you pay a credit card bill, they actually charge you three or four rupees extra. So, and it varies across. And example, classic example is Swiggy. They charge you a platform fee of three rupees. Now Zobato also charges. So all these are ways of them earning money while the core fundamental, fund, I mean fundamental is still payment, they're still charging inconsistent fees. So one is charging three rupees, one is charging two rupees. So to a consumer, I don't know which one is actually the best. So that is one major factor of inconsistent fees. And of course, there is high POS transaction cost for merchants. Each one charges a hefty amount. Some have low amounts, some have high amounts. So merchants are also struggling and they are pushed to an ecosystem where only if you have an UPI code, people will come and pay you with UPI and you know some people might not have cash. So everyone is actually pushed towards having a merchant POS system and that's where they are actually leveraging this opportunity and charging high commissions. So I think that needs to be regularized. So talking about frauds, of course, when you have a system like UPI, when you have a system like online payment transactions, it doesn't come easy. It comes with its own loopholes and it, its own disadvantages. So I think talking about fraud initiatives, uh, you can see that various frameworks have been launched by RBI over the years. Of course, it's an iterative process. Each year, they are ensuring that the security policy is tightened. 
and they are revising the policy at least six months or one year to make sure that all these guidelines are followed by almost all vendors. So example, when Paytm or say Google Pay launches an app update which you get, they have to follow all these RBI guidelines or they'll have to follow all these policy decisions so that they can, they can actually serve you. So no entity will function without abiding, I mean, without abiding these guidelines technically. So again, KYC, I'll come to it in the later part. So talking about key areas of innovation where we are heading to in the future, I would say we have got enough data in the last few years, I think from 2016 to 2023, all these apps have been able to leverage our data because technically each transaction is getting accounted. So if you see the future areas of innovation, I would say I'm splitting it into five different buckets. So one is they're going to hyper personalize for you so example, apps are going to recommend, they know your online, uh, say, buying pattern, or they know whom you're going to transfer money to. So it's a form of predictive analysis that companies are going to do, and they're going to come up with different algorithms to suggest you what, say, today you've bought something, and then the next six months, they're going to actually remind you saying, this is going to be a recurring payment, and why don't you pay it with us? So I think personalization is going to be a key for all these apps and the other bucket is conversational, I would say, supposing when you type or when you actually do a WhatsApp chat, you can actually pay in WhatsApp or while you speak, you can actually give some keywords for the app to pay. So that is something which is going to come and of course open banking and there are going to be a lot of innovation in the regulatory space and of course there's going to be cross-border transactions which is going to evolve. So I'll quickly take two examples of how all this is evolving. One is open banking, another one is CBCD, which recently the RBI has in announced. So open banking, as you can see, it's not a traditional banking. So today, I don't remember the last time where I went to a bank. So it's been almost three to four years. So traditional banking, technically they have their own apps and they ask users to transact with their apps. But today, the open banking concept is they have web books from all the banks and they act as mediators. So if you use a, a, a one single app like Paytm or there's a recent app called Fi, where it actually aggregates all your balances and you can actually transact using Fi with different banks. So open banking has been able to provide a wonderful platform by aggregating all your bank accounts and obviously it offers you digital services in a single nutshell. So that's the primary aim of open banking. So if you see in India, it has been started, I would say four to five years down the lane, it will improve. But if you see developed nations like UK and the European Union, open banking has always been evolving since the early 2000s and 2010s. So today they are far ahead, but the only way where they are not able to meet us is in volumes of transactions. So the other example is CBCD which the government had introduced. It's a form of digital, digital rupee. So technically, there are two ways to implement it. So one is a unilateral implementation where the RBI is directly uh, interacting with the common man. Say they create a wallet in your particular phone and you can actually transact digital rupees. The other one which is preferred by India is it's going to act or it's going to give some rights to common banks like HDFC Access, which actually gives you access to this digital money and you can transfer it. So I also have a video on this slide, maybe you can see it later, on how a person is actually transacting using digital money in the la latest event, which is G20. So I would say these two will accelerate the ecosystem in the future. And uh, this CB, I would say the digital currency being I would say one of the biggest innovations and of course we are not ahead of the race, we are somewhere in the race, but we have a long way to go. So if you see 
an overline of what, how, how many countries have already implemented, how many countries are implementing, and what is the future like. There are already certain com companies, uh, sorry, countries who have already implemented this, and there are countries that have launched their pilot phase, and there are countries who are going to launch. So we fall under the third category. There are some countries who have already tried, tested, and using it, and then there are some companies who are in their pilot phase testing the waters. So what enhancements can this bring to the fintech ecosystem? I would say in these four major buckets, if you rationalize the transaction cost and keep it simple and keep it straight with no commissions, I think that would be a good win for the future. And I think secure data, that is something that RBA has to create constant frameworks to improve security. Because you see a lot of scams in UPI and you see a lot of scams in OTP and you see a lot of scams even in credit cards. So with tapless or with contactless payments, the security of a common consumer, you have reports saying 7,000 rupees suddenly got debited. Even though you keep all your contactless off and international transactions off, still there is a way to fish all these transactions. And you know hackers and scammers have been using it. So I think a common framework to enhance this would be a road to the future and of course simplified and centralized digital KYCs. So KYC exists today, but it is not, I would say it is not in a streamlined way. So I think when you streamline it, that will bring you a good future. And of course, better payment infrastructure is what we are aiming to. So this is just a graph on where we are in the global scenario. And of course, what is the potential of digital payments in 2030, you can see that almost, we can almost aim 61% of growth from where we are. So from 2020 to 2025, there's going to be a significant growth. And next five years, there's going to be even more significant growth in the number of transactions. So this is the market value of not just UPI, it's the market value of transactions that are going in globally. And if you see where India has really nailed it in terms of, uh, I would say, being on top of the game is real-time settlements. So when you take UPI as an app and when you pay, it can be a person or it can be an organization or it can be a merchant, the amount that is debited and uh, the amount that is credited to the merchant is actually almost instant. So that's where we are leading the race. And of course, the same scenario was with China but I think today, with the number of population and given the number of transactions, we have recorded almost 11 million transactions in this Diwali season. That's, that's a huge number. It's reached a new height. So this is the potential. And of course, talking about the good, we'll also have to talk about what is coming from the other side as well. So China is imposing on this, where it's creating a digital silk route and it has clear objectives on what it's going to do for the next few years. So it has clear objectives like it has to promote digital e-commerce and this is setting up in all the countries. And of course, it's going to boost its economic growth by setting up all these. And the key focus is telecom, e-commerce, data centers and AI and all related to payments. So what China is going to do with this policy is it has already signed up with few countries and it is already setting up infrastructure where two major companies, Huawei and ZTE, are actually taking constant contracts. They're building the ecosystem. So when this actually comes live, maybe 10 years from now, there is a future potential where China is able to control almost everything if they've almost linked all these five things together. So that is one thing which from Chinese side, they are actually pushing really towards this policy. And if you look at the global scenario, each region has its own networks. Say you take UPI, you take New Zealand, you take Russia. For us, UPI is the focus. UPI is what is portrayed as a new invention, but they were already players ahead. And there are already so many payment ecosystems that has been created throughout the world. So only thing is, 
the only way we can actually nail it is in terms of transactions and in terms of people adapting digital wallets. So the more people adapt it, the more number of transactions, I think we are going to see more technology innovations in this field. So last, I think the recent innovations where RBA has announced they'll give clearance for credit cards for UPI, I think that is going to be a huge increase in number. And of course, financial institutions are constantly trying to create a framework to regulate this process, though there are certain processes in place, people are finding loopholes for scammers to actually take money. So this has to reduce. And I think the account aggregator framework is also being constantly revisited by RBI and it is giving harsh guidelines to companies like Paytm, Google Pay to enforce third level of security. I think recently you would have heard about 3DS, which is a form of security in Visa and Master. So they're trying to enforce it. They're trying to make everyone fall into this guideline and then they will take it forward. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Akash. That was a very comprehensive and a very nice presentation. There's one point which I want to mention to all of you. 2014 July, demonetization took place. The currency in circulation in India was 13 lakh crores. Today, so how many years? Uh, nine years. The currency in circulation in India is 33.6 lakh crores, three times more. On November 3rd, 2013, Currency in circulation was 33 lakh and 33.1 lakh crores. So within 10 days, the currency in circulation has increased by 500,000 crores. Connect it. I would like to leave that question to you. Why? With all these digital payments taking place, with all these internet transactions taking place, why the currency in circulation has increased so much in this country? And why within this last 10 days has increased by 500,000 crores? Elections, thank you very much. So, any questions on these two brilliant presentations? Yes, please. Let this girl ask her question first. Thank you, sir. My question was for Mr. Abhishek. Uh, so you, you shared an instance where uh, AI chat GPT had solved uh, a problem that you know humans couldn't do as fast. Have you had any encounters where AI has been wrong? Yeah, I think at the current stage, AI is, is basically culminating resources, collecting it from various places. So very often you will find vague answers. You may find some incorrect answers in some rare instances. But that's just a temporary thing. I think in a matter of five years, AI is going to be vastly superior. It's just not going to be matchable by any human is what I strongly feel. So it, it, it's constantly learning and that's how it is today. So yes, right now there are mistakes, but I don't think there will be in the future. My question is to Akash. Uh, just uh, CBDC, just now they have introduced, you know, some one week back I got an SMS. And I am a privileged customer selected for CDB. And I also, from the Play Store, I installed this uh, Digi Wallet. Some 100 rupees I put in that, 5 rupees, 10 rupees, and all I put in that. Then I just saw a YouTube. The advantage is that uh, it is not having the server or anything directly from it's going from my, my phone to the other phone directly. That's what I understood. And uh, since it is like in your pocket, it is there in your mobile, there is no there is no interest, nothing you will get. If it is there in the bank, you will get interest, but you won't get interest here if you put it in the bucket. So if the server system is involved, I feel some kind of a security is involved. The server is not involved and you don't have the um, uh, interest also. What is the customer getting from out of this? What is the advantage? I, I saw that as two are disadvantage for me. 
So why it is being promoted? What is the advantage I'm getting? I just wanted to know. I just want to get enlightened. So the first example which you have given, uh, technically it's used as a wallet. So example, you don't keep all your money in your wallet. So it is actually transferred from bank to bank. It's a bank to bank transaction. So the idea of CBDC is a replacement of cash. So example, you want to have cash in your pocket or you want to have cash, you're, carry cash, you're carrying cash to your stores or any departmental stores. So the primary idea of CBDC is they're going to push for contactless payments. So giving cash is what they want to avoid. That is the primary objective. And in future, example, now if you load your money from your bank account to wallet, I would say no provider is actually giving an interest to how much you hold in your wallet because it's on low volumes. Example, Amazon Pay or take any type of digital wallet, it acts as a PPI. It's actually a personalized payment instrument that has been used. So the advantage is, supposing you don't have certain amount in your bank or if you have already loaded it in your particular wallet, it's going to be a seamless transaction. So there's not going to be so many layers of, I would say, traversal. It's going to be an instant pay from you to the merchant. So in future, yes, RBI can introduce, say, a small leverage where you have an interest to that wallet, but that's again for future. But where you can really have as an advantage is you don't need to carry cash at all. So whatever money you want to load, you can load it in your wallet, and that's going to be an offline process also. So in future, they will bring offline payments like what they've bought in UPI Lite. So where you can actually transfer money even without the help of internet. So the real game is when they take this to the next level where they're going to introduce contactless payments without internet. So that's the future. So it is without uh, server means uh, you can definitely pay. You don't have to depend upon that server and other things down and all of the of the your uh, bank. That is one thing. Second thing I just wanted to know, if somebody is giving me one lakh in the uh, wallet, will it come under income tax? Please, sir. How it is if coming? Anything There's no pan, nothing involved. It comes to my wallet. I am giving to so many people outside. No, when there is a bank transfer, example, someone is transferring it. No, to someone is transferred into his wallet. From that wallet, he is giving to my wallet. Correct. Where it is going to bank, where is the PAN number involved, nothing is involved, no? So above 1 lakh, obviously, you will have a PAN account. Below 1 lakh, obviously, it's, I wouldn't say it's unaccounted, but yes, when it actually no, comes meanwhile, to... No, meanwhile, all the accounts are, all the other things are accounted. Here, I am finding it won't find, it won't find a place in your AIS. No, these transactions are reported by third parties to the bank. But in this case, example, you do a Paytm transfer whatever you load is actually getting accounted. Paytm has to submit it to NPCI. So here, this is governed by RBI directly. And RBI is giving controls to third party banks, example, HDFC or ICICI. So when you install this app, it would be from a bank, correct? Example, yeah, SBI, bank, SBI. SBI. So SBI has to give this particular number of transactions, what is happening in your wallet to RBI. So it is accounted. Okay. There is one more way of accounting to this, which is known as the suspicious transaction reports. That is also introduced at the instance of the United Nations, where I also worked in the Security Council. If you get one lakh for nothing, so it's a suspicious transaction. It will automatically get reported. Second point I want to mention here is, before other question, if you had seen the groups of countries, you wouldn't have found the name of United States there. The USA's Federal Reserve is very suspicious about introducing CBDC. They have produced a paper running to about 80 pages. I would commend it to you, you must read it. Why they do not, we are very suspicious about introducing the CBDC. How will it affect the monetary policy of the country? When once you introduce CBDC, banks will clamor for it. This is what happened in before 1924, when every bank in the United States had an authority to issue currency and the whole system collapsed. Then only they, bring, they brought in this uh, Federal Reserve, like our central bank. So here, at present, Reserve Bank of India says it will be the sole issuer of CBDC. 
Later on, we do not know what will happen, what kind of policy will come in and all. So people have to be very cautious about it. Why is cryptocurrency not being accepted by anybody? Because it's a private issue of currency. Nirmala Sitaraman keeps on saying, it has no underlying asset, it is just a paper. Just a paper being produced by people. Not even a paper, it is just a record. So it's a very, very strange thing that has happened in the monetary world and the monetary system. Somebody coming out with uh, something and which is nothing, you're just gambling on something without nothing. So those are the things which have to be avoided in the CBDC also. Tomorrow certain things may come up. Now any other question? To these brilliant people, yes, please. Uh, uh, yes, I just want to add something. Like you have asked uh, questions related to Chat GPT. So actually, uh, one day I have been to uh, one. Uh, uh, there was one, you know, uh, uh, organization. They invited me to deliver lecture on cyber security. I have been there. So there was one uh, cyber expert as well with me. So. He said, just see what I uh, I'm going to show you. He just asked about himself. Uh, do you know, uh, like, who am I? So he asked uh, about himself. Char GPT answered every question very nicely and in a perfect way. But uh, Char GPT was saying that he expired on that particular day. Again, he was saying, just uh, tell me about myself. Again, that, you know, the date of expiry was again changing. Continuously, he was asking three to four times, and that day was changing continuously. So what I want to say over here, that we can't rely on uh, this AI you know, fully and confidently that the tools or the, uh, the uh, this type of uh, you know, AI tools will help us out in every ways. But to some extent, yes, it is very fruitful if we want to have a search or something like that. It is helpful for us, but we can't rely you know, fully on it. And the other thing, uh, what I want to share, Hindi mein mein bolu chalega? Chalega. मेरे यहाँ एक आती हैं उनके साथ क्या हुआ फाइनेंशियल फ्रॉड की मैं बात कर रही हूँ उनके साथ इंसिडेंस ऐसा हुआ कि उन्होंने एक नया सिम लिया फोन में उनको मैसेज आता है एसएमएस आता है कि आप इतने लाख रुपए की विनर हो गई हैं ठीक है उन्होंने बड़ी खुशी से वो आई मुझे बोल रही हैं देखिए � financial fraud ki victim ho sakti hai. Unho ne meri baat maani nahi. Unho ne bola, arre, mein itne kam time mein paise kamaungi, aap logo ko shayad acha nahi lag raha sun ke. Mein ne bola, bhai, dekh li jay, mein toh manai kar sakti hu na, ab aap ka decision mein aap ke behalf mein le nahi sakti. Unho ne ek baar paise lagai, mujhe lagta hai 8,000 lagai honge. Phir udhar se message aata hai, agar aap ko itne laak rupay chahiye, aap phir se dubara paise daliye. उन्होंने दोबारा पैसे लगाए मुझे लगता है लगभग 20,000 उन्होंने लगा दिए होंगे जिन्हें खाने की दिक्कत हो रही है जस्ट इमेजिन वो कांट अफोर्ड यू नो वन टाइम मील अब वो 20,000 अगर उनके अकाउंट से जा रहा है तो मतलब इसे क्या बोला जाए उन्हें ये पता था डेट आई वर्क इन द साइबर फील तो उन्होंने वो आई मुझे बोल रही है भाई अब तो पैसे मेरे चले गए मैं क्या करूं अब हम लोगों ने जल्दी जल्दी ट्रेस किया तो वो बांग्लादेश का एरिया बता रहा था अब मैं बोलूं कि अब बांग्लादेश मैं कैसे जाऊं अब कोर्ट में या फिर आपकी एफआईआर दर्ज होगी सबसे पहले अगर मैं आपके साथ जाती हूं पुलिस मुझे डांटेगी कि ये आपके कांटेक्ट में थी आपने क्यों नहीं इन्हें बताया कि ये फाइनेंशियल फ्रॉड की विक्टिम हो सकती हैं है ना लेकिन मैं गई फिर उनके साथ गई और फाइनेंशियल फ्रॉड में क्या होता है ना हम जितनी जल्दी अगर उस पे एक्शन लेंगे जैसे कुछ लोग विक्टिम अगर हो जाते हैं वो दो तीन दिन तक बैठे रहेंगे सोचेंगे फिर जा करके साइबर सेल में जा करके कंप्लेन रजिस्टर करेंगे ये ट्रेसलेस हो जाता है उसके बाद इसमें वी कांट ब्लेम बैंक दैट दे आर नॉट टेकिंग एक्शन है ना जितनी जल्दी हम विक्टिम होते हैं और ये क्रिमिनल्स हैं दे आर सो व्हाट टू से दे आर सो दे दे कमिट क्राइम्स सो परफेक्टली इन अ प्रॉपर चैनल कि ये जनरली सैटरडे संडेज को करेंगे या फिर छुट्टियों के दिनों में करेंगे ताकि वी कांट गो टू बैंक एंड मेक कंप्लेंट्स अगेंस्ट देम है ना साइबर सेल वाले भी इफ वी गो एंड कंप्लेन रिगार्डिंग दिस काइंड ऑफ इश्यूज टू साइबर सेल दे आल्सो उन्हें भी नहीं पता भाई कौन से सेक्शन में लगाऊं 
कौन सा आई का सेक्शन लगेगा आई का सेक्शन लगेगा सी का कौन सा सेक्शन लगेगा दे आर नॉट अवेयर ऑफ सो दिस आई जस्ट वॉन्टेड टू शेयर थैंक यू you are, you had a question yes sir it is actually a, not a question per se it is just a caution which i wanted to express to the whole group maybe if they have comments on this caution they might also like to add on have you heard of a better than cash alliance so better than cash alliance is comprising of all third world countries usa mastercard uh, you can just google it out you'll find the whole thing and you'll realize these are the people who are pushing digital currencies okay not a single first world country is part of this alliance uh, we need to be very cautious and uh, and okay and china china has gone into digital currency basically on their own stack ict stack uh, the uh, rest of the world including us is mostly on western okay ict stack and this digital currencies have huge privacy and national security implications and we do not have a, a robust privacy law we do not have a data localization policy and there is a fundamental right to privacy for all citizens of india which is being violated okay and uh, i would again reiterate that we need to be very careful about getting colonized in a digital way okay if you have any comments both of you i would uh, you know like to hear that but i just thought i should make you are this right point. that is exactly one of the reasons why usa is not jumping into this area because this paper uh, written in the federal reserve is a very comprehensive paper and they have pointed out a lot of pitfalls in this area so the, and another point which you raise artificial intelligence and its trustworthiness you came by flight did you come by flight when you entered the aircraft did you check up whether the pilot could fly the aircraft or not you just got into the aircraft went to your seat and sat there hoping that the pilot will fly similarly the ai when once it comes into existence this is what is going to happen you are just going to trust it you are not very sure the pilots are going to fly whether they are drunk or not you don't know but you just get into the aircraft hopefully it will fly and you land safely similarly ai is going to have a similar um, a degree of reliance if you look at the number of aircraft accident taking place there are one in a million or so that takes place similarly in the case of ai also there could be failures now but over the years when the system get more perfect but i do agree there will be lot of people who will commit frauds who will try to defeat the ai thank you very much and uh, youngsters they have done very brilliantly they presented their topics exceedingly well thank you give them a big hand <laughs> thank you very much shivram and sir for moderating that session so well uh, can i invite you to felicitate both the speakers <laughs> mr abhishek uh, mr k s akash <laughs> mr abhishek murli So now we'll be moving on to the first panel discussion of today. It's called Cyber Security in the Digital Digital Age: Safeguarding Critical Infrastructure. The chair for this panel discussion is Mr. K. Satyanarayanan, who is the director of New Horizon Media. Can I invite uh, Satyanarayanan sir to come up on stage? So we have three eminent panelists for this session. Our first speaker. sorry i'll just repeat myself that uh, this is uh, general brar who is the goc of dakshin bharat area so he has been very kind to come here and he's agreed to speak for about 10 minutes before the panel discussion which we are planning so uh, you know after that we will go through with the rest of the program so with that uh, may I request uh, general brar who you know very well he is also participated in our program earlier 
So I'll request him to speak for about 10 minutes. Yeah, you can take the chairs. Good afternoon, uh, Jai Hind. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Shiva Raman, of course, I have spoken to Lake Komodo Vasan and all the distinguished guests here. So uh, thank you for the invite, sir. And what uh, always is a pleasure to discuss things uh, on, uh, you know, things which can make our organization India and especially being from the Army and the Defense Forces better. So last time we were discussing China, so this time it's technology. Uh, uh, one is definitely passionate about that we should uh, have things going in the right manner. Uh, we keep on talking about paving way for technology, that's the theme I think. But how do you implement it on ground? So last time also I gave certain things which were practical. So this time also uh, I thought let me give some practical experiences which have happened. You see, we all know that uh, technology only gets implemented if all the ecosystem is in the right place, which starts from, uh, you know, the implementer executor. So we have examples uh, later, not now. So we have examples, uh, you know, you have the UPI payments, which is working excellently well. You have ISRO, you have so many other people who have done exceedingly well. But uh, in defense, uh, it is not at the desired level for many things, and I'm sure that must have been talked and will be talked also. So uh, being from defense, uh, uh, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, there are certain things which have to be part of the ecosystem by which we can implement things. Uh, we all know that computers, in fact, uh, the computers came to the Indian Army first, long back in 80s or even before that. But the usage of computers has remained as a PPT and uh, this thing even till now, more or less. Whereas, you know, computers have gone to a different level and everything is now AI and other things. But we in defense have not exploited the potential. So, uh, just to lighten up the thing, I'll start with some, as I said, practical examples. Since one was well qualified on computers as a young officer, I'm talking of uh, 97 or 98. Oh, no, this uh, incident is about uh, 2000. Uh, I was posted to Financial Planning Directorate, uh, which deals with all the budget of the Indian Army. And uh, they had a module being implemented by MindTree. The mine tree had just bifurcated, I mean, it just split from, I think, Infosys. Their two people had. So this was one of the major projects. In fact, on the success of this project, they then said, we have done it for defense and all. But anyway, they implemented the FP Directorate. I was well qualified, and suddenly overnight, I was posted to FP Directorate because they said there's a frantic call from the ADG or that time that they need somebody computer qualified. So I was posted there. So my ADG and all the people there said that, uh, you know, they have made everything, it has been passed, but you know, there's something wrong, it's not working. So I said, what, what is happening? So they printed out like, you know, revenue budget or something. So it was coming with blanks. So it is giving blank, it's giving nothing. So I didn't have much knowledge of how the financial budget of the Indian Army used to work. One was still a major that time, I think, major looking. So still I said, uh, what are the inputs you have given? You see, and what are the allocation you have to give? You have to give that this branch will get so many thousand crores or this, and there are so many other factors. Bolta, that we have to do. Unless you input something, how will anything come out? So, you know, uh, uh, the mental thought is that we should sit at one place and the computer should do everything. So that doesn't happen. So I thought I'll just give a, this example uh, and another, you know, before 
coming here, actually, I was posted overnight from Nagaland and the tie which I was wearing. That time, of course, very high insurgency level. I am was very active. So there I had uh, made an oracle form, int collation program. Uh, so that worked very well because I could do it. But once I left, it stopped working. So coming to the mood point, like I said, uh, my experience of having dealt with technology, computer, other things, why it doesn't happen so easily in defenses and why it happens outside well is because, you know, it's a job requirement. If you join uh, all these tech companies, if you're not qualified, you will not be taken. Whereas in army, that's not the priority. The other thing it can happen is if the head of the, the organization or the, this thing, he's driving it. But then, you know, whoever drives it get posted out after two years. Like I was DG Armored Corps, I forced my director to use e-office. In fact, we won the trophy. The chief said, whichever director just to will get the trophy. So I won the trophy, but now I've come here. People have gone down back to. <laughs> so, you know, those are the things. But these are things which are functional things. What we require for is something which we require for war. And war is not happening. So, you know, it doesn't come as part of your daily requirement of war except for, you know, few things and cyber security being others. So what actually is required for defense is person who understands technology and who has full control of the operational uh, things which are happening. So in Army, again, there's a problem because somebody who's qualified like signals and all who are qualified in computers, they don't have the operational, this thing, overall picture that how do you implement a thing. So that is a thing which uh, needs to be done or is required to be done. So I'm not going to take much time and uh, it's just to highlight two, three things which one has done uh, and including this slide, which is, was work in progress and I got posted there. So first was, of course, I mentioned last time also, I think the swarm drones. We have talked about AI. Now the AI which is to be used has to be used in a use case which the defense will use for operations or for whatever this thing. So swarm drones, which don't need any human intervention, you give it a task, I had shown that video, and it allocates its targets and does its own actions and gives you the feedback and human intervention is minimal. And it strikes the target. So if it says this is the square of area where it'll do surveillance, it will pick up tanks or whatever and give the feedback and then you say you, you strike. Now this concept I had written in 20, this thing to be integrated with the combat forces. So to implement it, I had to really work hard personally, walking up to the chief since I had served with him, the previous chief. So he said, okay, procured it in the emergency procurement. So there were 30 days available. So we made the QR, we made, uh, <coughs> you know, all the, it's a huge process, defense procurement. We did the basic, trials in Ahmednagar and we came up with companies which were somewhere close to the idea. So, you know, uh, in defense procurement, unless somebody meets, you can't approve. But I took that bold decision of saying that this is the first time. So these two companies don't meet, but we'll give them the orders. So one was New Space, which is uh, Air Force led officer, Samir Joshi. Second is Rafe, which is in Noida. So these two companies were given orders of storm drones and now the drones have been inducted. So similarly, another project which I've mentioned earlier, light tank. Now the light tank is something uh, which was being done as a copy paste of another weapon system called K9 Vajra of Korea by LNT. So the, again, then I intervened, I said, this is not a light tank, it will go the Arjun way if you know how the Arjun tank has panned out. So I gave my own specs, own everything. It is a own design thing. Again, there's a big story to it. But then that tank is now coming out hopefully uh, next month. So I will quickly show you something which I think has been talked about. Now you can show the slide. The, this was something, uh, I know it's very clear, but you know, there is something called network centric warfare. <coughs> As I told you, if somebody is good in technology, it's all right. But how do you put it together? Uh, the network-centric warfare is a subject in itself. It requires total understanding what it means, how it is going to be related to Air Force Navy, to all our operational actions. 
but uh, this slide was work in progress for using quantum technology. Now I'll just give you advantages of quantum technology. Uh, quantum technology can be used in communications, it can be used for post encryption, it can be used for messaging, it can obviously will have a data center. The advantage of quantum communications, why I said should be there, because you know in our communication, this is the understanding that all other communication can be jammed, can be interfered, but if you have quantum, it cannot be. So if we get this, I'm just giving you one example, there are many more advantages, and if you are able to achieve this, you know, all the things which China has done to stop us will be a leap forward. Of course, by that time something will come to stop this, but that will be 30 years, 20 years. So I initiated this that since there is something called software defined radio, our radios are analog. Now, I don't know whether that was discussed. The analog radios can be jammed and interfered. Improved version is SDR. The SDR, everybody had started in the world 15 years back. We have still not inducted. In fact, just coming before I inducted the first SDR. So we have already lost on the SDR. You know, we have to now jump technology. So with this, if we can get quantum communication linkage through our combat forces, here it is tanks, it can be RT guns, it can be infantry, it can be any other combat force, which is, you know, wireless, then you have an OFC cable, then this is linked to your satellite communications. Because, you know, again, that is another level of technology where your quantum is through the satellite. Or you have uh, communications which are based through drones. And, you know, uh, satellites can be destroyed. But then drones can emerge anywhere. And cheap drones can emerge anywhere. And they can act as relay posts. And in areas on our northern borders where neither you can lay an OFC, neither you can direct anything and you don't know what is going to happen, this kind of a system will be a game changer. So I can continue to give you various examples. So the point which I said is somebody who has the operational understanding how the ops will pan out with the technology which can be used to help that. Now this uh, thing was presented even we, to various levels. Uh, but I'm not sure because I have now coming in a different job who, who will be even uh, conveying this or understanding. So that's how the, let's see, we'll still push it. The current SONC is my course mate. So I have another small story to tell. In uh, 2008, uh, we had number of the defense projects called CIDSS Tech C3I in, in Army, you know, which were the combat decision support. They were projects given to big companies worth thousands of crores and you know they were not progressing well. So a study team was formed uh, by senior officers of course being, but he took certain colonel level officers who had the knowledge. So I was there and the current SONC was there. He was seized from signals. So there were one or two more also. And uh, the previous deputy chief PNS, he's retired General Dial, he was also there. So the environment must have said that these guys know a little bit. So we had given a study report of saying exactly what is wrong with those thousand crore systems. But you see nobody, nobody took that cognizance and now that projects have been foreclosed. So you know, there has been a time and cost wastage. So uh, I just thought I will uh, tell you that uh, while we talk of technology, while we talk of all this, the defense needs people who can understand how to implement into a use case. And then you have to have people who can mentor and guide the project. Like swarm drones, I have inducted. And uh, of course, I am on this side, but it was being now tested in an exercise. So I was, since uh, one was involved with the procurement and other things. You see, it has AI, as I said, if you have to understand AI. So I said, you have to build the data library of the swarm drones to identify all the enemy, this thing. But what they have done is they have shown it as a demo, packed it nicely and kept it. So, <laughs> you know, 
the data library for that AI to start understanding and the SOM drones to function is more you use it, then only. So this kind of a thing, you know, the uh, thing that somebody has to keep on guiding and telling and this thing. So that happens with all technology. And of course, in the end, it is not technology. We have seen the, uh, this uh, 7th October incident. Uh, technology with the right kind of tactics and this thing, they used technology, but they defeated the high tech things or maybe there were some other, uh, you know, issues as they say, there was always a, some kind of a controversy which is behind such big incidents. So not getting into that detail. So one would be very much interested in being part of such discussions and conveying points, uh, whether it's technology or paving way for technology or other things. So uh, thank you, sir, giving me this stage and uh, so that I could at least convey some of my points. Thank you, Jayan. Uh, thank you, General. I think that was an excellent presentation. And coming towards the close of our thing is so apt because we did discuss quantum technology, we did discuss AI. You know, but finally, if the end user, you know, it is his, uh, you know, complete uh, way of putting it across that made it so different for us. So, like you said, you know, today is in the modern warfare. Uh, we cannot have somebody who is not tech savvy. Technology itself does not win war, but a clear understanding of technology is what will enable you to adopt proper concept of operations. Uh, this is where I think uh, I'm most grateful to you because you know we had two days yesterday and today and uh, that uh, you are able to come today is, is uh, uh, a blessing for us because even last time when you came here, you know those inputs were very well received by our people. So may I now request Mr. Shivaraman so kindly come forward and uh, present a token of our uh, appreciation to the general who's taken time off to come here. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, so uh, like Sir said, please do help yourself with a cup of tea. Uh, now we'll be moving on to the panel discussion of the day, cyber security in the digital age, safeguarding critical infrastructure. The chair for this session is Mr. K. Satyanarayanan, who is the director of New Horizon Media from Chennai. Uh, the participants are Mr. Pavitran Rajan, who is the advisor at the Center for National Security Studies in Ramaya University of Applied Sciences, and the adjunct faculty at the Cyber Security Research Center at Punjab Engineering College. Our second speaker is Mr. Dominic Karunesudas, who is the founder and chief technology officer at Offensive Defensive Cybertext Consulting Private. And our third speaker is Colonel KPM Das, who is retired, and he is the national cybersecurity advisor at Cisco. So I invite all the participants to come up on the stage. Both uh, Mr. Dominic and Colonel KPM Das will be joining us online. So hope you can see the screen. Please help yourself to a cup of tea.
good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so we have uh, Colonel KPM Das and uh, Mr. Dominic Karne Sadas also on screen now, and Colonel Pavitran Rajan. I think um, I will do away with the uh, introductions because um, uh, there is uh, a good mention of that in the booklet that you would have seen, and uh, we would probably be better off using the time for uh, discussion rather than introductions. So thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Colonel Das and uh, Sir Dominic Karnesh Das and uh, uh, Colonel Rajan for uh, being here. So the topic for the panel today is uh, cyber security in the digital age, safeguarding critical infrastructure. And we have a very distinguished panel who are all experts in this field and who have been working in this field for many years. So we look forward to learning a lot from them. So what is critical infrastructure? So if you look at the definition in the Information Technology Act of 2000, it defines critical information infrastructure as a computer resource, the incapacitation or destruction of which shall have debilitating impact on national security, economy, public health, or safety. So it's a pretty uh, wide uh, definition that way. The government under the act has the power to declare any data, database, IT network, or communications infrastructure as critical information infrastructure to protect that digital asset. So that's what we are going to be talking about today. So what are the kinds of things that would fall under the purview of critical infrastructure? So you can have government databases or networks, which would mean things like the uh, UI, uh, DAI, the Unique ID Authority of India Limited, uh, India's uh, Aadhaar uh, database, the National Informatics Center run uh, data centers, clouds, messaging services, and all of that. Then the banking, financial services, and insurance sector. So you have the NPCI, the National Payments Corporation of India, which runs the UPI. And then the uh, banks, the major banks, SBI, HDFC, ICICI, Punjab National Bank, Bank of Baroda, and a few other banks. And then the Life Insurance Corporation of India, the LIC. Telecom, all the licensed telecom service providers. I'm not sure if uh, the submarine cables are also included as part of that. Probably, I presume, they are also included as a critical infrastructure. Then the power sector, power and energy. So you have the power stations, the grids, the distribution companies, all of them. Healthcare, so health data, the vaccine related data and all of that. Transport, which is railways, airports, and airlines, shipping, all of that. And then other strategic and public enterprises which are uh, providing services. So the oil and gas sector or the other heavy industry and so on. So what are the major types of threats that are going to be uh, things that we need to look at from the perspective of critical information infrastructure? So it could be data theft or data destruction. It could be ransomware attacks where people actually encrypt your data and then ask for a ransom to allow you to access your data again. It could be denial of service attacks so they prevent your data from being accessed, prevent your websites from being accessed. It could be malware that is introduced. It could also be backdoors in hardware and software to bypass the authentication when you come in through the front door. And it could also be disruptions to um, uh, various kinds of uh, infrastructure which is not necessarily critical because of a domino effect especially with uh, industry 4.0 now, if something fails, then a whole lot of other industries could also fail. There are two orgs, uh, organizations in India which are tasked with dealing with this, with the threats to critical infrastructure. So one is the National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center, the NCIPC, and uh, they are the nodal agency in respect of all activities to protect critical infrastructure. And they're supposed to take all kinds of measures to protect infrastructure from unauthorized access, modification, use, disclosure, disruption, 
incapacitation or destruction through various kinds of activities. The other is the CERT in or the computer emergency response team. So they are more of a you know organization that deals with the uh, threats as and when they arise. So you can report threats to them. So they they are they have two functions. One is a reactive function where they will uh, deal with the threat as and when it arises. Um, you can um, they have a 24 by 7 security service and then uh, they offer recovery procedures, incident tracing and so on. They also have a proactive function which is to issue security guidelines, advisories and then perform vulnerability analysis, risk analysis, collaborate with vendors, conduct training and so on. And they are also a sort of uh, uh, resource where you can go to find all kinds of incidents. So there's a reporting function they have, central point for reporting incidents and a database of incidents. So now, given all of this, let's now look at talking to our panelists to find out a few things from them about what we actually need to be looking at. So I'd like to start off by talking to you, uh, Colonel Rajan, in terms of um, uh, the threats, uh, how can we prepare for these attacks, which are going to come for sure. Is there something that we can do to deter attacks? Is deterrence a possibility or should we just assume that, you know, we'll have to deal with them as and when they come? Okay, firstly, critical information infrastructure, um, there can be crimes, it's possible, but mostly to do with nation states. Uh, critical information infrastructure is usually targeted by nation states it can also be targeted by terrorist organizations. So when you look at uh, nation states, per se, you can't discount the geopolitical aspects of it. And um, uh, primarily in India, we've always you know, tackled this from the point of cybercrime. The geopolitical aspects of cybersecurity threats somehow has not been a comfortable uh, topic for many, basically because we are a consuming nation where we have just uh, started uh, accepting um, a rhetoric that this is a commons. Firstly, cyber is not a commons. I had written a paper uh, on this. You're free to download it and uh, read it. It's called The Fallacy of the Cyber Commons. Second, uh, the literature on cybersecurity primarily try to push confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is what it says. These are the pillars. But post Snowden, we need to comment, uh, amend it by, call, uh, by talking about trust and resilience. That means, are these trusted products and how do you uh, say, like for example, let me, when you take it from a national security perspective, let me put it in this way. Why are people uh, who are taken in the military to guard the military trusted? The first this is, are they citizens of India? Okay, but just being a citizen, is it enough? You have to do a black on verification. After getting, then you have to have certain processes, you have to have certain certifications, uh, you have to pass certain exams. Then there is a surveillance which is put on you. There is a law which is applying on you. So when you apply all these corollaries on uh, you know, cyberspace and the critical information infrastructure, you'll realize that we are very hollow. Okay? And why is it happened and where, how it has happened? It's a study by itself which needs to be further. You know, uh, I will start off my opening remarks in this way because your answer will slowly start coming out when we have this particular talk with other experts too. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Sure. I'd also like to ask uh, Colonel KPM Das to share his views on this. We are not able to hear you, Colonel Das. Can you so you are mute. Can you hear me now? Just a moment. We are checking Can it you out. Hear me? Yeah. Uh, can we hear you? Please, can you speak now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I can get an echo, but that doesn't matter. See, I think what Colonel. Uh, uh, Pavitran said is bang on, yeah. Uh, but that is a 30,000 feet statement, but bang on everything that he said. Uh, the only small little tweak I'll make is that the terrorists today uh, were, and nation states, uh, I think you can't consider them as separate. Philosophically, you can't consider them as separate. It's all very amorphous and uh, and we have nation states in our immediate uh, vicinity, where 
you know, proxies and third parties are actually the ones who, who play the role. So when you do attribution, it's a big, big challenge to trace it back to a nation state. So this is a fundamental problem, but I completely agree with all the other opening remarks. The second thing now coming down to specifics, okay? And I, I'm not a policy person. I'm actually began life as a hacker 20 years back. So I'll give you the inside out view, right? Now, uh, critical infrastructure as a, as, a, as, a, as a concept came about when you realized that there were some things in the nation which were too big to fail, too important to fail. Yeah, And this term has been used by, by the federal bank in the US uh, during recession. I'm using the same term. So then what happened is we started realizing that absolute security is an oxymoron, right? You cannot secure everything. Not only can you not do that, you cannot even secure one thing 100%. Okay, so two dimensions. So therefore you said, okay, I have certain finite resources, you know, people, time, effort, leadership, governance, all capacity, all of that. And where do I allocate that? And that is when this notion came about critical infrastructure, which are the crown jewels of the nation state, which have to be protected as high priority. Uh, and I recall, you know, 12, 13 years back when I used to engage with other governments around the world, that, uh, you know, people started adding more and more sectors to critical infrastructure coverage. Yeah. Uh, Australia, for sure, is a great example. What began with three three sectors today, I think is like 13 or something. And we are heading the same way. So as the nations get digitized more and more and more, you know, till you become a digital nation like Estonia, we are heading that way. We are digitizing rapidly government to citizen, citizen to citizen, business to citizen, government to business, business to business. Your envelope is essentially increasing so that, and, and the resultant is that you now have a situation where your critical infrastructure is a huge subset of the total infrastructure. It's a big challenge. So there's a challenge of complexity and there's a challenge of scale. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Estonia, Colonel Das, and uh, Estonia had a, a cyber attack in 2007, so that's about 16 years ago, where a lot of their websites across the country, whether it was government or their banks or their media, were all brought down. And since then, you know, they have really upped their game a lot, and uh, Estonia is now one of the leading countries in terms of cybersecurity preparedness. So I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Karne Sudas, what has been Estonia's approach to dealing with this after their attack and how have they prepared themselves to be one of the leading countries in terms of cybersecurity preparedness? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. So, um, Long answer, short, the first and foremost is uh, putting your money where your mouth is. After receiving that attack, it was quite clear with the government and other organization that this probably shouldn't happen with us any further. Does it mean that it will not happen? 100% security is a myth. Okay, You can have the best systems on the face of earth, but if somebody is determined to bring the system down, it's just a matter of time and effort and maybe a little bit of luck, things can be brought down, unless if that system is not connected to internet. However, they really invested a lot of time, energy, money, and resources in bringing that system up. In fact, today, the NATO cybersecurity headquarters is based out of uh, Estonia. And they also invested a lot in uh, cybersecurity entrepreneurship. And uh, a lot of effort, which is missing in India, in terms of practical skilling of cybersecurity professionals. So these are the broad-based things, uh, along with a healthy mix of policy, policy implementation on grassroots, and also execution of that with regards to other NATO uh, countries, which are far superior to them in terms of cyber domain. 
uh, also estonia being a smaller size country compared to india it was much easier for them to implement a lot of uh, aspects but these are the short uh, answer for that question yeah uh, colonel das uh, could you try and tell us a little bit based on your uh, experience in the uh, industry in terms of how you think china has been approaching in this and compare and contrast that with our approach in india okay uh, so i again go back to um, colonel pavitran's points right we don't have your video colonel das one second we missed, yeah we have it now thank you is that okay yeah perfect thank you okay going back to colonel pavitran's point right now this is uh, this there uh, you know unlike air land sea and space yeah uh, cyber is a horizontal and a vertical both so this is unique about cyber right it is both inside and outside and therefore a uh, geopolitics has a huge play in cyber right and because it is polit so i am coming to the next uh, next corollary so it is political geopolitical now you have how how are countries like china organized versus other countries china is not a democratic state they don't have a democratic constitution they don't have problems like privacy versus security uh, legal versus illegal uh, state versus private Uh, you know all those dichotomies that you see in a classic democracy they don't have that and therefore their approach is completely different right so if you look at it for them it is a top down state driven state governed uh, you know governance or political structure for cyber the very fact that the cyber commission is part, largely is still part of the a strategic secure a strategic force right reporting to the central military commission tells you how they manage cyber so it's very very different see i'll tell you back in 98 i remember the those days there nothing called cyber it was called information warfare and i remember having attended a course in one of the western countries all military people and and there was there was a chinese team of three people led by that time a lefin girl called Zhuang Rongwen, Zhuang Rongwen, right? And it was it was a full Monday to Friday con, uh, course. And I I real I we used to think yeah how dumb these guys are, right? Look at it, twenty years and see where they are, right? I think that guy now is number two or number three in the Cyber Commission. These guys have learned they have learned from others and applied it for themselves. The second big difference, Sama Danda Beda. everything is okay there so you find as far as uh, their uh, technology capacity is concerned they have built it on what they could bring from outside from universities top universities worldwide from industries worldwide i don't know how many of you have used one of the routers from their companies i'll not name it and look at the command line the command line interface identical to another company in the west i won't take the name again so this so to compare china with others is different uh, it is run in a in a classic uh, way that military organizations run and therefore i wouldn't even like to compare because there everything is critical in fact i didn't add one thing the citizen in china is part of the critical infrastructure how do you like that right to be monitored to have surveillance and to be controlled yeah. thank you yeah um, now uh, colonel rajan now you mentioned that the stack that is used is important now a country like china after the snowden revelations they have decided that they would have total control over their stack whereas in india we don't Uh, we have uh, you know uh, whether it's the uh, cloud services like uh, amazon web services or microsoft or google and so on or whether it's the hardware whether it's in terms of whether it's the routers or the uh, networking equipment and so on or even the software that runs on top so all of these are not under our control right now and we don't seem to be anywhere close to being in a position to create alternatives which would 
be on par with those that are in use today to be able to replace them. So how do we deal with that then? Okay, you correctly summarized it. We don't control anything. And uh, the first fact is uh, we are totally dependent on others. So to the extent, I would say a uh, lot of our civil infrastructure, especially the power and our uh, you know, broadband infrastructure is totally controlled by China. Okay, the military infrastructure is mostly American. Uh, how did we reach there? And how do we get out of that? So the first is the realization that when we declare Atmanirbhar, there is this report called the uh, taken out on cyber power index by the, uh, the Kennedy Welfare Center. So if you compare the first to the second, you will realize that uh, India extends in a quadrant, there are four quadrants, wherein low capability, low in intent. Okay, 2020. In 2022, it is still low capability, low in intent. That means we have still not even exhibited an intent to create where we need to go. Uh, this can only happen when there is immense penetration in our governance structures. And uh, I primarily attribute it not because um, we are a democracy. It is because we lack two legislations. One is a Foreign Agents Registrations Act and the other is a Lobby Act. So what is the second act? A Lobbying Act. Lobbying Act, okay. Yeah. Because in the privacy uh, you know, debate, privacy is a fundamental right. We've got a law uh, which has now been, you know, uh, bought out, it's still, the rules have still to be articulated. So I was having this conversation with this young uh, lawyer today, Antara, out here. I said, did you study this act? She said, yes, I did. I said, does it protect your privacy? She says, no, it does not. So it's simple, as simple as that. Uh, so why did we bring that act? Okay, it, we had four iterations of that act, uh, and it is widely recognized glo uh, you know, globally your jurisdiction is on your territorial, in, uh, territorial jurisdiction. So the first primary thing is, if you do not localize your data, how does your law supply out there? Okay, if it goes to some other nation, how does your uh, law will ever apply there? So uh, my deduction here is, today we are digitally colonized, okay? And with all its, you know, corollaries, that means uh, with Data being, um, you know, uh, the increasing digitization with our eco entire economy going into, um, you know, uh, digitized or purportedly to be 100% digitized, we are hugely vulnerable. Our electoral systems can be totally manipulated because our entire social media is, uh, you know, Western. Okay, controller from out there. We've got people saying that they will, they will uh, influence our elections, all declared. Uh, so I would say we are hugely vulnerable and I don't think we are still shown intent other than the talk for Atmanirbhar. So places like C3S is where it should, that realization should dawn and we should, uh, you know, look for um, uh, maybe an action plan on how do we become Atmanirbhar. That's the first step. It's a huge fight. It's like a new war of independence. This is my thoughts. Okay. Thank you. So you're saying the first step is to get the legislation right, right? whether it's the okay. Foreign Agents Act or the Lobbying Act. Ah, I say this because I have been, um, uh, you know, part of multiple, uh, you know, talks at the policy making level. And you will realize that, for example, I'm just giving you one example. Okay, uh, we all know that who are the largest producers of smartphones in India. So if any policy decision is made for smartphones, the industry representatives will come. Okay, it might have an India appended at the end of it, but it's finally, you know, funded by those industries who are manufacturing those smartphones. That gentleman's words are very closely listened to by the government. Okay, he does not represent India. Likewise for our software industry. All our software industries are primarily dominated by another, uh, you know, organization. Okay, but when they come and sit on the table and the government starts talking to them, they do not represent Indian interests. Okay. So, if you have a Foreign Agents Registration, uh, Registrations Act or equivalent to that, that means uh, if you are representing some other, you know, interest, you have to declare, am I representing for this company, am I taking money from another foreign con uh, country, then even if you are a citizen, you have to excuse yourself and, you know, that's the act. 
lobbying also same it you have to declare right. whom are you representing here there are a whole bunch of indians who come and sit over there they don't represent india right so you will have the condition where we are yeah okay back to you colonel das what are your thoughts on this so uh, that is a statement of the problem okay i don't disagree with him at all but i would like to ask him for a moment for a moment let us uh, on this panel assume that you have low capability high intent okay because one is always looking into the future not the past okay for a moment let's say we are low capability high intent let's figure out what are the three or four things we we'll, we are going to do and be realistic you should, see the a journey always begins by knowing where you are today right so uh, this is an interesting problem to solve uh, very high intent okay it may not be true very high intent low capability let's see what we can do right and 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 there you will have a lot of interesting uh, options coming up right right and so if we move beyond to a stage where let's assume that the legislation is there for the sake of argument then we are still going to be a long way off in terms of having our own te technologies and capabilities to be uh, used in cyber security preparedness so that's still maybe a good 10 20 years away so even if we had the act what next yeah that... so yeah so what i and and i don't know i can't see the audience but i assume there are lots of people there i don't want them to go away with a very pessimistic view okay uh very high intent low capability if that is the start point there are there are number of strong things that you know a lot of wins favorable wins behind us one increasingly across the board ai quantum you know networking everything software is now going to play a major role right so you have the data plane you have the control plane you have the management plane the and given that software is something that is uh, that requires a lower threshold of entry as compared to getting you know silicon and you know a uh, lot of that we india stands a very good chance and i'll i'll suggest a met governance method as well okay india stands a very good chance it has immense potential it needs to harness it we'll come to that how to harness it the second favorable behind uh, wind behind us is open standards uh, i know for sure i work for a company i know how how much of pressure is there from the market not from the governments from the market to move into open interfaces open standards interoperability all of that modular architecture uh, flexibility extensibility this is the way the world is moving favorable wind for people like us who are at low capability but at high intent the third thing is uh, india has a history of one or two or three missions that we did right space is one the second is i know how many of you heard of a guy called sheshagiri in the mid 80s or early 90s who was the head of nic okay we had zero exports and y2k came at a very good moment uh, if you remember right y2k kick started and bootstrapped our software export industry and i keep telling in my meetings with the government with many other people that today we have to pick two or three areas and pump a lot of funding for research and go for it like we did for like sheshgiri did during nic early nic days and we did during y y2k days thanks to a person called late devang mehta nascom first nascom chief i mean let's spend more time on that low capability high intent yeah thank you karnal das mr karne sudas what would be your thoughts on this can you just repeat the question is are you talking how to improve the cyber security aspect in india because or can you just repeat the yeah, question the please? question is that you know what we use to uh, prepare our, for our cyber security is re largely relying on equipment and uh, software which does not belong to us it's not a stack that we own by it's not owned by indians now is that something of concern how would we deal with that if so 
so whether it is stamped uh, made in india or uh, like an iphone or whether it's stamped made in us or canada either ways end of the day you will have to do the uh, vulnerability, vulnerability assessment and checks on the code if there are bugs and like i mentioned earlier it doesn't matter in the world of software 100% security is a myth there are multiple ways and means of uh, gaining access to a system but having said that the basic fundamental questions is entrepreneurs in this uh, country are uh, dying because of lack of funds where will the fund come from the size of the economy is let's say 3.5 trillion dollar economy how much of that is infused in science and technology it's below 1% china is 2.5% plus on a 19 trillion dollar economy so most of the entrepreneurial young boys and girls that i have come across it's not they are not uh, hard working or intelligent or they are not skilled enough end of the day for the product to come out whether it's a software or a hardware you need funds where is the innovation fund and as we speak in fact this was part of my slide in my last talk in triple cs some of the top 10 asset managers which is primarily from us they have all left india why have they left india if this is a great place their presence here will only infuse innovation and entrepreneurship innovation and entrepreneurship is driven by private fund not necessarily only government government's main role is obviously to make sure that the policy and the systems are put in place but beyond that if somebody who is a high net worth individual they are the ones who are supposed to allocate some fund for a young boy or a girl and bring out the product where is it it's not happening and with the kind of recession coming up in north america things are going to be further tight so all this uh, theoretical talk in the air is all great that everything on the face of earth should be made in india but are we even talking about the basic fundamentals i mean we speak so much of the chinese they are excellent in terms of reverse engineering reverse engineering is an exceptional skill exceptional skill not engineers you are to be par engineer to reverse engineer something and make that again according to your requirement please give me a list of how many great reverse engineers do we have in this country precision engineering how many precision engineers do we have every boy or girl's dream irrespective of their engineering background is to get into software how many into mechanical how many into electrical how many into inter instrumentation and control systems how many into electronics so i think a lot of basic fundamentals are missing we have all when we are alone we become candid with each other with regards to how our education system is how impractical is it how theory driven is it is it is a young boy coming out of an engineering college is that individual job ready no they are not yeah thank you uh, mr karnesh sir so even if we have intent we have lots of challenges in terms of the technologies building the technologies even if we have the technologies we have challenges in terms of the uh, skill sets and the number of people with those skill sets so there are lots of challenges on that front now i'd like to uh, move on to something that's a little more um, uh, closer to what has happened now we have had some attacks on indian critical infrastructure in the uh, recent past so we had a, a, an attack on um, uh, tata power which was uh, supposedly a cyber attack it did not bring down any critical infrastructure but then it uh, resulted in some uh, data breaches so i'd like to ask you mr karnesh sudas how should indian corporates who are dealing with critical infrastructure approach cyber security preparedness what should they be doing to ensure that their assets assets under their control are safe especially when they are critical infrastructure assets i uh, we can't hear you sir karnesh das i think we lost your uh, volume i check with the team here can you hear me now yeah we can hear you now thank you sorry i was on mute so um with regards to the private sector especially the name that you took and few others they are all public listed companies so they have a larger board and fiduciary requirements with regards to take, taking care of uh, cyber systems because otherwise it will directly reflect on the next day's uh, 
BAC, NSE listing, right? But having said that, uh, they are also going through the same challenges that we discussed right now. Let's say right now, and this is a 20, 2019, 2020 number that India required 1.5 million trained cybersecurity professionals. Okay. And youngsters coming out of colleges are saying that we don't have a job. So isn't it funny? There is job opening of 1.5 million and youngsters are not getting job because obviously in between there is a problem with regards to skilling. And if you expect the name that you took, Tata Power, will they get into cyber skilling part? No, their job is power generation distribution. I'm not even sure if they're into generation distribution, right? So it's unfair to just let's put assume, it on. Let's assume that people are available, but from a, you know, uh, uh, organization point of view, in terms of their own strategies and plans to deal with uh, cyber security threats proactively to prevent them before they happen and to manage and uh, deal with them when they happen. What should they be doing? So they're all not just them. All the organizations already have a SOC security operation center. Either they have it themselves or they have the reliable partner who take care of SOC. But once the incident happens, there is something called as incident response and is the responsibility of their chief information security officer, if assigned one, or the concerned partner who is taking care of their SOC or NOC. And then they get into this various level of you know uh, addressing the issue. And once the issue comes up, it, it takes its own time of identifying and resolving it, right? Checking off a lot of, there are a lot of steps. So it's not that they are not doing it, but at the end of the day, it also depends on the quality of resources that you get and uh, monitoring of what the attack is because it, it, it doesn't declare that it's going to happen on x day it just randomly happens and then you come to know that something of this sort has happened so uh, easier said than done uh, it is a challenge that is going to be further uh, further we will see further complications on that with the induction of ai tools and a lot of other things it's further going to complicate it so uh, Main thing is, please invest a considerable amount of money in human resources, not just in skilling, but reskilling and upskilling. Uh, one of the prominent uh, cybersecurity expert, I don't know if it's Bruce Schinner or somebody else in the US, famously said that most corporates spend more on coffee vending machine than on cybersecurity. Right? So if that is the approach that they keep, then we can compare what is happening with the uh, Indian entity. Having said that, one last point uh, is the budget allocation for India for cybersecurity is approximately 400 crores to the Ministry of IT. But we are not sure in that 400 crores how much is invested in what, right? So we don't have the bifurcation. And even after that, uh, the AIMS attack happened. There was an attack on Sabdajan Hospital, I think, which was blocked. There were power grid uh, attacks in Ladakh. There was uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, there was the nuclear power plant where there was an attack. Uh, because these are protected systems, probably they don't want to leak anything to the open source or to the larger uh, crowd. But I'm still not sure that if this happens in next few months, are we fully prepared and ready to tackle it? Yeah, I think one um, thing that happened after the Tata power attack was that the uh, Central Electricity Authority came out with some guidelines and uh, many states like the um, like the states of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Haryana have also come out with their own cybersecurity policies and critical infrastructure entities uh, like TNAB have also published their own cybersecurity uh, policy and uh, have assigned people. I think Colonel Das also mentioned that BESCOM has a cybersecurity uh, general manager now specifically tasked with cyber cyber security so all these things are there on paper but yeah so i was just thank you for saying that the policy is there but is the policy implemented right, right. on grassroots level at a gra i don't see that right i think the other two speaker also said this in their own way that where is the imp so when it comes to implement and implementation and execution i think we have a long way to catch right declaring that we will be x trillion dollar economy by x date is it happening Right. So there are many, many challenges with regard to skilling, 
upskilling, reskilling. India is way behind with regards to uh, putting up rules and regulations on technology standardization. China is world number one. They are on various bodies defining the standardization of various products and services. Uh, we have a long way to catch at various levels. So I think uh, the people, the policy, the skilling, uh, and all of this probably will be resolved by increasing the size of the economy. You know, the, the, only with the scaling up of economy, you can invest more on science and technology, cyber, quantum, and other critical uh, techs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Colonel Rajan, I'd like to ask you, now, who should be responsible for cyber security? Should it be just the security department in an organization, or should it be more of a whole of organization approach? OK. So firstly, uh, let me try and explain to you how does this uh, cyber security, when you try to build a building, you have to start off by building the uh, base, OK, the foundations. So uh, let me just give you a theoretical scenario, uh, the power sector. Okay, a large parts of our, you know, the vast majority of power structure is with Chinese equipment. Okay, uh, they are hardware, they are software. So supposing uh, we have a hot war, or not even a hot war, we have a conflict with China. Okay, and they decide to uh, bring down our power sector uh, through some backdoors, vulnerabilities which exist. Okay, what will certain or NCIPC do once this power sector goes down? They try and identify, okay? And then what do, uh, what do they do? You need to patch it. And who takes out these patches? The OEM, okay? Because access control, et cetera, et cetera, has all failed. That is why the OEM, okay? Uh, will, in that situation, uh, the Chinese OEM provide us with patches? No, okay? So that's simple. So our strategy itself is wrong. That's why I said it has to be trusted and resilient. Trust us, is it our own? Because in geopolitical conflicts, we can't trust anyone else, right. okay? Right. We might have alliances, but that's a different subject altogether, okay? Uh, now, what is resilience? That means resilience is all security systems, physical or cyber, can always be breached by human ingenuity. Now, the point is when it is breached, can it almost real time, can you detect the breach? And then can you seal it? So if you take a fort, there comes a ram to breach the fort, you see it coming, you start attacking that ram, you ensure it doesn't reach there, even if it reaches, you have got, you know, your own material to go and breach it. Can you at that time uh, say, oh, this, uh, you know, fort has been built by China, so their army is attacking, can you also come and help us breach it? You can't. It's the same corollary. Okay. Upskilling, etc., etc., comes after creating that base. So when you create that base, your economy itself grows because you become a manufacturing economy. You get trusted products, you get resilience, and you improve your economy. Now that rhetoric, no, it will all be bought and imported and then someone else will come and breach, might not happen, okay? And even if you create, now, now comes Estonia. Let me go back to Estonia. Estonia is a small, minuscule country, primarily by uh, with Western ICT equipment. Supposing they were supposedly attacked by Russia. If the entire ICT equipment of Estonia was Russian, what would NATO do? Nothing. They can do nothing. Okay? Because Russia finally controls it. Now I will also take on one more thing. Many people, because I've seen these debates go round and round and round. Oh, what about South Korea? What about Japan? What about UK? Now these are all minnows in the world. Okay? Compared to India. What is our national aim? If your aim is to raise the economic this of people and bring the GDP, PPP, per capita income up, okay? Japan, 44,000 uh, US dollars. South Korea, 22. We are around 3,000. China is around 10,000, 10 to 11,000. You see the size of China, how the f it evokes fear? So even if we bring it half of South Korea, will it just happen just like that? People will be scared of us. Okay, because when you have that economic heft, so we have to get our strategy first correct. Otherwise, we will never rise. Uh, I look at things in a slightly different way. People might have different approaches. But if uh, what I say, if it sounds logical, I am ready to listen to logic to counter that, you know. Back to you. Yeah. But in the here and now, I mean, what you are talking is, say, a way we should approach things and 
that's going to be something that would have a long term uh, play out right but in the here and now what should we be doing given that you have to you know uh, wrestle with the realities of today yeah the realities of today is frightening okay because uh, you are trapped because where are we like i said our military equipment is primarily russian okay our civil infrastructure is i told you in the in the information sector is primarily chinese our military infrastructure in the information sector is american you tell me what, uh, what you know we, we have only announced atmanirbhar but we have not been able to move right so what so so, we, so you know i would say we are highly vulnerable mm. we might become you know we might it's like you know we want have to manipulate our way and ensure there's no conflict in the short term but we have to get that atmanirbhar off otherwise we'll keep getting in increasingly dependent let me also add on one more thing you will know a harari i said in future you don't when if you have the data of a whole nation you don't need to bring in armies to conquer them because second you have the data of that whole nation your politicians your bureaucrats your military generals everyone will uh, you know dance to the other country's tune so we we have a lot to do but in the in the interim i suggest because the, the, there is no need for war at this stage mm -hmm. they already control i told you we, we can't even protect our basic uh, privacy is a fundamental right now a nation which cannot put, protect its own fundamental right we have a problem i hope i you realize the enormous uh, enormity of our problems yeah yeah the uh, you know enormity of the problem can make us feel very pessimistic about how to go about doing things but i am trying to see what are the two or three things that you would recommend we should do as of now okay so i think uh, when you think about it firstly all laws or policies etc starts off with a law okay a law uh, which determines how do we go about defending you know the whole edifice is built upon the constitution uh, now if you get the law and your pol when, when the law is on the correct side the policy will come on to the correct side and when the policy comes on the correct side you start building with the foundation which the government has already announced uh, you know um, atmanirbhar what is missing in that atmanirbhar is a strategic venture capital fund okay money follows money the world doesn't uh, you know second you have a strategic venture capital fund they will align to creating indian infrastructure from layer 1 to 6 today which is missing layer 1 to 6 is totally occupied by the united states and china they are the only two players in layer 1 to 6 we are all playing in layer 7 okay application layer so for layer 1 to 6 when the uh, strategic venture capital fund comes all the other people who want to make money will join in that strategic venture capital fund but then the control will remain indian okay it's a simple thing which needs to be done that is the only small thing which is missing rest everything will start off when people realize all the world will come to here to make money okay money follows money they don't care but you have to get your prop, you know strategy correct i we we even so written a book about so, it so what you're saying is first we have to get that part of it right in terms of how we fund it and then drive atmanirbhar and that Absolutely. will play out over time so i do not fully agree with uh, dominic when he says that we don't have good engineers the entire huawei city etc you will realize was built by indians okay how are people are building the, the infrastructure they, they they just you know we are the people who build you look at uh, you know uh, colonel das i remember him he was a legendary coder he was a legendary officer when he was in the army but we lost him today he is sitting in cisco today if we had an atmanirbhar company we would have been heading it same with dominic <laughs> back to you sir yeah colonel das what would your thoughts be on this in terms of what we should do in the here and now to improve our cyber security preparedness given our realities today so you are on mute yeah we are not able to hear you sorry yeah one area where we have not talked about and to make this conversation wider is about culture right so if you look at the annual cyber security report we publish it uh, cisco publishes it uh, after talking to people around the world talking to customers of all the countries that today the last report that i read of all the countries reports that i've seen numbers in the organizational orientation towards cyber security india is ranked number 
Okay, and I'll explain why. This is about culture. From the time that economy opened up in 91-92 till now, especially our ICT sector and tech sector is now engaged with customers around the world. We have imbibed some global good practices. If you look at even Indian enterprises today, Indian companies, they are best in breed as far as InfoSec is concerned, their own internal security is concerned, right? So I think culture is a major, major element that is right from school, high school, college, everywhere. This basic threshold of what is called awareness and cyber hygiene is the start point. And, and I have some numbers, I don't know exactly, but it's a majority. It's like 65 to 70 percent of all cyber attacks have happened in the first instance because of poor cyber hygiene. Yeah, basic stuff. It is not some high tech script that someone has written. It is basic cyber hygiene stuff that is not taken care of. The second thing is because we are growing so big, 60 or 65 percent of Indian economy is from the small and medium enterprise sector, small and medium. We are a nation of small entrepreneurs, right? The worry, the concern is that these people are now getting digitized and getting included in the value chain, economy value chain. So if you pick up ISRO, you pick up DRDO or MOD, at the tail end of the supply chain, you will find one fellow who's a you know 10 crore company which is sitting there. It is our, our responsibility uh, collectively as a nation to secure the entire chain, including the mom and pop shops and all of them because unless we get that right you know we have a problem at hand the third thing is and i refer to what uh, dominic said and i completely agree with him there is a gap can this gap be bridged yes it can be bridged will it require significant funding it requires massive funding the kind of funding that individuals cannot bring in you know the the student cannot bring in even the college cannot bring in yeah. So, in terms of return on investment, is it is it worth it? I think it will give you the highest return on investment. And I, uh, some of the people I talk to in Delhi, Department of Telecom, Metis, I tell them that three to four years from now, we should become the cyber operations center of the world. Like we did Y2K in 2000, we need to be the testing and cyber operations center of the world because a lot of stuff basic stuff in cyber is going to be run virtually remotely right and these those are very good training grounds for our people uh, so i i'm looking at it positively you know and and uh, you know i i smell the coffee of course but clearly we have work to do we have immense potential we have things which many other countries don't have many of them yeah uh, so, That's so where, should, where should the funding come from, Colonel Das? I mean, you have talked yeah. about massive funding yeah, yeah. that's required. Where do you Go see it coming from? Is it the private sector that should step up and look at this as an opportunity? Especially since you're saying we can be the cybersecurity supplier to the world? Yeah. Yeah, so I go back to what Dominic said, right? See, government cannot fund in everything. Government can put in enabling frameworks. For example, if you chip in with any amount more than 10 crores, funding for pure R&D, not product development alone, research and development as well, in the labs, small labs, centers of excellence, tax-free, everything free here. You need to change your entire excise duty tax structure and look at how people will come swarming in. Yeah, Imagine these are people who can't afford to take home salaries as founders. They can't pay rents. They can't pay for the electricity. But in something like six months to one year, they'll turn around a prototype, which these big fellows can pick up. And you know, assuming that it's a fair relationship, both can make money. I, I, th I think we need, to, we need to head in that direction. OK. Uh, Mr. Karne Sudhas, what are your thoughts on the funding part of it? Where do you see the funding coming in? So uh, with regards to funding or with regards to some other aspects, the fundamentals itself is shaken up. And to take the quote and read from Colonel Das, he spoke about uh, MSME, whether it's India or US, the spine of a nation is MSME, right? They they drive a lot of things and create a job of five or 10 people. Right, but like, where do they get the funding? I mean, yeah. do, so let me give you have the money to invest, so, right? So, so 
the government of india owes msme sector 10.7 lakh crores of which 81% belongs to msme so i have done a job i have given it to them but i have not got the payment with regards to funding part no, the, i there agree are two with aspects you to i agree here. with you one is angel investment the other is private equity venture capital angel investment it's open source information you can check it there are caesar serious reservations with angel investment community because of angel tax right so if bunch of us have 50 lakhs each and we create a small angel fund of let's say 3 crores or so and there is a tax on it for a very high risk investment why will i go for it right i will look for if so, i'm really so what, passionate so about you saying that the private sector is not going to be able to invest it is not the private invest uh, sector sir it is ultra high net worth individuals it is the family offices and so on and so forth along with a lot of american european companies investment management firms there are dedicated vc firms pe firms sovereign wealth investment funds like for example tamasek in singapore and Nor norwegian fund these are the world's largest funds norwegian sovereign fund is in couple of trillion dollars why are they not here if this is an exciting place because your very policy and tax terrorism is scaring them okay. look at the number uh, of indian themselves uh, uh, debate now uh, in terms of you know where the funding should come from whether it should be from the within the country or outside the country i think we are also in the country as account. well uh, i uh, i'm glad that you raised it please listen to what narayan murthy said 2 3 days back he himself is saying that we need couple of billion dollars for innovation right he himself yeah. has a fund called catamaran ventures which is uh, his family office yeah so there are a lot of indians themselves are investing in this yeah we are running out of time thank you mr karnesh sir i have one last question which uh, i would like to ask given that there are people here from the services uh, uh, why is the uh, defense not treated as critical infrastructure is there any reason for that colonel rajan yeah so our critical infrastructure you know if you look at the policy firstly um, for example the ports okay at the time i was an advisor in the home ministry and our dg ncipc reached out to me he said can you just influence them to volunteer because unless they declare that they are critical infrastructure and ask me for help i cannot as per the act you know help them so <laughs> the the military has got its own systems and they will not ever come under the ncipc it's just a question of okay but the military definitely is a critical infrastructure and they also have to follow policies like i said but like i told you today they are totally under someone else's grip for you know what would be the reason okay thank you yeah. colonel das your thoughts on that yeah so uh, it is assumed that defense is a de novo critical infrastructure right it is also assumed that they have the capacity to defend themselves okay uh, and i tend to believe the later as well i uh, you know in my work with few other countries right including ministry, ministries of defense in few other places especially asia pacific i have found something very interesting wherever cyber security bootstrapping and scaling up is required massively in terms of socs and so on and critical infrastructure they have leveraged the signals there because endemic uh, by by its very nature uh, you know they are they are operationally oriented to defend you know i mean it is 24/7 you know when a telephone rings that bugger knows where who's calling right it's a 24/7 cultural thing so i've had the discussion with some very senior people in the government as well that seriously bootstrap your capacity through uh, through the military you know either you build your territorial army cyber you know uh, you will have to amend the act because this act no it it worker will want to become a ta member amend the act marginally it's not it's not about money at all it's about few other things yeah. thank you and, thank you dr and and, dr. and we have a whole you can have a whole workforce built on that thank you I think we have had a very lively discussion, and now I'd like to open up the floor to questions from the audience. Yeah, general. Yeah, yeah, sure. Could you use the mic, Mr. Shivaram? Yeah. 
See, some of the incentives and support measures presently available for enhancing scientific R&D. All of you should note this because there is some wrong information given by you. 100% write-off of revenue expenditure on R&D under Section 35 of the Income Tax Act. 100% write-off of capital expenditure on R&D in the year in which expenditure is incurred. Weighted deduction of 200% of expenditure incurred in approved in-house R&D facilities. So like that it goes on. Nothing that is spent on R&D is taxed. On the contrary, more than 100% deduction is given in certain sectors where R&D expenditure is incurred by companies. So this you must know very clearly. Yeah. It's not that India is taxing r and Similarly, in regard to angel fund, there is there was some confusion, but that confusion has been completely removed as far as the angel fund tax was concerned. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. So, so General me, no, 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 let me let yeah. me clarify this, sir. Sure. You're correct, sir. These tax exceptions exist. Now, let me take a ICT company, okay, uh, which is creating a software stack for maybe let me say creating a firewall. He's creating a firewall. Basically, what you do is you employ uh, work, you know, software engineers. There is no recognition that these software engineers are doing an R and D, and they're, you know, that particular. Because I myself have run a company. I have got no exemption. No, no, that's why any software you develop cannot be taken as R and D. R and D has got certain definition, acceptable definition. And these words of R and D So there is a difference between this, uh, you know, services sector where they are create doing software development for other people and someone who is trying to create a product. There is no such recognition here in India. So in that sense, sir, let me tell you, sir, we can never create a ICT, uh, you know, ecosystem in India and, uh, as per that tax policy. Infosys is a services company. It is not a product company. Yeah, maybe we can have this discussion um, offline after that. Yeah, General Brar has a question there. Thank you. Uh, there is a question and one or two points on the discussion, which was very good. Uh, I think the question on defense, why defense is not included, apart from all other uh, reasons, uh, our network is isolated from internet. So that helps to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, my point on this, you know, funding, Atam Nirbhar, I have fully endorse the view of Kalapavi that, you know, unless you have your own everything, wherever you may start small. Now, uh, it is a very simple example, but I, I, like I intend always saying things which have been done by myself or I have seen it being done. Atan never, like I was handling tank. I can't give you the figures. There was a certain percentage of import item which was there in our various types. In one, it is almost close to 100% in past one year, which is older model. A newer model, it has reached 95% of indigenization. Now, this 15-20% increase in uh, indigenization has happened because things stopped coming from Russia. Now, that push was given by, I don't want to take credit, but was given by me and I had the right people at the place. And all this energized the MSMEs. All this is MSME work. And I can give you another I think, example I have quoted earlier also. The radiator of a tank is a complex equipment. Uh, we were importing it from the uh, from Russians for one crore. And it is a very complicated design. So there was an Indian company, but it was failing again and again and again. But I was always overriding, overruling DGQ, everybody to give it a chance. It finally succeeded last year. Now that radiator is being supplied by that company for 35 lakhs, one third the cost, and that's how that company. So you know, uh, I don't know about the larger policy issues, but you need people at the implementation level who can make things do. So you know, that's how you turn uh, defense equipment from a foreign one to indigenize, and somebody who starts then making or indigenizing, then he starts making a new product and upgrading it. So I can give you many more examples than that. 
but the question which i have is since it is an interesting topic and uh, one is also listening on cyber security you see the security is ever evolving in cyber security also there is one dimension i think may have been addressed or uh, you are the experts uh, you know if this is to be secured we put up post like an army around and put lmg and everything around and secure it but with technology what has happened somebody can just use a drone and <laughs> drop a bomb so you know he changes the dimension it makes the other people irrelevant similarly in cyber security i think of course we need to secure data we need to secure networks we need to secure everything but there is something which is happening through social media your cognitive dimension in which you know uh, you don't have to secure data but if you buy me out i am at the critical place or if you are looking at larger uh, the trend of population which side it is going which can swing things so you know you don't need to hack data you can just swing the mood so you know the cyber dimension on the cognitive front uh, because it is just free flowing and with free internet the social media the thoughts what all is happening you don't know what one is thinking so i don't want to highlight i'm not a writer but i think democracy will get threatened because because of open uh, everything it is will turn into an anarchy <laughs> because everybody is free flowing so that's a different dimension of uh, discussion so but i thought maybe i'll say to it sure sure go ahead so if i can come back to you sir since 2013 so the cyber security world is primarily divided into that bc and ad by before snowden after snowden before snowden people used to believe that there is a air gap and the army has the military primarily has said we are air gapped but during snowden revelations is clearly brought out that people are putting hardware and software to you know jump through the air gap but we have continued to stick to the bc rhetoric there is no air gap sir so your drone is already dropping bombs into the military and we have done nothing zero things about it for what would be the reason uh, so uh, that takes part of one then the cognitive part is basically to do with privacy loss okay uh, privacy loss of localizing data and clouds so one is the legal part the other is the technological part we have failed in both we have done uh, neither of them so we are highly vulnerable and that's why i said say elections can be ma easily manipulated there are multiple evidences where it is being manipulated okay and uh, this aadhar unfortunately see what has happened is this is biometrics now ai enabled weapon systems so ai systems cannot recognize between people but what they can recognize is biometrics okay and this increased use of biometrics that is precisely why the us and western countries have not gone for those systems we have purchased all these uh, uh, stuff from china and us and using it and all our biometrics are all over the place we are highly vulnerable as a military i hope it reply you know answers parts of uh, part of your question thank you sir yeah commodore wasan somebody there okay okay now just one point about uh, this innovation fund which all of you agree is most important you know it appears that only whether the private industry will come in whether the state will pump in mr shivaraman also has discussed this issue earlier uh, point is that china two months ago or three months ago created a india innovation fund and you know all the citizens started putting money into this fund why can't india start a india innovation fund where if each guy gives 1 rupee you have 1.4 billion dollars each guy puts 10 rupees you have 10 billion dollars for india innovation fund why can't this be done sure, it's a very sir. simple answer to your you know requirement of funding so sir let me come back to you uh, see it is not the lack of funds okay there is a capital uh, risk capital which is available for any innovation provided that innovation is worth its while india's problem is we have not created the basic infrastructure to get into the digital era that is from layer 1 to 7 okay the routers uh, uh, you know the firewalls uh, you know the clouds blah blah etc etc now no other nation is going to put money for india to create that it is only india who will have to create it for itself now therein comes a strategic venture capital fund 
Now let us take the example of the United States. They have got a fund, one of the oldest funds is called InQtel. That fund is run by the CIA. Now if you, it has got a you know, websi website also, it says for every one dollar which we put in, the rest of the private venture capital ecosystem will put nine dollars. Because now they have, this InQtel has identified that company and that product as critical to the United States, they know the chance of this failing is very, very low. So they will all jump in, okay? Uh, that is how it is created. We lack the catalyst. And I have even written a book on this, but somehow it has not happened. <laughs> Thank you. The Anusandhan National Research Foundation Bill 2023 seeks to set up a 50,000 crore fund with a sizable contribution from the private sector to seed, grow, and promote R&D in the country. It was universally supported in the parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sivaraman. That's so, interesting. Let me just make this let me okay. Clarify this. Go ahead. So there are certain funds, sir, which are in India, but they are not administered by venture capital uh, you know, professionals. No, no, hold on, hold on, sir. Let me answer this also, because we carry on a wrong impression. That's the only reason I make this intervention. So the best, see, innovation is a high-risk business. The best of the venture capital funds, the success rate is 10%. That means out of every 10, only one will succeed. But that one will create so much of money that it will offset the rest of the nine. This is not something which, uh, you know, professors or, uh, you know, government servants, etc., are capable yeah. of doing, which are governed by the GFR. They cannot do this. Okay? And it also fools proof that venture capital manager from being corrupt or being, getting influenced by someone because he is on a very small pay. His is uh, incentive where if the fund succeeds. He carries a take, you know, percentage of the Performance carry. fee. Performance fee. Yes. And that is how the whole world is built. This whole infrastructure. We, because, uh, you know, bureaucracy wants to have control over things, will come up with policies where, you know, people, I call it the license Raj method of funding. This will never succeed. Like, yes. Uh, yeah, the, what we need from the government is a strategic venture capital fund where the government puts in the money, which is owned by, you know, by maybe our CAPSEC or IB or some such intelligence organization, military, etc. When they put in the money and take a stake in that company, that company will also be told you cannot sell out once we are investing into you. Okay. And out of which? Okay. Out of 10, only one will succeed. Only a venture capital manager will be able to do that because he has to succeed, his fund has to succeed. That is what we need from the government, which other governments are doing, all democracies are doing, all you know, communist governments are doing. We will expect the same from the government of India. No, I want a venture capital manager to run it, sir. A professional venture capital. Ha, if it is a... So, okay. So when you say R&D, sir, we had a blank check for DRDO so many years. How much did it succeed? The DRDO. It was totally backed by the government. Okay, so... So, hmm. so if it is a venture capital back fund, I have no issue. You will see, realize it will succeed. I think we can take this offline. Yeah. There are a couple of other questions. Can I add here uh, to yeah. further to what uh, Kanal Pavitran mentioned earlier? Uh, I don't know how many, it's an open source information. The database for Aadhaar is MongoDB. And the first check for MongoDB was written by InQtel. So where is IB and all those agencies? I mean, are, are we saying that there is no other database on the face of earth other than Mongo? <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, talking about scientific funding, I sit in a university and I have, <laughs> I have felt so much trouble getting money from the scientific agencies. 
uh, I'll tell you what is happening in the past. So, Department sure, of Science sure, and sure. Tech, which disburses funds for uh, a lot of SNT activities, it has been shifting its bank account from Bank of Maharashtra, which sits in Pune, to somewhere else in Delhi. Because somebody somewhere in the, up there in Delhi realized that why should you have a DHT bank account which disburses money to all the researchers in the country to sit in Pune. And perhaps the reason was that since there is a NIC office in Pune, next to Pune University, somebody had opened a bank account back then and in the past one or one and a half years, there hasn't been a single penny disbursed to any of the scientific researchers. So whatever the Anusandan bill uh, is talking about, it is right now planning to shift that entire sum that was earlier disbursed under various programs of Department of Science and Technology into this one big mother load of uh, acquired by. The reason is that, again, as uh, Colonel Pavitran said, uh, there is hardly any funding beyond a certain limit. The upper cap for any Indian startup funding is right now around 15 to 20 million dollars. The moment any startup and its valuation goes beyond that, your startup is then completely dependent on foreign uh, capital. So look, uh, look for instance, Skyroot, uh, the most celebrated of the space startups, raised uh, nearly 60, 66 million dollars from Singapore. Uh, do we have any capital mobilized from Mumbai, from any of our financial markets? No, any of HNI is putting it by us. Thank you. One last question uh, over there, yeah. <coughs> I think there's a term called elite capture. You have talked up around it, uh, I think what Colonel Pavitran talked about, intent, it comes from there. I just want to quote, the British intelligence recently, sometime back said that the Chinese have done a massive elite capture in Britain. And you may be, I mean, you are fully aware, in America, most of the professors from the top universities do at least two to three months or they are in the payrolls of the Chinese. So. It is the superpower attitude that they have built over two, three decades back. And in India, what we see is even in defense, we talk of big things, but most of our critical aspects, I mean, in my uh, domain, I was told to go and see a few of them. And many of the people who are defending or who are in charge of that very uh, proudly tell me this is a black box. You know, a very critical software which is being used by the defense forces or some uh, very top, even I, I can tell you when DRDO establishments and various things, they are very proudly telling me that this is a black box being run by a company in US or in the West. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, Colonel Das also talked about geopolitics. I think that's a mix of a lot of things. If you get the intent right, I think uh, there are enough experts like all of you who can tell them what is to be done and how it has to be done. But the intent is missing and moment that is sorted out, I mean, I think as you said, money is not a problem or nothing is a problem. In this country, talent is not a problem, money is not a problem, nothing is a problem. But the intent is a problem. We have to start thinking that we have to behave like a superpower or we have to behave in a particular manner. Moment that is done, everything else will fall in place. I mean, you look, look at China's uh, uh, last three or four decades of journey, where they came from and where they are now. I mean, their GDP was behind us, right? So, I mean, they liberalize, uh, liberalization happened in 78 and for us it happened uh, 13 years later. So sometimes people say we are just 13 years away from them. But we lost this intent game. Moment we catch up on the intent game, rest everything is possible. Probably we may not take even 13 years to match up. but. That intent has to get, okay. I mean, even today, we are running after fellowships being given by the West. And they not only give fellowships, they every year they hold a, a dinner party for which, you know, it doesn't cost much. I can, ho I can host that party, to be honest. And what do they do? They do brainwash. Yeah, thank you. So we have I to I think we're running out of time. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Colonel Das, uh, thank you, Mr. Karnes Das, and thank you, Colonel Rajan, for this uh, excellent discussion. Very insightful, lots of points raised, and lots of food for thought. So thank you very much, and I hope uh, the audience also enjoyed. Please give them a big hand. Thank you very much, Mr. Satinar Anand, for
moderating that session so thoughtfully. It was really lovely, and all the speakers as well. I'd like to request you to felicitate uh, Mr. Pavitran Ranjan, and we'd like to thank Mr. Dominic uh, Karnesudas and Mr. KPM Das for joining us online. Thank you. Now, um, Professor Gurmeet Singh was supposed to give our inaugural yesterday, and he couldn't make it due to some unforeseen reasons. So he's uh, gracefully agreed to give a special address right now today. So over to you, sir. Y can you hear me? Yes. Am I audible, please? Yes, sir. Yes. Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. Fine. Uh, well, I wanted to, I wanted to come at the inaugural function, but then somehow, because of some reasons, we couldn't participate. And I thought I'll be joining you during the valedictory. Uh, I've been listening to all our learned speakers, and I would like to first compliment my old friend, Commodore R. S. Vasan who has been, after superintending from Indian Navy, has been very active in various uh, areas of uh, defense research, and he's been organizing very wonderful uh, seminars related to our defense issues. And now, in that line, the one which is paving the way for high technology is a wonderful initiative. And I have seen the topics and the speakers who have participated. It must have been a very enlightening one, though I was not there on two, but a couple of lectures I did listen to. And uh, all areas have been covered, in fact. Now, when we look at it, I, we keep telling, I'm, since I'm from the university stream, I keep telling our students when they come, so what job are we going to be doing uh, when people come after doing their management or computers or uh, research in electrochemical areas, which is essentially on semiconductors and device making. So I tell them that, you know, if I tell you you have to go for this industry, you will never know. I keep telling them that 50% of you would not know which job you will be heading in uh, five years from now. The way things have been changing, it has been changing so fast. I don't know how many of you would have seen the uh, our uh, DRDO lab in Kulpur, where we design signatures for various uh, defense equipment, our air caps, tanks, and others. And uh, this is not, this keeps on changing. Now, way, the way technology is changing, it is amazing. And in my own computer science department, they keep on developing new programs, new areas, and uh, sitting in their own department, they can catch what is there in our computer center and which department is putting on the board, what kind of a seminar being planned in discussion. They kept everything sitting at one place. So this is what is going on if you extend it further from one country to another. What one country is doing, other is knowing fully well that where exactly they are heading to. So therefore, we need to be very alert in uh, developing these things in a manner that it is not only that we, we develop an art by which we will be able to capture what others are doing. But we also need to have a kind of a wall by which other countries should not be able to know. Somebody was talking about firewall, which is being uh, uh, installed everywhere these days. They should not be able to know what we are doing. And therefore, the race is knowing everybody, knowing everything what others are doing, and not letting them know what we are going to be doing. If that is one, I suppose uh, that country will move forward. And we are not doing too badly in that. Uh, people talk about Israel doing very well, and they are uh, they are they are capturing every every country's information, but they, their information is not very easy to get. But let me tell you, they have also faltered. So therefore, uh, what is needed is I will put it from the university perspective. Though we are doing in that. What is needed is a high-ended research in all these areas where you have talked about. Artificial intelligence is one. Big data analysis there. We have 3D printing, smart manufacturing, aerospace, semiconductors, marine engineering, electric vehicles. 
Now, if you look at it, the, the scientific community at large, I'm not saying everybody, they sometimes they show a very depressive picture that, well, if electric vehicles are going to be there all over, who is going to be conducting the charging process? Where will so many charging stations will come in? And how would we manage? This was the scenario five years back. And now if you go to any smallest possible town in our country, you will find these e-rickshaws everywhere. And we are managing very well. The need is the charging stations which are being developed, they need to be the one which will look into, which should take care of the green charging processes, which is not being attended to. Therefore, the need is that in the university systems, we need to pump in more money towards research so that these big companies, rather than paying money to foreign countries, foreign institutions for developing their own products, they need to develop confidence in university system so that they work for them. Now, every university in our country has been now allowed to set up a startup center. Smaller ventures are coming in there to test their own products. They are testing their own devices. So if we need some, if we put in more money in this particular sector, this can pay very rich dividends at a very low cost. This is one area we need to take care of. And uh, in my opinion, these big companies people were talking about, big money people were talking about. Uh, of course, it is required, but then if part of it is diverted to the universities, our Indian universities in these areas have done very well. And I'm talking about universities and IITs and all high ended uh, centrally funded institutes. Though funding has improved, but this is not there to the extent which our scientists and senior level academicians would require, would need. That is not there. To that extent, if it could be done, probably this will give you very rich dividends uh, in all areas. Green and, uh, and uh, hydrogen is one useful area. I was seeing a, uh, a documentary and an interview of our minister, Mr. Nitin Gadkari. He was, telling a, he was telling that this is something where we don't have to worry about. We need to develop. and our Indian scientists are so good that whatever shall be needed, they'll come out with the solution. This kind of a confidence we need to generate in our uh, scientific community. And if to sum up, I'll put it in uh, two minutes because we are already behind schedule. If confidence is given to the university industry interaction part, I suppose in uh, one fourth of the money that they are spending elsewhere, University research system will give them the right desired results, which will be in all sectors, including defense, which is the need of the art. And uh, let me tell you, we have not done very badly. We are performing as good as any other country is doing in defense area. And we are gradually building our own ways. Uh, people often talk about, uh, don't buy Chinese goods, don't go to China. Well, don't look at China. It's, it's not that if we stop doing totally, will be nowhere. I'll give you one example. We are the largest manufacturers of generic medicine in the world. And we are the, our medicines are rated as the best in the, the world. But where do we get these? How do we manage? Till about five years back, four years back, 75% of our active pharmaceutical ingredients were imported from China. Now, if we stop bringing to zero, our whole generic industry will go to zero level. So therefore, what is the need of the RA? to reduce our dependence on them, have more inbuilt, more inbuilt research, and have less dependency on other countries, and build our own. And this is what we are doing. We are doing pretty fast, let me tell you, in all sectors. Semiconductor was one area where we were bothered about that Ukraine war is there now, and we'll not be able to get to that. The way we have overcome this, I think it's an example. Uh, if you look at the data, you'll be amazed at how fast we have done it. All this has come up through MSCME and the university supported research. So therefore, my single point will be that part of it, if it is devoted to university and uh, our technology centers, I suppose they will give you much better, faster, cheaper, and more durable, useful dividends, uh, which you are all looking forward to, uh, in a at a very less cost. So I I compliment. Comrade Vasan and the 
Chennai Center for China Studies that we are uh, organizing all this. This particular one, Paving the Way for High Technology, is one such useful, useful, very useful seminar where probably old topics have been covered. I, I was surprised when I looked at the all areas that how could they pick up so many in a span of, how could they fit in in a span of two days where all these will be dealt with in greater detail. My compliments and I hope it will result in some fruitful uh, deliberation and recommendations to the concerned ministries. Thank you very much. And my compliments to Commodore Wilson for doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for that. Now I'd like to invite uh, Mr. L.V. Krishnan to deliver the valedictory session. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be asked to sum up the event lasting over two days with so many different lectures and diverse topics. I don't really think I should attempt a sum up because that's going to be quite time consuming. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight a few things and come up with some of my own thoughts. But I would urge you to listen to the various talks in the YouTube version. Especially I would single out Ambassador Smita Purushottam's keynote address. She spoke with great feeling and called for technology to be at the heart of the national security document. The reason she believes China is of the view technology is the primary productive force fueling economic growth and is also the basis of core combat capability. So that is what makes China try to rise to the level that it believes it could make it be, reach the, make it reach the top of the world. Now, if you have to do that, energy and semiconductors are the basic inputs in today's technology and also for the emerging kinds. There are also new technologies that are likely to emerge. Now, Ambassador Balakrishnan told us that a good beginning is being made by India to get ahead in SNT. Several steps are being taken, he said, for clear plans, for making funds available, and for monitoring the progress constantly. Now, beside government support as announced, it's very clear that private sector must be enabled was brought out by many to work towards the plan implementation. This is happening, but at a very modest pace. Now, let me tell you what I think about the situation now. Development of modern technology happens on an experimental scale in R&D institutions, but its practical implementation on, implementation on industrial scale requires new materials and instrumentation in substantial quantities. Many of these are produced by low tech. So high technology actually depends upon low tech. We have been talking about high technology, but we have not been talking about the low technology inputs required for high technology. A cursory example, I would say, is that a test search based on the eight-digit harmonized system of codes 
for some of the new materials and new instrumentation so that we are presently dependent on imports, mostly from China. These are the ones that are required to operate the high technology, even to do R&D in high technology. Now consider solar power, for example, on which we have laid so much hope. Our present capacity, as was mentioned in the morning also, is about 70 gigawatts. But what we expect to be the requirement in about 25 years from now is 1,000 gigawatts. That means we have to add about 40 gigawatts each year. We do not yet produce the polysilicon required, the basic material for the solar panels. Mind you, in late 1970s, after the oil shock experience, India did produce solar cells and modules. I do not know if the wafer was produced here or imported. But at least we had the technique to produce solar cells and modules. Now, we need to raise substantial production capacity of the polysilicon production now. A 30,000 ton per year plant is being set up but many more will be required. We don't know when this plant would come up again. But 3,000 tons of polysilicon can support only one gigawatt of solar panels. So when we are talking about 1,000 gigawatts, you know how much is required. Now we have a flourishing chemical industry for production of various organic chemicals. A wide range of new organic chemicals and high purity gases are now required on demand for several high-tech industries, including the few small industries which are talking about packaging. Now, these new chemicals are required for larger semiconductor plants, battery production, fuel cell production, data centers, additive manufacturing, and so on and so forth. Now, initial incentives for this part of the local industry must also be considered. Now, recently, ISRO bought a large 3D printer from France. Initial requirements of consumables like metal, powder, or wire, and organic filaments, as well as lasers for quick melting and drying operations will all be naturally imported, but soon enough, they have to be produced in the country. There are about 50 research groups in 32 institutions now engaged in quantum technology. Their work requires single photon sources, single photon detectors, lasers, mirrors, telescopes, and the like. The demand is bound to grow if this R&D is actually going to be materialized and turned into actual operating let us say, techniques. Now, do we make them here? No, we don't. A recent article in Current Science by a practicing researcher suggested that perhaps we should also have a national mission on development of scientific instruments because without these, neither R&D is possible nor can you really operate some of these products of modern technology. In most of these instances, we can afford to import them when our scale of operations remains small. But as it grows, self-reliance becomes much more vital. So we must act now. Now, for increasing technological capability, a good science R&D base is required. Now, participation in international projects as we do now is good. But it is better in many ways, to establish a few such international projects at home in India so that Western scientists also, international scientists also come and work here. And that would enable interaction of our own young scientists with top scientists from other countries at home here. Now, even as we plan for wide-scale adoption of high technology, I think we should try to get tech projects to support them. Now, on this, uh, I think there is not much thought that has been given so far. We may be in 
importing many semiconductor plants, but we will have to provide for furnishment all the required inputs, consumables for them. I think we must prep, prepare now to get that done by the NSME. I think uh, that I think would be my summing up in a sense of this today event. Okay, what is required to be done, but what was touched upon during the course of the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for such an interesting summary of the event. Uh, now, that brings us to a close of the close for this conference. So I would like to thank uh, the speakers, the members of C3S, all the students who have very enthusiastically participated on both days, uh, foreign missions, and I would like to thank Mr. Sashi from Anna Alumni Club for uh, helping us out with locating the place and making adjustments and arrangements. I'd like to thank Anna and I Alumni Club for their facilities and DJ Zen and their team, without which this would not have been possible. So thank you all. Uh, I want to end with a quote by Matt Mullenweg, who is the inventor of WordPress. He said that technology is best when it brings people together. So I'm very happy, and from the C3S team, we are very happy to have had this two-day event happen so well. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you have a good day. <laughs>